Dedication and Preface to the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Experienced English Housekeeper for the Use and Ease of Ladies, Housekeepers, Cooks, etc. Written purely from practice and dedicated to the Honourable Lady Elizabeth Warburton, whom the author lately served as housekeeper, consisting of near 900 original receipts, most of which never appeared in print. Part 1. Lemon Pickle, Browning for all sorts of made dishes, soups, fish, plain meat, game, made dishes both hot and cold, pies, puddings, etc. Part 2. All kinds of confectionery, particularly the gold and silver web for covering of sweetmeats, and a dessert of spun sugar with directions to set out a table, in the most elegant manner and in the modern taste. Floating islands, fish ponds, transparent puddings, trifles, whips, etc. Part 3. Pickling, potting and collaring, wines, vinegars, catch-ups, distilling with two most valuable receipts, one for refining malt liquors, the other for curing acid wines, and a correct list of everything in season for every month in the year. The tenth edition, with an engraved head of the author. Also, two plans of a grand table of two covers, and a curious new invented fire stove, wherein any common fuel may be burnt instead of charcoal. By Elizabeth Raffold. London, printed for R. Baldwin, number 47, in Pater Noster Row, 1886. To the Honourable Lady Elizabeth Warburton. Permit me, honoured madam, to lay before you a work for which I am ambitious of obtaining your ladyship's approbation as much as to oblige a great number of my friends, who are well acquainted with the practice I have had in the art of cookery ever since I left your ladyship's family, and have often solicited me to publish for the instruction of their housekeepers. As I flatter myself I had the happiness of giving satisfaction during my service, madam, in your family, it would be a still greater encouragement should my endeavours for the service of my sex be honoured with the favourable opinion of so good a judge of propriety and elegance as your ladyship. I am not vain enough to propose adding anything to the experienced housekeeper, but hope these receipts, written purely from practice, may be of use to young persons who are willing to improve themselves. I rely on your ladyship's candour, and whatever ladies favour this book with reading it, to excuse the plainness of the style, as, in compliance with the desire of my friends, I have studied to express myself so as to be understood by the meanest capacity, and think myself happy in being allowed the honour of subscribing. Madam, your ladyship's most dutiful, most obedient, and most humble servant, Elizabeth Raffold. Preface to the First Edition when I reflect upon the number of books already in print upon this subject, and with what contempt they are read, I cannot but be apprehensive that this may meet the same fate from some who will censure before they either see it or try its value. Therefore, the only favour I have to beg the public is, not to censure my work before they have made trial of some one receipt, which I am persuaded, if carefully followed, will answer their expectations. As I can faithfully assure my friends that they are truly written from my own experience, and not borrowed from any other author, nor glossed over with hard names or words of high style, but written in my own plain language, and every sheet carefully perused as it came from the press, having an opportunity of having it printed by a neighbour, whom I can rely on doing it the strictest justice, without the least alteration. The whole work being now completed to my wishes, I think it my duty to render my most sincere and grateful thanks to my most noble and worthy friends, 
who have already shown their good opinion of my endeavours to serve my sex, by raising me so large a subscription, which exceeds my expectations. I have not only been honoured by having above eight hundred of their names inserted in my subscription, but also have had all their interest in this laborious undertaking, which I have at last arrived to the happiness of completing, though at the expense of my health, by being too studious, and giving too close application. The only anxious wish I have left is, that my worthy friends may find it useful in their families, and be an instructor to the young and ignorant, as it has been my chiefest care to write in as plain a style as possible, so as to be understood by the weakest capacity. I am not afraid of being called extravagant, if my reader does not think that I have erred on the frugal hand. I have made it my study to please both the eye and the palate, without using pernicious things for the sake of beauty, and though I have given some of my dishes French names, as they are only known by those names, yet they will not be found very expensive, nor add compositions, but as plain as the nature of the dish will admit of. The receipts for the confectionery are such as I daily sell in my own shop, which any lady may examine at pleasure, as I still continue my best endeavours to give satisfaction to all who are pleased to favour me with their custom. It may be necessary to inform my readers that I have spent fifteen years in great and worthy families in the capacity of a housekeeper, and had an opportunity of travelling with them, but finding the common servants generally so ignorant in dressing meat, and a good cook so hard to be met with, put me upon studying the art of cookery, more than perhaps I otherwise should have done, always endeavouring to join economy with neatness and elegance, being sensible what valuable qualifications these are in a housekeeper or cook. For of what use is their skill, if they put their master or lady to any moderate expense in dressing a dinner for a small company, when at the same time a prudent manager would have dressed twice the number of dishes for a much greater company, at half the cost. I have given no directions for cullis, as I have found by experience that lemon pickle and browning answers both for beauty and taste, at a trifling expense, better than cullis, which is extravagant. For had I known the use and value of those two receipts when I first took upon me the part and duty of a housekeeper, it would have saved me a great deal of trouble in making gravy, and those I served a great deal of expense. The number of receipts in this book are not so numerous as in some others, but they are what will be found useful and sufficient for any gentleman's family. Neither have I meddled with physical receipts, leaving them to the physician's superior judgment, whose proper province they are. End of End of Dedication and Preface Chapter 1 of The Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 Observations on Soups When you make any kind of soups, particularly portable, vermicelli, or brown gravy soup, or any other that has roots or herbs in, always observe to lay your meat in the bottom of your pan with a good lump of butter. Cut the herbs and roots small, lay them over your meat, cover it close, set it over a very slow fire. It will draw all the virtue out of the roots or herbs, and turn it to a good gravy, and give the soup a very different flavour from putting water in at the first. When your gravy is almost dried up, fill your pan with water. When it begins to boil, take off the fat, and follow the directions of your receipt for what sort of soup you are making. When you make old peas soup, take soft water. For green peas, hard is the best. It keeps the peas a better colour. When you make any white soup, don't put in cream till you take it off the fire. Always dish up your soups the last thing. If it be a gravy, soup will skin over if you let it stand. If it be a peas soup, it often settles, and the top looks thin. To make portable soup for travellers. 
Take three large legs of veal, and one of beef, the lean part of half a ham. Cut them in small pieces, put a quarter of a pound of butter at the bottom of a large cauldron, then lay in the meat and bones, with four ounces of anchovies, two ounces of mace, cut off the green leaves of five or six heads of celery, wash the heads quite clean, cut them small, put them in with three large carrots cut thin, cover the cauldron close, and set it over a moderate fire. When you find the gravy begins to draw, keep taking it up till you have got it all out, then put water in to cover the meat, set it on the fire again, and let it boil slowly for four hours. Then strain it through a hair sieve into a clean pan and let it boil three parts away. Then strain the gravy that you drew from the meat into the pan. Let it boil gently and keep scumming the fat off very clean as it rises till it looks thick like glue. You must take great care when it is near enough that it don't burn. Put in cayenne pepper to your taste, then pour it on flat earthen dishes a quarter of an inch thick, and let it stand till the next day, and cut it out with round tins a little larger than a crown piece. Lay the cakes on dishes, and set them in the sun to dry. This soup will answer best to be made in frosty weather. When the cakes are dry, put them in a tin box with writing paper, betwixt every cake, and keep them in a dry place. This is a very useful soup to be kept in gentlemen's families, for by pouring a pint of boiling water on one cake, and a little salt, it will make a good basin of broth. A little boiling water poured on it will make gravy for a turkey or fowls. The longer it is kept, the better. N.B. Be careful to keep turning the cakes as they dry. To make a transparent soup Take a leg of veal and cut off the meat as thin as you can. When you have cut off all the meat clean from the bone, break the bone in small pieces, put the meat in a large jug, and the bones at the top with a bunch of sweet herbs, a quarter of an ounce of mace, half a pound of Jordan almonds, blanched and beat fine. Pour on it four quarts of boiling water. Let it stand all night by the fire covered close. The next day, put it into a well-tinned saucepan, and let it boil slowly till it is reduced to two quarts. Be sure you take the scum and fat off as it rises, all the time it is boiling. Strain it into a punch bowl, let it settle for two hours. Pour it into a clean saucepan, clear from the sediments, if any at the bottom. Have ready three ounces of rice boiled in water. If you like vermicelli better, boil two ounces. When enough, put it in and serve it up. To make a hare soup. Cut a large old hare in small pieces, and put it in a mug with three blades of mace, a little salt, two large onions, one red herring, six morels, half a pint of red wine, three quarts of water, Bake it in a quick oven three hours, then strain it into a tossing pan. Have ready boiled three ounces of French barley or sago in water. Scald the liver of the hare in boiling water two minutes. Rub it through a hair sieve with the back of a wooden spoon. Put it into the soup with the barley or sago and a quarter of pound of butter. Set it over the fire. Keep stirring it, but don't let it boil. If you don't like liver, put in crisped bread, steeped in red wine. This is a rich soup, and proper for a large entertainment, and where two soups are required, almond or onion soup for the top, and the hare soup for the bottom. To make a rich vermicelli soup. Into a large tossing pan, put four ounces of butter, Cut a knuckle of veal and a scrag of mutton into small pieces, about the size of walnuts. Slice in the meat of a shank of ham with three or four blades of mace, two or three carrots, two parsnips, two large onions, with a clove stuck in at each end. 
cut in four or five heads of celery washed clean, a bunch of sweet herbs, eight or ten morels, and an anchovy. Cover the pan close up till the gravy is drawn out of the meat. Then pour the gravy out into a pot or basin. Let the meat brown in the same pan, and take care it don't burn. Then pour in four quarts of water. Let it boil gently till it is wasted to three pints. Then strain it and put the other gravy to it. Set it on the fire. Add to it two ounces of vermicelli. Cut the nicest part of a head of celery, cayenne pepper and salt to your taste, and let it boil for four minutes. If not a good colour, put in a little browning. Lay a small French roll in the soup dish, pour in the soup upon it, and lay some of the vermicelli over it. To make an ox cheek soup. First break the bones of an ox cheek, and wash it in many waters. Then lay it in warm water, throw in a little salt to fetch out the slime, wash it out very well, then take a large stew pan, Put two ounces of butter at the bottom of the pan, and lay the flesh side of the cheek down. Add to it half a pound of a shank of ham cut in slices, and four heads of celery. Pull off the leaves, wash the heads clean, and cut them in with three large onions, two carrots, and one parsnip sliced, a few beets cut small, and three blades of mace. Set it over a moderate fire a quarter of an hour. This draws the virtue from the roots, which gives a pleasant strength to the gravy. I have made a good gravy by this method, with roots and butter, only adding a little browning to give it a pretty colour. When the head has simmered a quarter of an hour, put to it six quarts of water, and let it stew until it's reduced to two quarts. If you would have it eat like soup, strain and take out the meat and other ingredients, and put in the white part of a head of celery, cut into small pieces, with a little browning to make it a fine colour. Take two ounces of vermicelli, give it a scald in the soup, and put the top of a French roll in the middle of a tureen, and serve it up. If you would have it eat like stew, take up the face as whole as possible, and have ready cut in square pieces, a boiled turnip and carrot, a slice of bread toasted and cut in small dices. Put in a little cayenne pepper, and strain the soup through a hair sieve upon the meat, carrot, turnip, and bread, to serve it up. To make almond soup. Take a neck of veal, and the scrag end of a neck of mutton. Chop them in small pieces. Put them in a large tossing pan. Cut in a turnip with a blade or two of mace, and five quarts of water. Set it over the fire, and let it boil gently, till it is reduced to two quarts. Strain it through a hair sieve into a clear pot. Then, put in six ounces of almonds blanched, and beat fine, half a pint of thick cream, and cayenne pepper to your taste. Have ready three small French rolls made for that purpose, the size of a small teacup. If they are larger, they will not look well, and drink up too much of the soup. Blanch a few Jordan almonds, and cut them lengthways. Stick them round the edge of the rolls slantways, then stick them all over the top of the rolls, and put them in the tureen. When dished up, pour the soup upon the rolls. These rolls look like a hedgehog. Some French cooks give this soup the name of hedgehog soup. To make soup à la reine Take a knuckle of veal and three or four pounds of lean beef. Put to it six quarts of water with a little salt. When it boils, scum it well. Then put in six large onions, two large carrots, a head or two of celery, a parsnip, one leek and a little thyme. Boil them all together till the meat is boiled quite down. Then strain it through a hair sieve and let it stand about half an hour. Then scum it well, and clear it off gently from the settlings into a clear pan. Boil half a pint of cream, and pour it on the crumbs of a halfpenny loaf, and let it soak well. Take half a pound of almonds, blanch, 
and beat them as fine as possible, putting in now and then a little cream to prevent them from oiling. Then take the yolks of six hard eggs, and the roll that is soaked in the cream, and beat them all together quite fine. Then make your broth hot, and pour it to your almonds. Strain it through a fine hair sieve, rubbing it with a spoon, till all the goodness is gone through into a stew pan, and add more cream to make it white. Set it over the fire, keep stirring it till it boils, scum off the froth as it rises. Soak the tops of two French rolls in melted butter in a stew pan till they are crisp, but not brown. Then take them out of the butter, and lay them on a plate before the fire, and a quarter of an hour before you send it to the table, take a little of the hot soup, and put it to the roll in the bottom of the tureen. Put your soup on the fire, keep stirring it till ready to boil, then pour it into your tureen, and serve it up hot. Be sure you take all the fat off the broth before you put it to the almonds, or it will spoil it, and take care it does not curdle. To make onion soup. Boil eight or ten large Spanish onions in milk and water. Change it three times. When they are quite soft, rub them through a hair sieve. Cut an old cock in pieces, and boil it for gravy with one blade of mace. Strain it, and pour it upon the pulp of the onions. Boil it gently with the crumb of an old penny loaf, grated into half a pint of cream. Add cayenne pepper and salt to your taste. A few heads of asparagus or stewed spinach. Both make it eat well and look very pretty. Grate a crust of brown bread round the edge of the dish. To make white onion soup. Take thirty large onions, boil them in five quarts of water with a knuckle of veal, a blade or two of mace, and a little whole pepper. When your onions are quite soft, take them up and rub them through a hair sieve, and work half a pound of butter with flour in them. When the meat is boiled so as to leave the bone, strain the liquor to the onions, and boil it gently for half an hour. Serve it up with a coffee cup full of cream and a little salt. Be sure you stir it when you put in the flour and butter, for fear of its burning. To make brown onion soup. Skin and cut roundways in slices, six large Spanish onions. Fry them in butter till they are a nice brown and very tender. Then take them out and lay them on a hair sieve to drain out the butter. When drained, Put them in a pot with five quarts of boiling water. Boil them one hour, and stir them often. Then add pepper and salt to your taste. Rub the crumbs of a penny loaf through a colander. Put it to the soup. Stir it well to keep it from being in lumps. And boil it two hours more. Ten minutes before you send it up, beat the yolks of two eggs with two spoonfuls of vinegar and a little of the soup. Pour it in by degrees, and keep stirring it all the time, one way. Put in a few cloves if you choose it. N.B. It is a fine soup and will keep three or four days. To make green peas soup. Shell a peck of peas, and boil them in spring water till they are soft. Then work them through a hair sieve. Take the water that your peas were boiled in, and put in a knuckle of veal three slices of ham, and cut two carrots, a turnip, and a few beet leaves shred small. Add a little more water to the meat, set it over the fire, and let it boil one hour and a half. Then strain the gravy into a bowl and mix it with the pulp, and put in a little juice of spinach, which must be beat and squeezed through a cloth. Put in as much as will make it look a pretty colour, then give it a gentle boil, which will take off the taste of the spinach. Slice in the whitest part of a head of celery. Put in a lump of sugar the size of a walnut. Take a slice of bread and cut it in little square pieces. Cut a little bacon the same way. Fry them a light brown in fresh butter. Cut a large cabbage lettuce in slices. Fry it after the other. Put it in the tureen with the fried bread and bacon. 
have ready boiled as for eating a pint of young peas and put them in the soup with a little chopped mint if you like and pour it into your tureen to make a common peas soup to one quart of split peas put four quarts of soft water a little lean bacon or roast beef bones wash one head of celery cut it and put it in with a turnip boil it till reduced to two quarts then work it through a colander with a wooden spoon mix a little flour and water and boil it well in the soup and slice in another head of celery cayenne pepper and salt to your taste cut a slice of bread in small dice fry them a light brown and put them in your dish then pour the soup on it to make a peas soup for lent put three pints of blue boiling peas into five quarts of soft cold water three anchovies three red herrings and two large onions stick in a clove at each end a carrot and a parsnip sliced in with a bunch of sweet herbs boil them all together till the soup is thick strain it through a colander then slice in the white part of a head of celery a good lump of butter a little pepper and salt a slice of bread toasted and buttered well and cut in little diamonds put it into the dish and pour the soup upon it and a little dried mint if you choose it gravy soup thickened with yellow peas put a shin of beef to six quarts of water with a pint of peas and six onions set them over the fire and let them boil gently till all the juice be out of the meat then strain it through a sieve add to the strained liquor one quart of strong gravy to make it brown put in pepper and salt to your taste then put in a little celery and beet leaves and boil it till they are tender to make a white peas soup to four or five pounds of lean beef and six quarts of water put in a little salt when it boils scum it and put in two carrots three whole onions a little thyme and two heads of celery with three quarts of old green peas boil them till the meat is quite tender then strain it through a hair sieve and rub the pulp of the peas through the sieve split the blanched part of three goss lettuces into four quarters and cut them about one inch long with a little mint cut small then put half a pound of butter in a stew pan that will hold your soup and put the lettuce and mint into the butter with a leek sliced very thin and a pint of green peas stew them a quarter of an hour and keep shaking them often about then put in a little of the soup and stew them a quarter of an hour longer then put in your soup and as much thick cream as will make it white keep stirring it till it boils fry a french roll in butter a little crisp put it in the bottom of the tureen and pour your soup over it to make green peas soup without meat in shelling your peas separate the old ones from the young and boil the old ones soft enough to strain through a colander then put the liquor and what you strained through to the young peas which must be whole and some whole pepper mint a little onion shred small put them into a large saucepan with near a pound of butter as they boil up shake in some flour then put in a french roll fried in butter to the soup you must season it to your taste with salt and herbs when you have done so add the young peas to it which must be half boiled first you may leave out the flour if you don't like it and instead of it put in a little spinach and cabbage lettuce cut small which must be first fried in butter and well mixed with the broth to make an excellent white soup to six quarts of water put in a knuckle of veal a large fowl and a pound of lean bacon and half a pound of rice with two anchovies a few peppercorns two or three onions a bundle of sweet herbs three or four heads of celery in slices stew all together till your soup is as strong as you choose it then strain it through a hair sieve 
into a clean earthen pot. Let it stand all night, then take off the scum and pour it clear off into a tossing pan. Put in half a pound of Jordan almonds beat fine, boil it a little and run it through a lawn sieve. Then put in a pint of cream and the yolk of an egg. Make it hot and send it to the table. To make white soup a second way. Boil a knuckle of veal and a fowl with a little mace, two onions, a little pepper and salt to a strong jelly. Then strain it and scum off all the fat. Have ready the yolks of six eggs well beat. Put them in and keep stirring it or it will curdle. Put in your dish with boiled chickens and toasted bread cut in pieces. If you do not like the eggs, you may put in a large handful of vermicelli half an hour before you take it off the fire. To make crawfish soup. Boil half a hundred of fresh crawfish. Pick out all the meat which you must save. Take a fresh lobster and pick out all the meat which you must likewise save. Pound the shells of the crawfish and lobster fine in a marble mortar and boil them in four quarts of water with four pounds of mutton, a pint of green split peas nicely picked and washed, a large turnip, carrot, onion, mace, cloves, anchovy, a little thyme, pepper and salt. Stew them on a slow fire till all the goodness is out of the mutton and shells, then strain it through a sieve and put in the tails of your crawfish and the lobster meat, but in very small pieces, with the red coral of the lobster, if it has any. Boil it half an hour, and just before you serve it up, add a little butter melted thick and smooth. Stir it round several times when you put it in. Send it up very hot, but don't put too much spice in it. MB Pick out all the bags and the woolly part of your crawfish before you pound them. To make partridge soup. Take off the skins of two old partridges. Cut them into small pieces with three slices of ham, two or three onions sliced and some celery. Fry them in butter till they are as brown as they can be made without burning. Then put them into three quarts of water with a few peppercorns. Boil it slowly till a little more than a pint is consumed, then strain it, put in some stewed celery and fried bread. End of chapter 1「2 Part 1 of the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on Dressing Fish When you fry any kind of fish, wash them clean, dry them well with a cloth, and dust them with flour, or rub them with egg and bread crumbs. Be sure your dripping, hog's lard or beef suet, is boiling before you put in your fish. They will fry hard and clear. Butter is apt to burn them black and make them soft. When you have fried your fish, always lay them in a dish or hair sieve to drain before you dish them up. Boiled fish should always be washed and rubbed carefully with a little vinegar before they are put into the water. Boil all kinds of fish very slowly and when they will leave the bone they are enough. When you take them up, set your fish plate over a pan of hot water to drain and cover it with a cloth or close cover to prevent it from turning their colour. Set your fish place in the inside of your dish and send it up and when you fry parsley be sure you pick it nicely, wash it well, then dip it in cold water and throw it into a pan of boiling fat. Take it out immediately. It will be very crisp and a fine green. To dress a turtle of a hundred weight. Cut off the head, take care of the blood and take off all the fins. Lay them in salt and water, cut off the bottom shell, then cut off the meat that grows to it, which is the callipee or fowl. Take out the hearts, livers and lights and put them by themselves. 
take out the bones and the flesh out of the back shell, which is the calipash, cut the fleshy part into pieces about two inches square, but leave the fat part, which looks green. It is called the monsieur. Rub it first with salt, and wash it in several waters to make it come clean. Then put in the pieces that you took out, with three bottles of Madeira wine, and four quarts of strong veal gravy, a lemon cut in slices, a bundle of sweet herbs, a teaspoonful of Chayanne, six anchovies washed and picked clean, a quarter of a pound of beaten mace, a teaspoonful of mushroom powder, and half a pint of essence of ham if you have it. Lay over it a coarse paste, set it in the oven for three hours. When it comes out, take off the lid and scum off the fat, and brown it with a salamander. This is the bottom dish. Then blanch the fins, cut them off at the first joint, fry the first pinions a fine brown, and put them into a tossing pan with two quarts of strong brown gravy, a glass of red wine, and the blood of the turtle, a large spoonful of lemon pickle, the same of browning, two spoonfuls of mushroom ketchup, chayan and salt, an onion stuck with cloves, and a bunch of sweet herbs. A little before it is enough, put in an ounce of morals, the same of truffles. Stew them gently over a slow fire for two hours. When they are tender, put them into another tossing pan, thicken your gravy with flour and butter, and strain it upon them. Give them a boil and serve them up. This is a corner dish. Then take the thick or large part of the fins, blanch them in warm water, and put them in a tossing pan with three quarts of strong veal gravy, a pint of Madeira wine, half a teaspoonful of Chayanne, a little salt, half a lemon, a little beaten mace, a teaspoonful of mushroom powder, and a bunch of sweet herbs. Let them stew till quite tender, they will take two hours at least, then take them up into another tossing pan, Strain your gravy, and make it pretty thick with flour and butter. Then put in a few boiled forcemeat balls, which must be made of the vealy part of your turtle, left out for that purpose. One pint of fresh mushrooms, if you cannot get them, pickled ones will do, and eight artichoke bottoms boiled tender and cut in quarters. Shake them over the fire five or six minutes, then put in half a pint of thick cream, with the yolks of six eggs beaten exceeding well. Shake it over the fire again till it looks thick and white, but do not let it boil. Dish up your fins with the balls, mushrooms and artichoke bottoms over and round them. This is the top dish. Then take the chicken part and cut it like scotch collops. Fry them a light brown, then put in a quart of veal gravy. Stew them gently a little more than half an hour, and put to it the yolks of four eggs boiled hard, a few morals, a score of oysters. Thicken your gravy, it must be neither white nor brown, but a pretty gravy colour. Fry some oyster patties and lay round it. This is a corner dish to answer the small fins. Then take the guts, which is reckoned the best part of the turtle, Rip them open, scrape and wash them exceeding well, rub them well with salt, wash them through many waters, and cut them in pieces two inches long. Then scald the maw or paunch, take off the skin, scrape it well, cut it into pieces about half an inch broad and two inches long, put some of the fishy part of your turtle in it, set it over a slow charcoal fire with two quarts of veal gravy, a pint of Madeira wine, a little mushroom ketchup, a few shallots, a little chayan, half a lemon, and stew them gently four hours, till your gravy is almost consumed. Then thicken it with flour, mixed with a little veal gravy, put in half an ounce of morals, a few forcemeat balls made as for the fins. Dish it up and brown it with a salamander, or in the oven. This is the corner dish. Then take the head, skin it and cut it in two pieces, 
put it into a stew pot with all the bones, hearts, and lights to a gallon of water or veal broth, three or four blades of mace, one shallot, a slice of beef beaten to pieces, and a bunch of sweet herbs. Set them in a very hot oven and let it stand an hour at least. When it comes out, strain it into a tureen for the middle of the table. Then take the hearts and lights, chop them very fine, put them in a stew pan with a pint of good gravy, thicken it and serve it up. Lay the head in the middle, fry the liver, lay it round the head upon the lights, garnish with whole slices of lemon. This is the fourth corner dish. MB. The first course should be of turtle only, when it is dressed in this manner, but when it is with other victuals, it should be in three different dishes. But this way I have often dressed them, and have given great satisfaction. Observe to kill your turtle the night before you want it, or very early next morning, that you may have all your dishes going on at a time. Gravy for a turtle a hundredweight will take two legs of veal and two shanks of beef. To dress a turtle, about thirty pounds weight. When you kill the turtle, which must be done the night before, cut off the head and let it bleed two or three hours. Then cut off the fins and the calipi from the calipash. Take care you do not burst the gall. Throw all the inwards into cold water, the guts and tripe keep by themselves, and slit them open with a penknife, and wash them very clean in scalding water and scrape off all the inward skin. As you do them, throw them into cold water, wash them out of that, and put them into fresh water, and let them lie all night, scalding the fins and edges of the calipash and calipi. Cut the meat off the shoulders, and hack the bones, and set them over the fire with the fins, in about a quart of water. Put in a little mace, nutmeg, cheyenne, and salt, let it stew about three hours, then strain it and put the fins by for use. The next morning take some of the meat you cut off the shoulders, and chop it small, as for sausages, with about a pound of beef or veal suet, seasoned with mace, nutmeg, sweet marjoram, parsley, chayan, and salt to your taste, and three or four glasses of Madeira wine. So stuff it under the two fleshy parts of the meat, and if you have any left, lay it over to prevent the meat from burning. Then cut the remainder of the meat and the fins in pieces the size of an egg. Season it pretty high with cheyenne, salt and a little nutmeg, and put it into the calipash. Take care that it be sewed or secured up at the end, to keep in the gravy. Then boil up the gravy, and add more wine if required, and thicken it a little with butter and flour. Put some of it to the turtle, and set it in the oven, with a well-buttered paper over it, to keep it from burning. And when it is about half-baked, squeeze in the juice of one or two lemons, and stir it up. Calipash, or back, will take half an hour more baking than the calipi, which two hours will do. The guts must be cut in pieces two or three inches long, the tripe in less, and put into a mug of clear water, and set in the oven with the calipash. And when it is enough and drained from the water, it is to be mixed with the other parts, and sent up very hot. To dress a cod's head and shoulders. Take out the gills and the blood, clean from the bone. Wash the head very clean. Rub over it a little salt and a glass of alligar, then lay it on your fish plate. When your water boils, Throw in a good handful of salt, with a glass of alligar. Then put in your fish, and let it boil gently half an hour. If it is a large one, three quarters. Take it up very carefully, and strip the skin nicely off. Set it before a brisk fire, dredge it all over with flour, and baste it well with butter. When the froth begins to rise, throw over it some very fine white bread crumbs. You must keep basting it all the time, to make it froth well. When it is a fine white brown, dish it up, and garnish it with a lemon cut in slices, scraped horseradish, 
barberries, a few small fish fried and laid round it, or fried oysters. Cut the roe and liver in slices, and lay over it a little of the lobster out of the sauce in lumps, and then serve it. Take a lobster. If it be alive, stick a skewer in the vent of the tail to keep the water out, and throw an handful of salt in the water. When it boils, put in the lobster and boil it half an hour. If it has spawn on, pick them off and pound them exceeding fine in a marble mortar, and put them into half a pound of good melted butter. Then take the meat out of your lobster, pull it in bits, and put in your butter with a meat spoonful of lemon pickle, and the same of walnut ketchup, a slice of an end of a lemon, one or two slices of horse radish, as much beaten mace as will lie on a sixpence, salt and chayan to your taste. Boil them one minute, then take out the horse radish and lemon, and serve it up in your sauce boat. NB. If you can get no lobster, you may make shrimp, cockle or mussel sauce the same way. If there can be no kind of shellfish got, you then may add two anchovies cut small, a spoonful of walnut liquor, a large onion stuck with cloves. Strain it, and put it in the sauce boat. Second way to dress a cod's head. Take out the gills and blood clean from the backbone. Wash it well and put it on your plate. When your water boils, put in two handfuls of salt and half a pint of allegar. It will make your fish firmer. Then put in the cod's head. If it is of a middle size, it will take an hour's boiling. Then take it up and strip off the skin gently. Dredge it well with flour and lay lumps of butter on it. If it suits you better, you may send it to the oven, and if it is not brown all over, do it with a salamander. Make your gravy sauce to it and serve it up. To dress young codlins like salt fish. Take young codlins, gut and dry them well with a cloth, fill their eyes full of salt, throw a little on the backbone, and let them lie all night, then hang them up by the tail a day or two. As you have occasion for them, boil them in spring water and drain them well. Dish them up and pour egg sauce on them, and send them to the table. To dress a salt cod. Steep your salt fish in water all night with a glass of vinegar. It will fetch out the salt and make it eat like fresh fish. The next day boil it. When it is enough, pull it in flakes into your dish. Then pour egg sauce over it, or parsnips boiled and beat fine with butter and cream. Send it to the table on a water plate, for it will soon grow cold. To make egg sauce for a salt cod. Boil your eggs hard. First half chop the whites, then put in the yolks and chop them both together, but not very small. Put them into half a pound of good melted butter, and let it boil up, and then put it on the fish. To dress cod sounds. Steep your sounds as you do the salt cod, and boil them in a large quantity of milk and water. When they are very tender and white, take them up and drain the water out, then pour the egg sauce boiling hot over them, and serve them up. To dress cod sounds like little turkeys. Boil your sounds as for eating, but not too much. Take them up and let them stand till they are quite cold. Then take a force meat of chopped oysters, crumbs of bread, a lump of butter, nutmeg, pepper, salt, and the yolks of two eggs. Fill your sounds with it and skewer them up in the shape of a turkey. Then lard them down each side, as you would do a turkey's breast. Dust them well with flour and put them in a tin oven to roast before the fire and baste them well with butter. When they are enough, pour on them oyster sauce. Three are sufficient for a side dish. Garnish with barberries. It is a pretty side dish for a large table, for a dinner in Lent. To boil salmon crimp. Scale your salmon, take out the blood, wash it well and lay it on a fish plate. 
put your water in a fish pan with a little salt when it boils put in your fish for half a minute then take it out for a minute or two when you have done it four times boil it until it be enough when you take it out of the fish pan set it over the water to drain cover it well with a clean cloth dipped in hot water fry some small fishes or a few slices of salmon and lay round it garnish with scraped horseradish and fennel to make rolled salmon take a side of salmon when split and the bone taken out and scaled strew over the inside pepper salt nutmeg and mace a few chopped oysters parsley and crumbs of bread roll it up tight put it into a deep pot and bake it in a quick oven make the common fish sauce and pour over it garnish with fennel lemon and horseradish to make sauce for a salmon boil a bunch of fennel and parsley chop them small and put it into some good melted butter and send it to the table in a sauce boat another with gravy sauce to make the gravy sauce put a little brown gravy into a saucepan with one anchovy a teaspoonful of lemon pickle a meat spoonful of liquor from your walnut pickle one or two spoonfuls of the water that the fish was boiled in it gives it a pleasant flavour a stick of horseradish a little browning and salt boil them three or four minutes thicken it with flour and a good lump of butter and strain it through a hair sieve n b this is a good sauce for most kinds of boiled fish to boil a turbot wash your turbot clean if you let it lie in the water it will make it soft and rub it over with allagar it will make it firmer then lay it on your fish plate with the white side up lay a cloth over it and pin it tight under your plate which will keep it from breaking boil it gently in hard water with a good deal of salt and vinegar and scum it well or it will discolour the skin when it is enough take it up and drain it take the cloth carefully off and flip it on your dish lay over it fried oysters or oyster patties send in lobster or gravy sauce in sauce boats garnish it with crisp parsley and pickles n b don't put in your fish till your water boils to boil a pike with a pudding in the belly take out the gills and guts wash it well then make a good forcemeat of oysters chopped fine the crumbs of half a penny loaf a few sweet herbs and a little lemon peel shred fine nutmeg pepper and salt to your taste a good lump of butter the yolks of two eggs mix them well together and put them in the belly of your fish sew it up skewer it round put hard water in your fish pan add to it a teacup full of vinegar and a little salt when it boils put in the fish if it be a middle size it will take half an hour's boiling garnish it with walnuts and pickled barberries serve it up with oyster sauce in a boat and pour a little sauce on the pike you may dress a roasted pike the same way to stew carp white when the carp are scaled gutted and washed put them into a stew pan with two quarts of water half a pint of white wine a little mace whole pepper and salt two onions a bunch of sweet herbs a stick of horseradish cover the pan close let it stand an hour and a half over a slow stove then put a gill of white wine into a saucepan with two anchovies chopped an onion a little lemon peel a quarter of a pound of butter rolled in flour a little thick cream and a large teacup full of the liquor the carp was stewed in boil them a few minutes drain your carp add to the sauce the yolks of two eggs mixed with a little cream when it boils up squeeze in the juice of half a lemon dish up your carp and pour your sauce hot upon it to dress carp the best way and the sauce kill your carp and save all the blood 
scale and clean them very well. Have ready some nice rich gravy made of beef and mutton, seasoned with pepper, salt, mace and onion. Strain it off before you stew your fish in it. Boil your carp first before you stew it in the gravy. Be careful you don't boil them too much before you put in the carp, then let it stew on a slow fire about a quarter of an hour. Thicken the sauce with a good lump of butter rolled in flour. Garnish your dish with fried oysters, fried toast cut three corner ways, pieces of lemon, scraped horseradish, and the row of the carp cut in pieces, some fried and the other boiled. Squeeze the juice of a lemon into the sauce just before you send it up. Take care to dish it up handsomely and very hot. Another carp sauce. Take the liver of the carp clean from the guts and three anchovies with a little parsley, thyme and one onion. Chop all these small together. Then take half a pint of Rhenish wine, four spoonfuls of elder vinegar with the blood of the carp Put all these together to stew gently, and put it to the carp, which must first be boiled in water, a little salt and a pint of wine. Take care not to do it too much after the carp is put into the sauce. Garnish with fried oysters, fried toast, scraped horseradish and pieces of lemon with the roe cut in pieces and fried. If you don't like elder vinegar, any other sort will do. To make white fish sauce. Wash two anchovies, put them into a saucepan with one glass of white wine and two of water, half a nutmeg grated and a little lemon peel. When it has boiled five or six minutes, strain it through a sieve, add to it a spoonful of white wine vinegar, thicken it a little, then put in near a pound of butter rolled in flour. Boil it well and pour it hot upon your fish. To make a very nice sauce for most sorts of fish. Take a little gravy made of either veal or mutton. Put to it a little of the water that drains from your fish. When it is boiled enough, put it in a saucepan and put in a whole onion, one anchovy, a spoonful of ketchup and a glass of white wine. Thicken it with a good lump of butter rolled in flour and a spoonful of cream. If you have oysters, cockles or shrimps, put them in after you take it off the fire, but it is very good without. You may use red wine instead of white by leaving out the cream. To make lobster sauce. Boil half a pint of water with a little mace and whole pepper, long enough to take out the strong taste of the spice. Then strain it off. Melt three quarters of a pound of butter smooth in the water. Cut your lobster in very small pieces. Stew it all together tenderly with anchovy and send it up hot. To make lobster sauce another way. Bruise the body of a lobster into thick melted butter and cut the flesh into it in small pieces. Stew all together and give it a boil. Season with a little pepper, salt and a very small quantity of mace. To stew carp or tench. Gut and scale your fish. Wash and dry them well with a clean cloth. Dredge them well with flour. Fry them in dripping or sweet rendered suet until they are a light brown and then put them in a stew pan with a quart of water and one quart of red wine a meat spoonful of lemon pickle, another of browning, the same of walnut or mum ketchup, a little mushroom powder, and cheyenne to your taste, a large onion stuck with cloves and a stick of horseradish. Cover your pan close to keep in the steam. Let them stew gently over a stove fire, till your gravy is reduced to just enough to cover your fish in the dish. Then take the fish out and put them on the dish you intend for table. Set the gravy on the fire and thicken it with flour and a large lump of butter. Boil it a little and strain it over your fish. Garnish them with pickled mushrooms and scraped horseradish. Put a bunch of pickled barberries or a sprig of myrtle in their mouths and send them to the table. 
It is a top dish for a grand entertainment. To dress a sturgeon. Take what size of a piece of sturgeon you think proper, and wash it clean. Lay it all night in salt and water. The next morning take it out, rub it well with allegar, and let it lie in for two hours. Then have ready a fish kettle full of boiling water, with one ounce of bay salt, two large onions, and a few sprigs of sweet marjoram. Boil your sturgeon till the bones will leave the fish. Then take it up, take the skin off, and flour it well. Set it before the fire, baste it with fresh butter, and let it stand till it be a fine brown. Then dish it up and pour into the dish the same sauce as for the white carp. Garnish with crisp parsley and red pickles. This is a proper dish for the top or middle. To roast large eels or lampreys with a pudding in the belly. Skin your eels or lampreys, cut off the head, take the guts out, and scrape the blood clean from the bone. Then make a good force meat of oysters or shrimps chopped small, the crumbs of half a penny loaf, a little nutmeg and lemon peel shred fine, pepper, salt, and the yolks of two eggs. Put them in the belly of your fish, sew it up, turn it round on your dish, put over it flour and butter, pour a little water in your dish, and bake it in a moderate oven. When it comes out, take the gravy from under it, and scum off the fat, then strain it through a hair sieve. Add to it a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, two of browning, a meat spoonful of walnut ketchup, a glass of white wine, one anchovy, and a slice of lemon. Let it boil ten minutes. Thicken it with butter and flour, Send it up in a sauce boat. Dish your fish. Garnish it with lemon and crisp parsley. This is a pretty dish for either corner or side for a dinner. To stew lampreys. Skin and gut your lampreys. Season them well with pepper, salt, cloves, nutmeg and mace, not pounded too fine, and a little lemon peel shred fine. Then cut some thin slices of butter into the bottom of your saucepan. Put in the fish with half a pint of nice gravy, half the quantity of white wine and cider, the same of claret with a small bundle of thyme, winter savoury, pot marjoram, and an onion sliced. Stew them over a slow fire, and keep turning the lampreys till they are quite tender. When they are tender, take them out and put in one anchovy, and thicken the sauce with the yolk of an egg, or a little butter, rolled in flour, and pour it over the fish and serve them up. M.B. Roll them round a skewer before you put them into the pan. To stew flounders, place, or soles. Half fry your fish in three ounces of butter, a fine brown. Then take up your fish, and put to your butter a quart of water, and boil it slowly a quarter of an hour, with two anchovies, and an onion sliced. Then put in your fish again with a herring, and stew them gently twenty minutes. Then take out your fish, and thicken the sauce with butter and flour, and give it a boil. Then strain it through a hair sieve, over the fish, and send them up hot. M.B. If you choose cockle or oyster liquor, Put it in just before you thicken the sauce, or you may send oysters, cockles, or shrimps in a sauce boat to table. A good way to stew fish. Mix half a tumbler of wine with as much water as will cover the fish in the stew pan, and put in a little pepper and salt, three or four onions, a crust of bread toasted very brown, one anchovy, a good lump of butter, and set them over a gentle fire. Shake the stew pan now and then, that it may not burn. Just before you serve it up, pour your gravy into a saucepan, and thicken it with a little butter rolled in flour, a little ketchup and walnut pickle beat well together till smooth. Then pour it on your fish, and set it over the fire to heat, and serve it up hot. To boil mackerel. Gut your mackerel, 
and dry them carefully with a clean cloth, then rub them slightly over with a little vinegar, and lay them straight on your fish plate, for turning them round often breaks them. Put a little salt in the water when it boils. Put them into your fish pan, and boil them gently fifteen minutes, then take them up and drain them well, and put the water that runs from them into a saucepan, with two teaspoonfuls of lemon pickle, one meat spoonful of walnut ketchup, the same of browning, a blade or two of mace, one anchovy, a slice of lemon. Boil them all together a quarter of an hour, then strain it through a hair sieve, and thicken it with flour and butter. Send it in a sauce boat, and parsley sauce in another. Dish up your fish with the tails in the middle. Garnish it with scraped horseradish and barberries. To boil herrings. Scale, gut and wash your herrings. Dry them clean and rub them over with a little vinegar and salt. Skewer them with their tails in their mouths. Lay them on your fish plate. When your water boils, put them in. They will take 10 or 12 minutes boiling. When you take them up, drain them over the water. Then turn the heads into the middle of your dish. Lay round them scraped horseradish, parsley and butter for sauce. To fry herrings. Scale, wash and dry your herrings well. Lay them separately on a board and set them to the fire two or three minutes before you want them. It will keep the fish from sticking to the pan. Dust them with flour. When your dripping or butter is boiling hot, put in your fish, a few at a time, fry them over a brisk fire. When you have fried them all, set the tails up one against another in the middle of the dish. Then fry a large handful of parsley crisp. Take it out before it loses its colour, lay it round them and parsley sauce in a boat. Or if you like onions better, fry them, lay some round your dish and make onion sauce for them. Or you may cut off the heads after they are fried, chop them and put them in a saucepan, with ale, pepper, salt and an anchovy. Thicken it with flour and butter, strain it, then put it in a sauce boat. End of chapter 2, part 1「Chapter 2, Part 2 of the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on Dressing Fish To Bake Herrings When you have cleaned your herrings as above, lay them on a board, take a little blackened Jamaica pepper, a few cloves and a good deal of salt, mix them together, then rub it all over the fish. Lay them straight in a pot, cover them with allegar, tie strong paper over the pot, and bake them in a moderate oven. If your allegar be good, they will keep two or three months. You may eat them either hot or cold. To bake sprats. Rub your sprats with salt and pepper, and to every two pints of vinegar put one pint of red wine. Dissolve a pennyworth of cochineal, Lay your sprats in a deep earthen dish, pour in as much red wine, vinegar and cochineal as will cover them, tie a paper over them, set them in an oven all night. They will eat well and keep for some time. To boil skate or ray. Clean your skate or ray very well and cut it in long narrow pieces. Then put it in boiling water with a little salt in it. When it has boiled a quarter of an hour, Take it out, flip the skin off, then put it into your pan again with a little vinegar and boil it till enough. When you take it up, set it over the water to drain and cover it close up. And when you dish it, be as quick as possible for it soon grows cold. Pour over it cockle, shrimp or mussel sauce. Lay over it oyster patties. Garnish it with barberries and horseradish. To fry soles. Skin your soles as you do eels, but keep on their heads. Rub them over with an egg and throw over them bread crumbs. 
fry them over a brisk fire in hog's lard, a light brown. Serve them up with good melted butter, and garnish it with green pickles. To marinate soles. Boil them in salt and water, bone and drain them, lay them on a dish with the belly up. Boil some spinach, and pound it in a mortar, then boil four eggs hard. Chop the whites and yolks separate, lay green, white and yellow amongst the soles, serve them up with melted butter in a boat. To broil haddocks or whitings. Gut and wash your haddocks or whitings, dry them with a cloth, and rub a little vinegar over them. It will keep the skin on better. Dust them well with flour. Rub your gridiron with butter, and let it be very hot when you lay the fish on, or they will stick. Turn them two or three times on the gridiron. When enough, serve them up, and lay pickles round them, with plain melted butter, or cockle sauce. They're a pretty dish for supper. A second way. When you have cleaned your haddocks or whitings as above, put them in a tin oven, and set them before a quick fire. When the skins begin to rise, take them off. Beat an egg, rub it over them with a feather, and strew over them a few bread crumbs. Dredge them well with flour. When your gridiron is hot, rub it well with butter or suet. It must be very hot before you lay the fish on. When you have turned them, rub a little cold butter over them, turn them as your fire requires until they are enough and a little brown. Lay round them cockles, mussels or red cabbage. You may either have shrimp sauce or melted butter. To fry smelts or sparlings. Draw the guts out at the gills, but leave in the melt or roe. Dry them with a cloth. Beat an egg and rub it over them with a feather, then strew bread crumbs over them. Fry them with hog's lard or rendered beef suet. When it is boiling hot, put in your fish, shake them a little, and fry them a nice brown. Drain them in a sieve. When you dish them, put a basin in the middle of your dish with the bottom up. Lay the tails of your fish on it. Fry a handful of parsley in the fat your fish was fried in. Take it out of water as you fry it, and it will keep its colour and crisp sooner. Put a little on the tails and lay the rest in lumps around the edge of the dish. Serve it up with good melted butter for sauce. To fry perch or trout. When you have scaled, gutted and washed your perch or trout, dry them well, then lay them separately on a board before the fire. Two minutes before you fry them, Dust them well with flour, and fry them a fine brown in roast drippings, or rendered suet. Serve them up with melted butter and crisped parsley. To dress perch in water soaky. Scale, gut, and wash your perch. Put salt in your water. When it boils, put in your fish with an onion cut in slices. You must separate it into round rings. A handful of parsley picked and washed clean. Put in as much milk as will turn the water white. When your fish is enough, put them in a soup dish, and pour a little of the water over them with the parsley and the onions. Then serve it up with butter and parsley in a boat. Onions may be omitted if you please. You may boil trout the same way. To boil eels. Skin, gut, and take the blood out of your eels. Cut off their heads, dry them, and turn them round on your fish plate. Boil them in salt and water, and make parsley sauce for them. To pitchcock eels. Skin, gut, and wash your eels. Then dry them with a cloth. Sprinkle them with pepper, salt, and a little dried sage. Turn them backward and forward, and skewer them. Rub your gridiron with beef suet. Broil them a good brown. Put them on your dish with good melted butter, and lay round fried parsley. To broil eels. When you have skinned and cleansed your eels as before, rub them with the yolk of an egg. Strew over them bread crumbs, chopped parsley, sage, pepper and salt. Baste them well with butter, and set them in a dripping pan. Roast or broil them on a gridiron, 
Serve them up with parsley and butter for sauce. To boil flounders and all kinds of flat fish. Cut off the fins and nick the brown side under the head. Then take out the guts and dry them with a cloth. Boil them in salt and water. Make either gravy, shrimp, cockle or mussel sauce and garnish it with red cabbage. To stew oysters and all sorts of shellfish. When you have opened your oysters, put their liquor into a tossing pan with a little beaten mace. Thicken it with flour and butter. Boil it three or four minutes. Toast a slice of white bread and cut it into three cornered pieces. Lay them round your dish. Put in a spoonful of good cream. Put in your oysters and shake them round in your pan. You must not let them boil, for if they do, it will make them hard and look small. Serve them up in a little soup dish or plate. MB. You may stew cockles, mussels or any shellfish the same way. To stew oysters, cockles and mussels. Open your fish clean from the shell. Save the liquor and let it stand to settle. Then strain it through a hair sieve. And put to it as many crumbs of bread as will make it pretty thick. And boil them well together before you put in the fish with a good lump of butter, pepper, and salt to your taste. Give them a single boil, and serve them up. MB. You may make it a fish sauce, by adding a glass of white wine just before you take it off the fire, and leaving out the crumbs of bread. To scallop oysters. When your oysters are opened, put them in a basin and wash them out of their own liquor. Put some in your scallop shells, Strew over them a few bread crumbs, and lay a slice of butter on them, then more oysters, bread crumbs, and a slice of butter on the top. Put them into a Dutch oven to brown, and serve them up in the shells. To fry oysters. Take a quarter of an hundred of large oysters, beat the yolks of two eggs, add to it a little nutmeg and a blade of mace pounded, a spoonful of flour and a little salt. Dip in your oysters and fry them in hog's lard a light brown. If you choose, you may add a little parsley shred fine. MB. They are a proper garnish for cod's head, calf's head, or most made dishes. To make oyster loaves. Take small French rasps, or you may make little round loaves. Make a round hole in the top. Scrape out all the crumbs. Then put your oysters into a tossing pan with the liquor and crumbs that came out of your rasps or loaves and a good lump of butter. Stew them together five or six minutes, then put in a spoonful of good cream. Fill your rasps or loaves, lay the bits of crust carefully on again, set them in the oven to crisp. Three are enough for a side dish. To boil lobsters. Take your lobster and put a skewer in the vent of the tail to prevent the water from getting into the body of the lobster. Put it into a pan of boiling water with a little salt in it. If it be a large one, it will take half an hour's boiling. When you take it out, put a lump of butter in a cloth and rub it over. It will strike the colour and make it look bright. To roast lobsters. Half boil your lobster as before. Rub it well with butter and set it before the fire. Baste it all over till the shell looks a dark brown. Serve it up with good melted butter. To stew lobsters or shrimps. Pick your lobsters or shrimps in as large pieces as you can and boil the shells in a pint of water with a blade or two of mace and a few whole peppercorns. When all the strength is come out of the shells and spice, Strain it and put in your lobsters or shrimps, and thicken it with flour and butter, and give them a boil. Put in a glass of white wine, or two spoonfuls of vinegar, and serve it up. To make lobster patties to garnish fish. Take all the red seeds and the meat of a lobster, with a little pepper, salt and crumbs of bread. Mix them well with a little butter, make them up in small patties and put them in either rich batter or thin paste. Fry or bake them, and garnish your fish with them. 
to pickle sturgeon cut your sturgeon into what size pieces you please wash it well and tie it with mats to every three quarts of water put one quart of old strong beer a handful of bay salt and double the quantity of common salt one ounce of ginger two ounces of black pepper one ounce of cloves and one of jamaica pepper boil it till it will leave the bone then take it up the next day put in a quart of strong ale allegar and a little salt tie it down with strong paper and keep it for use don't put your sturgeon in till the water boils to pickle salmon the newcastle way take a salmon about twelve pounds gut it then cut off the head and cut it across in what pieces you please but don't split it scrape the blood from the bone and wash it well out then tie it across each way as you do sturgeon set on your fish pan with two quarts of water and three of strong beer half a pound of bay salt and one pound of common salt when it boils scum it well then put in as much fish as your liquor will cover and when it is enough take it carefully out lest you strip off the skin and lay it on earthen dishes when you have done all your fish let it stand till the next day put it into pots add to the liquor three quarts of strong beer allegar half an ounce of mace the same of cloves and black pepper one ounce of long pepper two ounces of white ginger sliced boil them well together half an hour then pour it boiling hot upon your fish when cold cover it well with strong brown paper this will keep a whole year to pickle oysters open the largest and finest oysters you can get whole and clean from the shell wash them in their own liquor let it stand to settle then pour it from the sediment into a saucepan put to it a glass of lisbon wine as much white wine vinegar as you had oyster liquor three or four blades of mace a nutmeg sliced a few white peppercorns and a little salt boil it five or six minutes scum it then put in your oysters simmer them ten or twelve minutes take them out and put them in narrow top jars when they are cold pour over them rendered mutton suet tie them down with a bladder and keep them for use to pickle oysters a second way open the oysters very carefully and take off all the shells that stick to the fish put them into a little water and wash the oysters in it and strain the liquor boil it with a little vinegar whole pepper salt and mace till it taste of the spices then put in the oysters if they are large they must boil eight minutes if small not so long put them into pickling pots when the liquor is cold pour it upon the oysters to half a hundred of oysters put six spoonfuls of water and four of very good vinegar then tie bladders very close over them to collar mackerel gut and slit your mackerel down the belly cut off the head take out the bones take care you don't cut it in holes then lay it flat upon its back season it with mace nutmeg pepper and salt and a handful of parsley shred fine strew it over them roll them tight and tie them well separately in cloths boil them gently twenty minutes in vinegar salt and water then take them out put them in a pot pour the liquor on them or the cloth will stick to the fish the next day take the cloth off your fish put a little more vinegar to the pickle keep them for use when you send them to the table garnish with fennel and parsley and put some of the liquor under them to pickle mackerel wash and gut your mackerel then skewer them round with their tails in their mouths bind them with a fillet to keep them from breaking boil them in salt and water about ten minutes then take them carefully out put to the water a pint of allegar two or three blades of mace a little whole pepper and boil it all together when cold pour it on the fish 
and tie it down close. To pot salmon. Let your salmon be quite fresh. Scale and wash it well, and dry it with a cloth. Split it up the back and take out the bone. Season it well with white pepper and salt, a little nutmeg and mace. Let it lie two or three hours, then put it in your pot with half a pound of butter. Tie it down, put it into the oven, and bake it an hour. When it comes out, lay it on a flat dish that the oil may run from it. Cut it to the size of your pots. Lay it in layers till you fill the pot, with the skin upwards. Put a board over it, lay on a weight to press it till cold, then pour over it clarified butter. When you cut it, the skin makes it look ribbed. You may send it to the table, either cut in slices or in the pot. A second way. When you have any cold salmon left, take the skin off and bone it, then put it in a marble mortar with a good deal of clarified butter. Season it pretty high with pepper, mace and salt. Shred a little fennel very small, beat them all together exceeding fine, then put it close down into a pot and cover it with clarified butter. To pot smelts or sparlings. Draw out the guts with a skewer under the gills. The melt or roe must be left in. Dry them well with a cloth. Season them with salt, mace and pepper. Lay them in a pot with half a pound of melted butter over them. Tie them down and bake them in a slow oven three quarters of an hour. When they are almost cold, take them out of the liquor, put them into oval pots, cover them with clarified butter, and keep them for use. To pickle smelts or sparlings. Gut them with a skewer under the gills, but leave the melt or row in. Dry them with a cloth, and skewer their tails in their mouths. Put salt in your water. When it boils, put in your fish for ten minutes. Then take them up. Put to the water a blade or two of mace, a few cloves and a little allegar. Boil them all together, and when it is cold put in your fish, and keep them for use. To Collar Eels Case your eel, cut off the head, slit open the belly, take out the guts, cut off the fins, take out the bones, lay it flat on the back. Grate over it a small nutmeg, two or three blades of mace beat fine, a little pepper and salt. Strew over it a handful of parsley shred fine with a few sage leaves. Roll it up tight in a cloth, bind it well. If it be of middle size, boil it in salt and water three quarters of an hour, hang it up all night to drain, add to the pickle a pint of vinegar, a few peppercorns and a sprig of sweet marjoram. Boil it ten minutes, and let it stand till the next day. Take off the cloth and put your eels into the pickle. You may send them whole on a plate, or cut them in slices. Garnish with green parsley. Lampreys are done the same way. To pickle cockles. Wash your cockles clean, put them in a saucepan, cover them close, set them over the fire, shake them till they open, then pick them out of the shells. Let the liquor settle till it be clear. Then put the same quantity of wine vinegar and a little salt, a blade or two of mace. Boil them together and pour it on your cockles, and keep them in bottles for use. You must pickle mussels the same way. To pot chars. Cut off the fins and cheek part of each side of the head of your chars. Rip them open. Take out the guts and the blood from the backbone, dry them well in a cloth, lay them on a board and throw them, and throw on them a good deal of salt. Let them stand all night, then scrape it gently off them, and wipe them exceedingly well with a cloth. Pound mace, cloves and nutmeg very fine, throw a little in the inside of them, and a good deal of salt and pepper on the outside. Put them close down in a deep pot with their bellies up, with plenty of clarified butter over them. Set them in the oven and let them stand for three hours. When they come out, pour what butter you can off clear. Lay a board over them 
and turn them upside down to let the gravy run from them. Scrape the salt and pepper very carefully off and season them exceeding well both inside and out with the above seasoning. Lay them close into broad thin pots for that purpose with the backs up then cover them well with clarified butter. Keep them in a cool dry place. To pot eels. Skin, gut and clean your eels. Cut them in pieces about four inches long. Then season them with pepper, salt, beaten mace and a little dried sage rubbed very fine. Rub them well with your seasoning. Lay them in a brown pot. Put over them as much butter as will cover them. Tie them down with a strong paper, set them in a quick oven for an hour and a half, take them out. When cold, put them into small pots and cover them with clarified butter. MB, you may pot lampreys the same way. To pot lampreys. Take lampreys alive and run a stick through their heads and slit their tails. Hang them up by their heads and they will bleed at the tail end. When they have done bleeding, cut them open, take out the guts and wipe them until they are perfectly dry and clean. You must not wash them with water, then rub them with pepper and salt. Let them stand all night and wipe them exceedingly dry again. Then season them with pepper, salt, mace and a little nutmeg. Roll them up tight, put them in a pot with some butter, cover them up with strong paper and bake them in a moderate oven. When they are enough and near cold, drain out the butter for them, put them in your potting pots, and cover them with clarified butter. To pot lobsters. Take the meat out of the claws and belly of a boiled lobster. Put it in a marble mortar with two blades of mace, a little white pepper and salt, a lump of butter the size of half an egg. Beat them all together till they come to a paste. Put one half of it into your pot, take the meat out of the tail part, lay it in the middle of your pot, lay on it the other half of your paste, press it close down, pour over it clarified butter a quarter of an inch thick. MB. To clarify butter, put your boat into a clean saucepan, set it over a slow fire, when it is melted, scum it and take it off the fire, let it stand a little then pour it over your lobsters. Take care you do not pour in the milk, which settles to the bottom of the saucepan. A receipt to pot lobsters, which cost ten guineas. Take twenty good lobsters, and when cold, pick out all the meat of the tails and claws. Be careful to take out all the black gut in the tails, which must not be used. Beat fine three quarters of an ounce of mace, a small nutmeg and four or five cloves, with pepper and salt. Season the meat with it. Lay a layer of butter into a deep earthen pot, then put in the lobsters and lay the rest of the butter over them. This quantity of lobsters will take at least four pounds of butter to bake them. Tie a paper over the pot, set them in an oven. When they are baked tender, take them out and lay them on a dish to drain a little, then put them close down in your potting pots, but do not break them in small pieces, but lay them in as whole as you can, only splitting the tails. When you have filled your pots as full as you choose, take a spoonful or two of the red butter they were baked in, pour it on the top and set it before the fire to let it melt in, then cool it, and melt a little white wax in the remainder of the butter, and cover them. MB. Lay a good deal of the red hard part in the pot to bake, to colour the butter, but do not put it in the potting pots. To pot shrimps. Pick the finest shrimps you can get, season them with a little beaten mace, pepper and salt to your taste, and with a little cold butter, Pound them all together in a mortar till it comes to a paste. Put it down in small pots and pour over them clarified butter. To cave each soles. Fry your soles in either oil or butter. Boil some vinegar with a little water, two or three blades of mace, a very few cloves, 
some black pepper and a little salt. Let it stand till cold, and when cold, beat up some oil with it. Lay your fish in a deep pot, and slice a good deal of shallots or onions between each fish. Throw your liquor over it, and pour some oil on the top. It will keep three or four months, made rich and fried in oil. It must be stopped well, and kept in a dry place. Take out a little at a time when you use it. To Cabbage Fish Cut your fish into pieces the thickness of your hand. Season it with pepper and salt. Let it lie an hour. Dry it well with a cloth. Flour it, and then fry it a fine brown in oil. Boil a sufficient quantity of vinegar with a little garlic, mace, and whole pepper to cover the fish. Add the same quantity of oil and salt to your taste. Mix well the oil and vinegar, and when the fish and liquor is quite cold, slice some onion to lay in the bottom of the pot, then a layer of fish and onion, and so on till the whole fish is put up. The liquor must not be put in till it is quite cold. A very good way to preserve fish. Take any large fish, cut off the head, wash it clean, and cut it into thin slices. Dry it well with a cloth, flour it and dip it in the yolks of eggs, fry it in plenty of oil till it is a fine brown and well done, lay them to drain till cold, then lay them in your vessel. Throw in betwixt the layers, mace, cloves and sliced nutmeg, then make a pickle of the best white wine vinegar, shallots, garlic, white pepper, Jamaica pepper, long pepper, juniper berries and salt. Boil it till the garlic is tender and the pickle will be enough. When it is quite cold, pour it on your fish with a little oil on the top. Small fish are done whole. Cover it close with a bladder. To pickle shrimps. Pick the finest shrimps you can get and put them into cold allagar and salt. Put them into little bottles, cork them close, and keep them for use. To pot red and black moor game. Pluck and draw them, and season them with pepper, cloves, mace, ginger, and nutmeg, well beaten and sifted, with a quantity of salt, not to overcome the spices. Roll a lump of butter in the seasoning, and put it into the body of the fowls. Rub the outside with seasoning, and then put them into pots with the breast downwards, and cover them with butter. Lay a paper, and then a paste over them, and bake them till they are tender, then take them out and lay them to drain, then put them into potting pots with the breast upward, and take all the butter they were baked in clean from the gravy, and pour upon them. Fill up the pots with clarified butter, and keep them in a dry place. End of chapter 2Part 3 of The Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Observations on Roasting and Boiling When you boil any kind of meat, particularly veal, it requires a great deal of care and neatness. Be sure your copper is very clean and well tinned, fill it as full of soft water as is necessary, Dust your veal well with fine flour, put it into your copper, set it over a large fire. Some chooses to put in milk to make it white, but I think it is better without. If your water happens to be the least hard, it curdles the milk, and gives the veal a brown-yellow cast, and often hangs in lumps about the veal, so will oatmeal. But by dusting your veal, and putting it into the water when cold, it prevents the foulness of the water from hanging upon it. When the scum begins to rise, take it clear off, put on your cover, let it boil in plenty of water as slow as possible. It will make your veal rise and plump. A cook cannot be guilty of a greater error than to let any sort of meat boil fast. It hardens the outside before the inside is warm, and discolours it, especially veal. 
For instance, a leg of veal 12 pounds weight will require three hours and a half boiling. The slower it boils, the whiter and plumper it will be. When you boil mutton or beef, observe to dredge them well with flour before you put them into the kettle of cold water. Keep it covered and take off the scum. Mutton or beef don't require so much boiling, nor is it so great a fault if they are a little short, but veal, pork or lamb is not so wholesome if they are not boiled enough. A leg of pork will require half an hour more boiling than a leg of veal of the same weight. When you boil beef or mutton, you may allow an hour for every four pound weight. It is the best way to put in your meat when the water is cold. It gets warm to the heart before the outside grows hard. A leg of lamb four pounds weight will require an hour and a half boiling. When you roast any kind of meat, it is a very good way to put a little salt and water into your dripping pan. Baste your meat a little with it, let it dry, then dust it well with flour. Baste it with fresh butter, it will make your meat a better colour. Observe always to have a brisk clear fire, it will prevent your meat from dazing and the froth from falling. Keep it a good distance from the fire. If the meat is scorched, the outside is hard and prevents the heat from penetrating into the meat and will appear enough before it be little more than half done. Time, distance basting often and a clear fire is the best method I can prescribe for roasting meat to perfection. When the steam draws near the fire, it is a sign of its being enough, but you will be the best judge of that from the time you put it down. Be careful when you roast any kind of wild fowl to keep a clear brisk fire. Roast them a light brown, but not too much. It is a great fault to roast them till the gravy runs out of them. It takes off the fine flavour. Tame fowls requires more roasting. They are a long time before they are hot through and must be often basted to keep up a strong froth. It makes them rise better and a finer colour. Pigs and geese should be roasted before a good fire and turned quick. Hares and rabbits requires time and care to see the ends are roasted enough. When they are half roasted, cut the neck skin to let out the blood or when they are cut up, they often appear bloody at the neck. To roast a pig. Stick your pig just above the breastbone. Run your knife to the heart. When it is dead, put it in cold water for a few minutes. Then rub it over with a little rosin, beat exceeding fine, or its own blood. Put your pig into a pail of scalding water half a minute. Take it out, lay it on a clean table, Pull off the hair as quick as possible. If it does not come clean off, put it in again. When you have got it all clean off, wash it in warm water, then in two or three cold waters, for fear the rosin should taste. Take off the four feet at the first joint. Make a slit down the belly. Take out all the entrails. Put the liver, heart and lights to the petty toes. Wash it well out of cold water. Dry it exceeding well with a cloth, hang it up, and when you roast it, put in a little shred sage, a teaspoon of black pepper, two of salt, and a crust of brown bread. Spit your pig and sew it up. Lay it down to a brisk clear fire with a pig plate hung in the middle of the fire. When your pig is warm, put a lump of butter in a cloth, rub your pig often with it while it is roasting, a large one will take an hour and a half. When your pig is a fine brown and the steam draws near the fire, take a clean cloth, rub your pig quite dry, then rub it well with a little cold butter. It will help to crisp it. Then take a sharp knife, cut off the head and take off the collar. Then take off the ears and jawbone, split the jaw in two. When you have cut the pig down the back, which must be done before you draw the spit out. Then lay your pig back to back on your dish, and the jaw on each side, the ears on each shoulder, and the collar at the shoulder, and pour in your sauce, and serve it up. Garnish with a crust of brown bread grated. To make a sauce for a pig. Chop the brains a little, 
then put in a teacup full of white gravy with the gravy that runs out of the pig a little bit of anchovy mix near half a pound of butter with as much flour as will thicken the gravy a slice of lemon a spoonful of white wine a little caper liquor and salt shake it over the fire and pour it into your dish some like currants boil a few and send them in a tea saucer with a glass of currant jelly in the middle of it a second way to make pig sauce cut all the outsides of a penny loaf then cut it into very thin slices put it into a saucepan of cold water with an onion a few peppercorns and a little salt boil it until it be a fine pulp then beat it well put in a quarter of a pound of butter and two spoonfuls of thick cream make it hot and put it into a basin to dress a pig's petty toes take up the heart liver and lights when they have boiled ten minutes and shred them pretty small but let the feet boil till they are pretty tender then take them out and split them thicken your gravy with flour and butter put in your mincemeat a slice of lemon a spoonful of white wine a little salt and boil it a little beat the yolk of an egg add it to two spoonfuls of good cream and a little grated nutmeg put it in your petty toes shake it over the fire but don't let it boil lay sippets round your dish pour in your mincemeat lay the feet over them the skin side up and send them to the table to boil a goose with onion sauce take your goose ready dressed singe it and pour over it a quart of boiling milk let it lie in it all night then take it out and dry it exceeding well with a cloth season it with pepper and salt chop small a large onion a handful of sage leaves put them into your goose sew it up at the neck and vent hang it up by the legs till the next day then put it into a pan of cold water cover it close and let it boil slowly one hour to stew goose giblets cut your pinions in two the neck in four pieces slice the gizzard clean it well stew them in two quarts of water or mutton broth with a bundle of sweet herbs one anchovy a few peppercorns three or four cloves a spoonful of ketchup and an onion when the giblets are tender put in a spoonful of good cream thicken it with flour and butter serve them up in a soup dish and lay sippets around it to roast a green goose when your goose is ready dressed put in a good lump of butter spit it lay it down singe it well dust it with flour baste it well with fresh butter baste it three or four different times with cold butter it will make the flesh rise better than if you was to baste it out of the dripping pan if it is a large one it will take three quarters of an hour to roast it when you think it is enough dredge it with your flour baste it till it is a fine froth and your goose a nice brown and dish it up with a little brown gravy under it garnish with a crust of bread grated round the edge of your dish to make sauce for a green goose take some melted butter put in a spoonful of the juice of sorrel a little sugar a few coddled gooseberries pour it into your sauce boats and send it hot to the table to roast a stubble goose chop a few sage leaves and two onions very fine mix them with a good lump of butter a teaspoonful of pepper and two of salt put it in your goose then spit it and lay it down singe it well dust it with flour when it is thoroughly hot baste it with fresh butter if it be a large one it will require an hour and a half before a good clear fire when it is enough dredge and baste it pull out the spit pour in a little boiling water to make sauce for a goose pare core and slice your apples put them in a saucepan with as much water as will keep them from burning set them over a very slow fire keep them close covered till they are all of a pulp then put in a lump of butter and sugar to your taste 
beat them well and send them to the table in a china basin to boil ducks with onion sauce scald and draw your ducks put them in warm water for a few minutes then take them out put them in an earthen pot pour over them a pint of boiling milk let them lie in it two or three hours when you take them out dredge them well with flour put them in a copper of cold water put on your cover let them boil slowly twenty minutes then take them out and smother them with onion sauce to make onion sauce boil eight or ten large onions change the water two or three times while they are boiling when enough chop them on a board to keep them from going a bad colour put them in a saucepan with a quarter of a pound of butter two spoonfuls of thick cream boil it a little and pour it over the ducks to roast ducks when you have killed and drawn your ducks shred one onion and a few sage leaves put them into your ducks with pepper and salt spit singe and dust them with flour baste them with butter if your fire be very hot they will be roasted in twenty minutes the quicker they are roasted the better they eat just before you draw them dust them with flour and baste them with butter put them on a dish have ready your gravy made of the gizzards and pinions a large blade of mace a few peppercorns a spoonful of ketchup the same of browning a teaspoonful of lemon pickle and one onion strain it pour it on your dish and send onion sauce in a boat to boil a turkey with oyster sauce let your turkey have no meat the day before you kill it when you are going to kill it give it a spoonful of allegar it will make it white and eat tender when you have killed it hang it up by the legs for four or five days at least when you have plucked it draw it at the rump if you can take the breastbone out nicely it will look much better cut off the legs put the ends of the thighs into the body of the turkey skewer them down and tie them with a string cut off the head and neck then grate a penny loaf chop a score or more of oysters fine shred a little lemon peel nutmeg pepper and salt to your palate mix it up into a light force meat with a quarter of a pound of butter a spoonful or two of cream and three eggs stuff the craw with it and make the rest into balls and boil them sew up the turkey dredge it well with flour put it into a kettle of cold water cover it and set it over the fire when the scum begins to rise take it off put on your cover let it boil very slowly for half an hour then take off your kettle and keep it close covered if it be of a middle size let it stand half an hour in the hot water the steam being kept in will stew it enough make it rise keep the skin whole tender and very white when you dish it up pour over it a little of your oyster sauce lay your balls round it and serve it with the rest of your sauce in a boat garnish with lemon and barberries m b observe to set on your turkey in time that it may stew as above it is the best way i ever found to boil one to perfection when you are going to dish it up set it over the fire to make it quite hot to make sauce for a turkey as you open your oysters put a pint into a basin wash them out of their liquor and put them in another basin when the liquor is settled pour it clean off into a saucepan with a little white gravy a teaspoonful of lemon pickle thicken it with flour and a good lump of butter boil it three or four minutes put in a spoonful of good thick cream put in your oysters keep shaking them over the fire till they are quite hot but don't let them boil it will make them hard and look little a second way to make sauce for a turkey cut a scrag end of a neck of veal in pieces put them in a saucepan with two or three blades of mace one anchovy, a few sticks celery, a little cheyenne and salt, a glass white wine, a spoonful of lemon pickle, teaspoonful of mushroom powder or ketchup, 
a quart of water. Put on your cover and let it boil until it be reduced to a pint. Strain it and thicken it with a quarter of a pound of butter rolled in flour. Boil it a little, put in a spoonful of thick cream and pour it on the turkey. When you have dressed your turkey as before, truss its head down to the legs, then make your force meat. Take the crumbs of a penny loaf, a quarter of a pound of beef suet, shred fine, a little sausage meat or veal, scraped and pounded exceeding fine, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your palate. Mix it up lightly with the eggs, stuff the craw with it, spit it and lay it down a good distance from the fire. Keep it clear and brisk, singe, dust and baste it seven times with cold butter. It makes the froth stronger than basting it with the hot out of the dripping pan and makes the turkey rise better. When it is enough, froth it up as before, dish it up, pour on your dish the same gravy as for the boiled turkey, only put in browning instead of cream. Garnish with lemon and pickles and serve it up. If it be of a middle size, it will require one hour and a quarter roasting. To make sauce for a turkey. Cut the crusts of a penny loaf. Cut the rest in thin slices. Put it in cold water with a few peppercorns, a little salt and onion. Boil it till the bread is quite soft, then beat it well. Put in a quarter of a pound of butter, two spoonfuls of thick cream, and put it into a basin. To boil fowls. When you have plucked your fowls, draw them at the rump, cut off the head, neck and legs, take the breastbone very carefully out, skewer them with the end of their legs in the body, tie them round with a string, singe and dust them well with flour, put them in a kettle of cold water, cover it close, set it on the fire. When the scum begins to rise, take it off, put on your cover and let them boil very slowly twenty minutes. Take them off, cover them close, and the heat of the water will stew them enough in half an hour. It keeps the skin whole, and they will be both whiter and plumper than if they had boiled fast. When you take them up, drain them, pour over them white sauce or melted butter. To make white sauce for fowls. Take a scrag of veal, the necks of the fowls, or any bit of mutton or veal you have. Put them in a saucepan with a blade or two of mace, a few black peppercorns, one anchovy, a head of celery, a bunch of sweet herbs, a slice of the end of a lemon. Put in a quart of water, cover it close, let it boil till it is reduced to half a pint. Strain it and thicken it with a quarter of a pound of butter mixed with flour. Boil it five or six minutes, put in two spoonfuls of pickled mushrooms, Mix the yolks of two eggs with a teacup full of good cream and a little nutmeg. Put it in your sauce. Keep shaking it over the fire, but don't let it boil. To roast large fowls. Take your fowls when they are ready dressed. Put them down to a good fire. Singe, dust and baste them well with butter. They will be near an hour in roasting. Make a gravy of the necks and gizzards. Strain it, put in a spoonful of browning. When you dish them up, pour the gravy into the dish, serve them up with egg sauce in a boat. To make egg sauce. Boil two eggs hard, half chop the whites, then put in the yolks. Chop them both together, but not very fine. Put them into a quarter of a pound of good melted butter and put it in a boat. To boil young chickens. Put your chickens in scalding water. As soon as the feathers will slip off, take them out or you will make the skin hard and break. When you have drawn them, lay them in skimmed milk for two hours. Then truss them with their heads on their wings. Singe and dust them well with flour. Put them in cold water. Cover them close. Set them over a very slow fire. Take off the scum. Let them boil slowly for five or six minutes. Take them off the fire. Keep them close covered in the water for half an hour. It will stew them enough, 
and make them both white and plump. When you are going to dish them, set them over the fire to make them hot, drain them, pour over them white sauce, made the same way as for the boiled fowls. To roast young chickens. When you kill young chickens, pluck them very carefully. Draw them, only cut off the claws, truss them, and put them down to a good fire. Singe, dust, and baste them with butter. They will take a quarter of an hour roasting. Then froth them up, lay them on your dish, pour butter and parsley in the dish, and serve them up hot. To roast pheasants or partridges. When you roast pheasants or partridges, keep them at a good distance from the fire. Dust them and baste them often with fresh butter. If your fire is good, half an hour will roast them. Put a little gravy in the dish, made of a scrag of mutton, a spoonful of ketchup, the same of browning, and a teaspoonful of lemon pickle. Strain it, dish them up with bread sauce in a basin, made the same way as for the boiled turkey. N.B. When a pheasant is roasted, stick feathers on the tail before you send it to the table. To roast ruffs and rees. These birds I never met with but in Lincolnshire. The best way to feed them is with white bread boiled in milk. They must have separate pots, for two will not eat out of one. They will be fat in eight or ten days. When you kill them, Slip the skin off the head and neck with the feathers on, then pluck and draw them. When you roast them, put them a good distance from the fire. If the fire be good, they will take about twelve minutes. When they are roasted, slip the skin on again with the feathers on, send them up with gravy under them, made the same as for the pheasant, and bread sauce in a boat or crisp crumps of bread round the edge of the dish. To roast woodcocks or snipes. Pluck them, but don't draw them. Put them on a small spit. Dust and baste them well with butter. Toast a few slices of a penny loaf. Put them on a clean plate, and set it under the birds while they are roasting. If the fire be good, they will take about ten minutes roasting. When you draw them, lay them upon the toast on the dish. Pour melted butter round them, and serve them up. To roast wild ducks or teal. When your ducks are ready dressed, put in them a small onion, pepper, salt and a spoonful of red wine. If the fire be good, they will roast in twenty minutes. Make gravy of the necks and gizzards, a spoonful of red wine, half an anchovy, a blade or two of mace, a slice of an end of a lemon, one onion and a little cayenne pepper. Boil it till it is wasted to half a pint. Strain it through a hair sieve. Put in a spoonful of browning. Pour it on your ducks. Serve them up with onion sauce in a boat. Garnish your dish with raspings of bread. To boil pigeons. Scald your pigeons. Draw them. Take the craw clean out. Wash them in several waters. Cut off the pinions. Turn the legs under the wings. Dredge them, and put them in soft cold water. Boil them very slowly a quarter of an hour. Dish them up, pour over them good melted butter, lay round them a little broccoli in bunches. Send butter and parsley in a boat. To roast pigeons. When you have dressed your pigeons as before, roll a good lump of butter in chopped parsley with pepper and salt. Put it in your pigeons. Spit, dust, and baste them. If the fire be good, they will be roasted in twenty minutes. When they are enough, lay round them bunches of asparagus with parsley and butter for sauce. To roast larks. Put a dozen of larks on a skewer. Tie it to the spit at both ends. Dredge and baste them. Let them roast ten minutes. Take the crumb of a halfpenny loaf with a piece of butter the size of a walnut. Put it in a tossing pan and shake it over a gentle fire till they are a light brown. Lay them betwixt your birds and pour over them a little melted butter. To boil rabbits. 
When you have cased your rabbits, skewer them with their heads straight up, the fore legs brought down and the hind legs straight. Boil them three quarters of an hour at least, then smother them with the onion sauce, made the same as for boiled ducks. Pull out the jaw bones, stick them in their eyes, put a sprig of myrtle or barberries in their mouths, and serve them up. To roast rabbits. When you have cased your rabbits, skewer their heads with their mouths upon their backs, stick their forelegs into their ribs, skewer the hind legs double. Then make a pudding for them of the crumb of half a penny loaf, a little parsley, sweet marjoram, thyme and lemon peel, all shred fine, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your taste. Mix them up into a light stuffing with a quarter of a pound of butter, a little good cream and two eggs. Put it into the belly and sew them up. Dredge and baste them well with butter, roast them near an hour. Serve them up with parsley and butter for sauce. Chop the livers and lay them in lumps around the edge of your dish. To roast a hare. Skewer your hare with the head upon one shoulder, the fore legs sticked into the ribs, the hind legs double. Make your pudding of the crumb of a penny loaf, a quarter of a pound of beef marrow or suet, and a quarter of a pound of butter. Shred the liver, a sprig or two of winter savoury, a little lemon peel, one anchovy, a little cayenne pepper, half a nutmeg grated. Mix them up in a light force meat with a glass of red wine and two eggs. Put in the belly of your hair, sew it up, put a quart of good milk in your dripping pan, baste your hair with it till it is reduced to half a gill, then dust and baste it well with butter. If it be a large one, it will require an hour and a half roasting. To boil a tongue. If your tongue be a dry one, steep it in water all night, then boil it three hours. If you would have it eat hot, stick it with cloves, rub it over with the yolk of an egg, strew over it bread crumbs, baste it with butter, set it before the fire till it is a light brown. When you dish it up, Pour a little brown gravy or red wine sauce, mixed the same way as for venison. Lay slices of currant jelly round it. M.B. If it be a pickled one, only wash it out of water. To boil a ham. Steep your ham all night in water, then boil it. If it be of a middle size, it will take three hours boiling, and a small one two hours and a half. When you take it up, pull off the skin and rub it all over with an egg. Strew on bread crumbs, baste it with butter, set it to the fire till it be a light brown. If it be to eat hot, garnish with carrots and serve it up. To roast a haunch of venison. When you have spitted your venison, lay over it a large sheet of paper, then a thin common paste, with another paper over it. Tie it well to keep the paste from falling. If it be a large one, it will take four hours roasting. When it is enough, take off the paper and paste, dust it well with flour, and baste it with butter. When it is a light brown, dish it up with brown gravy in your dish, or currant jelly sauce, and send some in a boat. To broil beef steaks. Cut your steaks off a rump of beef about half an inch thick. Let your fire be clear. Rub your gridiron well with beef suet. When it is hot, lay them on. Let them broil until they begin to brown. Turn them, and when the other side is brown, lay them on a hot dish with a slice of butter betwixt every steak. Sprinkle a little pepper and salt over them. Let them stand two or three minutes. Then slice a shallot as thin as possible, into a spoonful of water. Lay on your steaks again, keep turning them till they are enough, put them on your dish, pour the shallot and water amongst them, and send them to the table. A very good way to fry beef steaks. Cut your steaks as for broiling, put them into a stew pan with a good lump of butter, set them over a very slow fire, Keep turning them till the butter is become a thick white gravy. 
pour it into a basin and put more butter to them. When they are almost enough, pour all the gravy into your basin and put more butter into your pan. Fry them a light brown over a quick fire, take them out of the pan, put them in a hot pewter dish, slice a shallot among them, put a little in your gravy that was drawn from them and pour it hot upon them. I think this is the best way of dressing beef steaks. Half a pound of butter will dress a large dish. To dress beef steaks a common way. Fry your steaks in butter, a good brown. Then put in half a pint of water, an onion sliced, a spoonful of walnut ketchup, a little caper liquor, pepper and salt. Cover them close with a dish and let them stew gently. When they are enough, thicken the gravy with flour and butter and serve them up. To broil mutton steaks. Cut your steaks half an inch thick. When your gridiron is hot, rub it with fresh suet. Lay on your steaks, keep turning them as quick as possible. If you don't take great care, the fat that drops from the steaks will smoke them. When they are enough, put them into a hot dish, rub them well with butter, slice a shallot very thin into a spoonful of water, pour it on them with a spoonful of mushroom ketchup and salt, serve them up hot. To broil pork steaks. Observe the same as from the mutton steaks, only pork requires more broiling. When they are enough, put in a little good gravy, a little sage rubbed very fine. Strew it over them, it gives them a fine taste. To hash beef. Cut your beef in very thin slices. Take a little of your gravy that run from it. Put it into a tossing pan with a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a large one of walnut ketchup, the same of browning. Slice a shallot in and put it over the fire. When it boils, put in your beef. Shake it over the fire till it be quite hot. The gravy is not to be thickened. Slice in a small pickled cucumber. Garnish with scraped horseradish or pickled onions. To hash venison. Cut your venison into thin slices. Put a large glass of red wine into a tossing pan, a spoonful of mushroom ketchup, the same of browning, an onion stuck with cloves, and half an anchovy chopped small. When it boils, put in your venison, let it boil three or four minutes, pour it into a soup dish, and lay round it currant jelly or red cabbage. To hash mutton. Cut your mutton in slices. Put a pint of gravy or broth into a tossing pan, with one spoonful of mushroom ketchup, and one of browning. Slice in an onion, a little pepper and salt, put it over the fire, and thicken it with flour and butter. When it boils, put in your mutton, Keep shaking it till it is thoroughly hot. Put it in a soup dish and serve it up. To hash veal. Cut your veal in thin round slices, the size of a half crown. Put them into a saucepan with a little gravy and lemon peel cut exceeding fine, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle. Put it over the fire and thicken it with flour and butter. When it boils, put in your veal. Just before you dish it up, Put in a spoonful of cream, lay sippets round your dish, and serve it up. To warm up Scotch collops. When you have any Scotch collops left, put them into a stone jar till you want them. Then put the jar into a pan of boiling water. Let it stand till your collops are quite hot. Then pour them into a dish. Lay over them a few broiled bits of bacon, and they will eat as well as fresh ones. To mince veal. Cut your veal in slices, then cut it in little square bits. Don't chop it. Put it into a saucepan with two or three spoonfuls of gravy, a slice of lemon, a little pepper and salt, a good lump of butter rolled in flour, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, and a large spoonful of cream. Keep shaking it over the fire till it boils, but don't let it boil above a minute. If you do, it will make your veal eat hard. Put sippets round your dish and serve it up. To hash a turkey. 
Take off the legs, cut the thighs in two pieces, cut off the pinions and breast in pretty large pieces, take off the skin, or it will give the gravy a greasy taste, put it into a stew pan with a pint of gravy, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a slice off the end of a lemon, and a little beaten mace. Boil your turkey six or seven minutes. If you boil it any longer it will make it hard. Then put it on your dish, thicken your gravy with flour and butter, mix the yolks of two eggs with a spoonful of thick cream, put it in your gravy, shake it over your fire till it is quite hot, but don't let it boil. Strain it and pour it over your turkey. Lay sippets round. Serve it up and garnish with lemon or parsley. To hash fowls. Cut up your fowl as for eating. Put it in a tossing pan with half a pint of gravy, a teaspoon of lemon pickle, a little mushroom ketchup, a slice of lemon. Thicken it with flour and butter. Just before you dish it up, put in a spoonful of good cream. Lay sippets round your dish and serve it up. To hash a woodcock or partridge. Cut your woodcock up as for eating. Work the entrails very fine with the back of a spoon. Mix it with a spoonful of red wine, the same of water, half a spoonful of allagar. Cut an onion in slices and pull it into rings. Roll a little butter in flour. Put them all in your tossing pan and shake it over the fire till it boils. Then put in your woodcock, and when it is thoroughly hot, lay it in your dish with sippets round it. Strain the sauce over the woodcock, and lay on the onion in rings. It is a pretty corner dish for dinner or supper. To hash a wild duck. Cut up your duck as for eating. Put it in a tossing pan with a spoonful of good gravy, the same of red wine, a little of your onion sauce, or an onion sliced exceeding thin. When it has boiled two or three minutes, lay the duck in your dish, pour the gravy over it. It must not be thickened. You may add a teaspoonful of caper liquor, or a little browning. To hash a hare. Cut your hare in small pieces. If you have any of the pudding left, rub it small. Put to it a large glass of red wine, the same quantity of water, half an anchovy chopped small, an onion stuck with four cloves, a quarter of a pound of butter rolled in flour. Shake them all together over a slow fire till your hair is thoroughly hot. It is a bad custom to let any kind of hash boil longer. It makes the meat to eat hard. Send your hair to the table in a deep dish. Lay sippets round it but take out the onion and serve it up. To boil cabbage. Cut off the outside leaves and cut it into quarters. Pick it well and wash it clean. Boil it in a large quantity of water with plenty of salt in it. When it is tender and a fine light green, lay it on a sieve to drain, but don't squeeze it. If you do, it will take off the flavour. Have ready some very rich melted butter or chop it with cold butter. Greens must be boiled the same way. To boil a cauliflower. Wash and clean your cauliflower. Boil it in plenty of milk and water, but no salt, till it be tender. When you dish it up, lay greens under it, pour over it good melted butter, and send it up hot. To boil broccoli in imitation of asparagus. Take the side shoots of broccoli, strip off the leaves and with a penknife, take off all the out rind up to the heads. Tie them in bunches and put them in salt and water. Have ready a pan of boiling water with a handful of salt in it. Boil them ten minutes, then lay them in bunches and pour over them good melted butter. To stew spinach. Wash your spinach well in several waters. Put it in a colander. Have ready a large pan of boiling water with a handful of salt. Put it in. Let it boil two minutes. It will take off the strong earthly taste. Then put it into a sieve. Squeeze it well. Put a quarter of a pound of butter into a tossing pan. Put in your spinach. 
keep turning and chopping it with a knife until it be quite dry and green. Lay it upon a plate, press it with another, cut in the shape of sippets or diamonds, pour round it very rich melted butter, it will eat exceeding mild, and quite a different taste from the common way. To boil artichokes. If they are young ones, leave about an inch of the stalk, put them in a strong salt and water for an hour or two, then put them in a pan of cold water, set them over the fire, but don't cover them, it will take off their colour. When you dish them up, put rich melted butter in small cups or pots, like rabbits, put them in the dish with your artichokes, and send them up. To boil asparagus. Scrape your asparagus, tie them in small bunches, boil them in a large pan of water with salt in it. Before you dish them up, toast some slices of white bread, and dip them in the boiling water. Lay the asparagus on your toasts, pour on them very rich melted butter, and serve them up hot. To boil French beans. Cut the ends of your beans off, then cut them slantways, put them in a strong salt and water, as you do them, let them stand an hour. Boil them in a large quantity of water with a handful of salt in it, they will be a fine green. When you dish them up, pour on them melted butter, and send them up. To boil Windsor beans. Boil them in a good quantity of salt and water, boil and chop some parsley, put it in good melted butter, serve them up with bacon in the middle if you choose it. To boil green peas. Shell your peas just before you want them, put them into boiling water with a little salt and a lump of loaf sugar. When they begin to dent in the middle, they are enough. Strain them in a sieve, put a good lump of butter into a mug, give your peas a shake, put them on a dish and send them to the table. Boil a sprig of mint in another water, chop it fine and lay it in lumps around the edge of your dish. To boil parsnips. Wash your parsnips very well, boil them till they are soft, then take off the skin, Beat them in a bowl with a little salt, put to them a little cream and a lump of butter, put them in a tossing pan, let them boil till they are like a light custard pudding, put them on a plate and send them to the table. End of part three. Chapter four, part one of the experienced english housekeeper by elizabeth raffold this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 4 observations on made dishes be careful the tossing pan is well tinned quite clean and not gritty and put every ingredient into your white sauce and have it of a proper thickness and well boiled before you put in eggs and cream for they will not add much to the thickness nor stir them with a spoon after they are in, nor set your pan on the fire, for it will gather at the bottom and be in lumps. But hold your pan a good height from the fire, and keep shaking the pan round one way. It will keep the sauce from curdling, and be sure you don't let it boil. It is the best way to take up your meat, collops or hash, or any other kind of dish you are making, with a fish slice, and strain your sauce upon it for it is almost impossible to prevent little bits of meat from mixing with the sauce, and by this method the sauce will look clear. In the brown made dishes, take special care no fat is on top of the gravy, but skim it clean off, and that it be of a fine brown, and taste of no one thing particular. If you use any wine, put it in some time before your dish is ready, to take off the rawness for nothing can give a made dish a more disagreeable taste than raw wine or fresh anchovy. When you use fried forcemeat balls, put them on a sieve to drain the fat from them, and never let them boil in your sauce. It will give it a greasy look, and soften the balls. The best way is to put them in after your meat is dished up. You may use pickled mushrooms, artichoke bottoms, morels, truffles and forcemeat balls, 
in almost every made dish, and in several you may use a roll of force meat instead of balls, as in the porcupine breast of veal, and where you can use it, it is much handsomer than balls, especially in a mock turtle, collared or ragged breast of veal, or any large made dish. To dress a mock turtle. Take the largest calf's head you can get, with the skin on, put it in scalding water till you find the hair will come off, clean it well, and wash it in warm water, and boil it three quarters of an hour, then take it out of the water, and slit it down the face. Cut off all the meat with the skin as clean from the bone as you can, and be careful you don't break the ears off. Lay it on a flat dish, and stuff the ears with force meat, and then tie them round with cloths. Take the eyes out, and pick out all the rest of the meat clean from the bones. Put it in a tossing pan, with the nicest and fattest part of another calf's head, without the skin on, boiled as long as the above, and three quarts of veal gravy. Lay the skin in the pan on the meat, with the flesh side up. Cover the pan close, and let it stew over a moderate fire one hour. Then put in three sweetbreads, fried a light brown, one ounce of morals, the same of truffles, five artichoke bottoms boiled, one anchovy boned and chopped small, a teaspoonful of cayenne pepper, a little salt, half a lemon, three pints of Madeira wine, two meat spoonfuls of mushroom ketchup, one of lemon pickle, half a pint of mushrooms, and let them stew slowly half an hour longer, and thicken it with flour and butter. Have ready the yolks of four eggs boiled hard, and the brains of both heads boiled. Cut the brains the size of nutmegs, and make a rich forcemeat, and spread it on the caul of a leg of veal. Roll it up and boil it in a cloth one hour. When boiled, cut it in three parts, the middle largest, then take up the meat into the dish, and lay the head over it with the skin side up, and put the largest piece of forcemeat between the ears, and make the tops of the ears to meet round it. This is called the crown of the turtle. The other slices of the forcemeat lay opposite to each other at the narrow end, and lay a few of the truffles, morals, brains, mushrooms, eggs, and artichoke bottoms upon the face and round it. Strain the gravy boiling hot upon it. Be as quick in dishing it up as possible, for it soon goes cold. Mock turtle a second way. Dress the hair of a calf's head as before. Boil it half an hour. When boiled, cut it in pieces half an inch thick, and one inch and a half long. Put it into a stew pan with two quarts of veal gravy, and salt to your taste. Let it stew one hour, then put in a pint of Madeira wine, half a teaspoonful of cayenne pepper, truffles and morals one ounce each, three or four artichoke bottoms boiled and cut in quarters. When the meat begins to look clear, and the gravy strong, put in half a lemon, and thicken it with flour and butter. Fry a few forcemeat balls. Beat four yolks of hard-boiled eggs in a mortar very fine, with a lump of butter, and make them into balls the size of pigeon's eggs. Put the forcemeat balls and eggs in, after you have dished it up. MB. A lump of butter put in the water, makes the artichoke bottoms boil white and sooner. To make a calf's head hash. Clean your calf's head exceedingly well, and boil it a quarter of an hour. When it is cold, put the meat in thin broad slices, and put it into a tossing pan with two quarts of gravy, and when it has stewed three quarters of an hour, add to it one anchovy, a little beaten mace, and chayan to your taste, two teaspoonfuls of lemon pickle, two meat spoonfuls of walnut ketchup, half an ounce of truffles and morals, a slice or two of lemon, a bundle of sweet herbs, and a glass of white wine. Mix a quarter of a pound of butter with flour, and put it in a few minutes before the head is enough. Take your brains, and put them into hot water. It will make them skin sooner, and beat them fine in a basin. Then add to them two eggs, one spoonful of flour, a bit of lemon peel shred fine. Chop small a little parsley, thyme, and sage. 
beat them very well together, strew in a little pepper and salt, then drop them in little cakes into a panful of boiling hog's lard, and fry them a light brown, then lay them on a sieve to drain. Take your hash out of the pan with a fifth slice, and lay it on your dish, and strain your gravy over it. Lay upon it a few mushrooms, forcemeat balls, the yolks of four eggs boiled hard, and the brain cakes. Garnish with lemon and pickles. It is proper for a top or side dish. To dress a calf's head surprise. Dress off the hair of a large calf's head, as directed in the mock turtle. Then take a sharp pointed knife, and raise off the skin with as much of the meat from the bones as you possibly can get, that it may appear like a whole head when it is stuffed, and be careful you don't cut the skin in holes. Then scrape a pound of fat bacon, the crumb of two penny loaves. Grate a small nutmeg, with salt, cayenne pepper, and shred lemon peel to your taste, the yolks of six eggs well beat, mix all up into a rich force meat, put a little into the ears and stuff the head with the remainder. Have ready a deep narrow pot that it will just go in with two quarts of water, half a pint of white wine, two spoonfuls of lemon pickle, the same of walnut and mushroom ketchups, one anchovy, a blade or two of mace, a bundle of sweet herbs, a little salt and cayenne pepper. Lay a coarse paste over it to keep in the steam, and set it in a very quick oven two hours and a half. When you take it out, lay your head in a soup dish, skim the fat clean off the gravy, and strain it through a hair sieve into a tossing pan. Thicken it with a lump of butter rolled in flour. When it has boiled a few minutes, put in the yolks of six eggs well beat, and mixed with half a pint of cream, but don't let it boil, it will curdle the eggs. You must have ready boiled a few force meat balls, half an ounce of truffles and morels. It would make the gravy too dark a colour to stew them in it. Pour your gravy over your head and garnish with the truffles, morels, force meat balls, mushrooms, and barberries, and serve it up. This is a handsome top dish at a small expense. To grill a calf's head. Wash your calf's head clean, and boil it almost enough, then take it up, and hash one half, the other half rub over with the yolk of an egg, a little pepper and salt, strew over it bread crumbs, parsley chopped small, and a little grated lemon peel, set it before the fire, and keep basting it all the time to make the froth rise, when it is a fine light brown, dish up your hash, and lay the grilled side upon it. Blanche your tongue, slit it down the middle, and lay it on a soup plate. Skin the brains, boil them with a little sage and parsley, chop them fine, and mix them with some melted butter and a spoonful of cream. Make them hot and pour them over the tongue. Serve them up, and they are sauce for the head. To make a porcupine of a breast of veal, Bone the finest and largest breast of veal you can get, rub it over with the yolks of two eggs, spread it on a table, lay over it a little bacon cut as thin as possible, a handful of parsley shred fine, the yolks of five hard-boiled eggs chopped small, a little lemon peel cut fine, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your taste, and the crumb of a penny loaf steeped in cream. Roll the breast close and skewer it up, then cut fat bacon and the lean of ham that has been a little boiled, or it will turn the veal red, and pickled cucumbers about two inches long to answer the other lardings, and lard it in rows, first ham, then bacon, then cucumbers, till you have larded it all over the veal. Put it in a deep earthen pot with a pint of water, and cover it and set it in a slow oven two hours. When it comes from the oven, skim the fat off and strain the gravy through a sieve into a stew pan. Put it in a glass of white wine, a little lemon pickle, and caper liquor, a spoonful of mushroom ketchup. Thicken it with a little butter, rolled in flour. Lay your porcupine on the dish, and pour it hot upon it. 
Cut a roll of force meat in four slices. Lay one at each end and the other at the sides. Have ready your sweetbread cut in slices and fried. Lay them round it with a few mushrooms. It is a grand bottom dish when game is not to be had. MB. Make the force meat of a few chopped oysters, the crumbs of a penny loaf, half a pound of beef suet shred fine, and the yolks of four eggs. Mix them well together with nutmeg, cayenne pepper, and salt to your palate. Spread it on a veal call, and roll it up close like a collared eel. Bind it in a cloth, and boil it one hour. To ragu a breast of veal. Half roast a breast of veal, then bone it, and put it in a tossing pan with a quart of veal gravy, one ounce of morels, the same of truffles. Stew it till tender, and just before you thicken the gravy, put in a few oysters, pickled mushrooms, and pickled cucumbers. Cut in small square pieces the yolks of four eggs, boiled hard. Cut your sweetbread in slices, and fry it a light brown. Dish up your veal and pour the gravy hot over it. Lay your sweetbread round, morels, truffles and eggs upon it. Garnish with pickled barberries. This is proper for either top or side for dinner, or bottom for supper. To collar a breast of veal. Take the finest breast of veal, bone it and rub it over with the yolks of two eggs, and strew over it some crumbs of bread, a little grated lemon, a little pepper and salt, a handful of chopped parsley. Roll it up tight and bind it hard with twine. Wrap it in a cloth and boil it one hour and a half, then take it up to cool. When a little cold, take off the cloth and clip off the twine carefully, lest you open the veal. Cut it in five slices, lay them on a dish with the sweetbread boiled and cut in thin slices and laid round them with ten or twelve force-meat balls. Pour over your white sauce and garnish with barberries or green pickles. The white sauce must be made thus. Take a pint of good veal gravy, put to it a spoonful of lemon pickle, half an anchovy, a teaspoonful of mushroom powder, or a few pickled mushrooms. Give it a gentle boil, then put in half a pint of cream, the yolks of two eggs beat fine. Shake it over the fire, after the eggs and cream is in, but don't let it boil, it will curdle the cream. It is proper for a top dish at night, or a side dish for dinner. A boiled breast of veal. Skewer your breast of veal that it will lie flat in the dish. Boil it one hour, if a large one, an hour and a quarter. Make a white sauce as before mentioned, for the collared one. Pour it over and garnish with pickles. A neck of veal cutlets. Cut a neck of veal into cutlets. Fry them a fine brown. Then put them in a tossing pan and stew them till tender in a quart of good gravy. Then add one spoonful of browning, the same of ketchup, some fried forcemeat balls, a few truffles, morels and pickled mushrooms, a little salt and cayenne pepper. Thicken your gravy with flour and butter. Let it boil a few minutes. Lay your cutlets in the dish with the top of the ribs in the middle. Pour your sauce over them. Lay your balls, morels, truffles and mushrooms over the cutlets and send it up. A neck of veal a la royale. Cut off the scrag end and part of the chine bone to make it lie flat in the dish. Then chop a few mushrooms, shallots, a little parsley and thyme, all very fine, with pepper and salt. Cut middle-sized lards of bacon, and roll them in the herbs, etc., and lard the lean part of the neck. Put it in a stew pan with some lean bacon or shank of ham, and the chine bone and scrag cut in pieces with three or four carrots, onions, a head of celery, and a little beaten mace. Pour in as much water as will cover it. Cover the pan very close, and let it stew slowly for two or three hours till tender. Then strain half a pint of the liquor out of the pan through a fine sieve. Set it over a stove and let it boil. 
Keep stirring it till it is dry at the bottom and of a good brown. Be sure you don't let it burn. Then add more of the liquor strained free from fat and keep stirring it till it becomes a fine thick brown glaze. Then take the veal out of the stew pan and wipe it clean and put the larded side down upon the glaze. Set it over a gentle fire five or six minutes to take the glaze. Then lay it in the dish with the glaze side up and put into the same stew pan as much flour as will lie on a sixpence. Stir it about well and add some of the braised liquor, if any left. Let it boil till it is of a proper thickness. Strain it and pour it into the bottom of the dish. Squeeze in a little juice of lemon and serve it up. Bombarded Veal Cut the bone nicely out of a fillet. Make a force meat of the crumbs of a penny loaf half a pound of fat bacon scraped, a little lemon peel or lemon thyme, parsley, two or three sprigs of sweet marjoram, one anchovy. Chop them all very well. Grate a little nutmeg, cayenne pepper and salt to your palate. Mix all up together with egg and a little cream and fill up the place where the bone came out with the force meat. Then cut the fillet across in cuts about one inch from another all round the fillet. Fill one nick with force meat, a second with boiled spinach that is boiled and well squeezed, a third with bread crumbs, chopped oysters and beef marrow, then force meat, and fill them up as above all round the fillet. Wrap the caul close round it and put it in a deep pot with a pint of water. Make a coarse paste to lay over it to keep the oven from giving it a fiery taste. When it comes out of the oven, skim off the fat and put the gravy in a stew pan with a spoonful of lemon pickle and another of mushroom ketchup, two of browning, half an ounce of morels and truffles, five boiled artichoke bottoms cut in quarters. Thicken the sauce with flour and butter, give it a gentle boil and pour it upon the veal into your dish. To make a fricando of veal. Cut steaks half an inch thick and six inches long, out of the thick part of a leg of veal. Lard them with small cardoons, and dust them with flour. Put them before the fire to broil a fine brown, then put them into a large tossing pan with a quart of good gravy, and let it stew half an hour. Then put in two teaspoonfuls of lemon pickle, a meat spoonful of walnut ketchup, the same of browning, a slice of lemon, a little anchovy and cayenne, a few morels and truffles. When your fricandos is tender, take them up and thicken your gravy with flour and butter. Strain it, place your fricandos in the dish, pour your gravy on them. Garnish with lemon and barberries. You may lay round them forcemeat balls fried or forcemeat rolled in veal caul and yolks of eggs boiled hard. To make veal olives. Cut the thick part of a leg of veal in thin slices. Flatten them with the broad side of a cleaver. Rub them over with the yolk of an egg. Lay over every piece a very thin slice of bacon. Strew over them a few bread crumbs, a little lemon peel and parsley chopped small. Pepper and salt and nutmeg. Roll them up close and skewer them tight. Then rub them with the yolk of eggs and roll them in bread crumbs and parsley chopped small. Put them into a tin dripping pan to bake or fry them. Then take a pint of good gravy. Add to it a spoonful of lemon pickle, the same of walnut ketchup and one of browning, a little anchovy and cayenne pepper. Thicken it with flour and butter. Serve them up with force meat balls and strain the gravy hot upon them. Garnish with pickles and strew over them a few pickled mushrooms. You may dress veal cutlets the same way, but not roll them. To dress Scotch collops white. Cut them off the thick part of a leg of veal, the size and thickness of a crown piece. Put a lump of butter into a tossing pan and set it over a slow fire, or it will discolour your collops. Before the pan is hot, lay the collops in, and keep turning them over till you see the butter is turned to thick white gravy. 
put your collops and gravy into a pot, and set them upon the hearth to keep warm. Put cold butter again into your pan every time you fill it, and fry them as above, and so continue till you have finished. When you have fried them, pour the gravy from them into your pan, with a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, mushroom ketchup, caper liquor, beaten mace, cayenne pepper, and salt. Thicken with flour and butter. When it has boiled five minutes, put in the yolks of two eggs well beat and mixed, with a teacupful of rich cream. Keep shaking your pan over the fire, till your gravy looks of a fine thickness, then put in your collops and shake them. When they are quite hot, put them on your dish with forcemeat balls, strew over them pickled mushrooms, garnish with barberries and kidney beans. To dress Scotch collops brown. Cut your collops the same way as the white ones, but brown your butter before you lay in your collops. Fry them over a quick fire, shake and turn them, and keep them on a fine froth. When they are a light brown, put them into a pot and fry them as the white ones. When you have fried them all brown, pour all the gravy from them into a clean tossing pan, with half a pint of gravy, made of the bone and bits you cut the collops off, two teaspoonfuls of lemon pickle, a large one of ketchup, the same of browning, half an ounce of morels, half a lemon, a little anchovy, cheyenne and salt to your taste. Thicken it with flour and butter, let it boil five or six minutes, then put in your collops and shake them over the fire. If they boil it will make them hard. When they have simmered a little, take them out with an egg spoon and lay them on your dish. Strain your gravy and pour it hot on them. Lay over them force meat balls and little slices of bacon curled round a skewer and boiled. Throw a few mushrooms over. Garnish with lemon and barberries and serve it up. To dress Scotch collops, French way. Take a leg of veal and cut your collops pretty thick, five or six inches long and three inches broad. Rub them over with the yolk of an egg, put pepper and salt and grate a little nutmeg on them and a little shred parsley. Lay them on an earthen dish, and set them before the fire. Baste them with butter, and let them be a fine brown. Then turn them on the other side, and rub them as above. Baste and brown it the same way. When they are thoroughly enough, make a good brown gravy with truffles and morels. Dish up your collops. Lay truffles and morels and the yolks of hard-boiled eggs over them. Garnish with crisp parsley and lemon. Sweetbreads a la daube. Take three of the largest and finest sweetbreads you can get, put them in a saucepan of boiling water for five minutes, then take them out, and when they are cold, lard them with a row down the middle, with very little pieces of bacon, then a row on each side with lemon peel cut the size of wheat straw then a row on each side of pickled cucumbers cut very fine. Put them in a tossing pan with good veal gravy, a little juice of lemon, a spoonful of browning. Stew them gently a quarter of an hour. A little before they are ready, thicken them with flour and butter, dish them up and pour the gravy over. Lay round them bunches of boiled celery or oyster patties. Garnish with stewed spinach green curled parsley. Flick a bunch of barberries in the middle of each sweetbread. It is a pretty corner dish for either dinner or supper. Forced Sweetbreads Put three sweetbreads in boiling water five minutes. Beat the yolk of an egg a little and rub it over them with a feather. Strew on bread crumbs, lemon peel and parsley shred very fine. Nutmeg, salt and pepper to your palate. Set them before the fire to brown, add to them a little veal gravy, put a little mushroom powder, caper liquor or juice of lemon and browning, thicken it with flour and butter, boil it a little and pour it on your dish. Lay in your sweetbreads and lay over them lemon peel in rings cut like straws. Garnish with pickles. To fricassee sweetbreads brown. 
scald three sweetbreads when cold cut them in slices the thickness of a crown piece dip them in batter and fry them in fresh butter a nice brown make a gravy for them as the last stew your sweetbreads slowly in the gravy eight or ten minutes lay them on your dish and pour the gravy over them garnish with lemon or barberries to fricassee sweetbreads white scald and slice the sweetbreads as before put them in a tossing pan with a pint of veal gravy a spoonful of white wine the same of mushroom ketchup a little beaten mace stew them a quarter of an hour thicken your gravy with flour and butter a little before they are enough when you are going to dish them up mix the yolk of an egg with a teacupful of thick cream and a little grated nutmeg put it into your tossing pan and shake it well over the fire but don't let it boil lay your sweetbreads on your dish and pour your sauce over them garnish with pickled red beetroot and kidney beans to ragu sweetbreads rub them over with the yolk of an egg strew over them bread crumbs and parsley thyme and sweet marjoram shred small and pepper and salt make a roll of force meat like a sweetbread and put it in a veal caul and roast them in a dutch oven take some brown gravy and put to it a little lemon pickle mushroom ketchup and the end of a lemon boil the gravy and when the sweetbreads are enough lay them in a dish with the force meat in the middle take the end of the lemon cut and pour the gravy in the dish and serve them up to stew a fillet of veal take a fillet of a cow calf stuff it well under the elder at the bone and quite through to the shank put it in the oven with a pint of water under it till it is a fine brown then put it in a stew pan with three pints of gravy stew it tender put in a few morels truffles a teaspoonful of lemon pickle a large one of browning and one of ketchup and a little cayenne pepper thicken with a lump of butter rolled in flour dish up your veal strain your gravy over lay round force meat balls garnish with pickles and lemon to ragu a fillet of veal lard your fillet and half roast it then put it in a tossing pan with two quarts of good gravy cover it close and let it stew till tender then add one spoonful of white wine one of browning one of ketchup a teaspoonful of lemon pickle a little caper liquor half an ounce of morels thicken with flour and butter lay round it a few yolks of eggs a good way to dress a mid calf take a calf's heart stuff it with good force meat and send it to the oven in an earthen dish with a little water under it lay butter over it and dredge it with flour boil half the liver and all the lights together half an hour then chop them small and put them in a tossing pan with a pint of gravy one spoonful of lemon pickle and one of ketchup squeeze in half a lemon pepper and salt thicken with a good piece of butter rolled in flour when you dish it up pour the minced meat into the bottom and have ready fried a fine brown the other half of the liver cut in thin slices and little bits of bacon set the heart in the middle and lay the liver and bacon over the minced meat and serve it up to disguise a leg of veal lard the top side of a leg of veal in rows with bacon and stuff it well with force meat made of oysters then put it into a large saucepan with as much water as will cover it put on a close lid to keep in the steam stew it gently till quite tender then take it up and boil down the gravy in the pan to a quart skim off the fat and add half a lemon a spoonful of mushroom ketchup a little lemon pickle the crumbs of half a penny loaf grated exceeding fine boil it in your gravy till it looks thick then add half a pint of oysters if not thick enough roll a lump of butter in flour and put it in with half a pint of good cream and the yolks of three eggs 
shake your sauce over the fire, but don't let it boil after the eggs are in, lest it should curdle. Put your veal in a deep dish, and pour the sauce over it. Garnish with crisp parsley and fried oysters. It is an excellent dish for the top of a large table. Haricot of a neck of mutton. Cut the best end of a neck of mutton into chops, in single ribs. Flatten them and fry them a light brown, then put them into a large saucepan with two quarts of water, a large carrot cut in slices, cut at the edges like wheels. When they have stewed a quarter of an hour, put in two turnips cut in square dices, the white part of a head of celery, a few heads of asparagus, two cabbage lettuces fried, and Cheyenne to your taste. Boil them all together till they are tender. The gravy is not to be thickened. Put it in a tureen or a soup dish. It is proper for a top dish. To dress a neck of mutton to eat like venison. Cut a large neck before the shoulder is taken off, broader than usual, and the flap of the shoulder with it to make it look handsomer. Stick your neck all over in little holes with a sharp penknife, and pour a bottle of red wine upon it, and let it lie in the wine four or five days. Turn and rub it three or four times a day, then take it out and hang it up for three days in the open air out of the sun, and dry it often with a cloth to keep it from musting. When you roast it, baste it with the wine it was steeped in, if any left, if not fresh wine, Put white paper three or four folds, to keep in the fat. Roast it thoroughly, and then take off the skin, and froth it nicely, and serve it up. To make French steaks of a neck of mutton. Let your mutton be very good and large, and cut off most part of the fat of the neck, and then cut the steaks two inches thick. Make a large hole through the middle of the fleshy part of every steak with a penknife and stuff it with forcemeat made of bread crumbs, beef suet, a little nutmeg, pepper and salt, mixed up with the yolk of an egg. When they are stuffed, wrap them in writing paper, and put them in a Dutch oven. Set them before the fire to broil. They will take near an hour. Put a little brown gravy on your dish, and serve them up in the papers. A shoulder of mutton surprised. Half boil a shoulder, then put it in a tossing pan with two quarts of good gravy, four ounces of rice, a teaspoonful of mushroom powder, a little beaten mace, and stew it one hour, or till the rice is enough. Then take up your mutton, and keep it hot. Put to the rice half a pint of good cream, and a lump of butter rolled in flour. Shake it well, and boil it a few minutes. Lay your mutton on the dish and pour it over. Garnish with barberries or pickles and send it up. To dress a shoulder of mutton, called hen and chickens. Half roast a shoulder, then take it up, and cut off the blade at the first joint, and both the flaps to make the blade round. Score the blade round in diamonds, throw a little pepper and salt over it, and set it in a tin oven to broil. Cut the flaps and the meat off the shank in thin slices into the gravy that run out of the mutton, and put a little good gravy to it, with two spoonful of walnut ketchup, one of browning, a little cheyenne pepper, and one or two shallots. When your meat is tender, thicken it with flour and butter, put your meat in the dish with the gravy, and lay the blade on the top, broiled a dark brown. Garnish with green pickles and serve it up. To boil a shoulder of mutton with onion sauce. Put your shoulder in when the water is cold. When enough, smother it with onion sauce, made the same as for boiled ducks. You may dress a shoulder of veal the same way. A shoulder of mutton and celery sauce. Boil it as before till it is quite enough. Pour over it celery sauce and send it to the table. MB. The sauce. Wash and clean ten heads of celery, cut off the green tops and take off the outside stalks. 
Cut them into thin bits and boil it in gravy till it is tender. Thicken it with flour and butter and pour it over your mutton. A shoulder of veal roasted with this sauce is very good. Mutton kebobbed. Cut a loin of mutton in four pieces. Take off the skin and rub them with the yolk of an egg. Strew over them a few bread crumbs and a little shred parsley. Turn them round and spit them. Roast them and keep basting all the while with fresh butter to make the froth rise. When they are enough, put a little brown gravy under and serve them up. Garnish with pickle. To grill a breast of mutton. Score a breast of mutton in diamonds and rub it over with the yolk of an egg. Then strew on a few bread crumbs and shred parsley. Put it in a Dutch oven to broil. Baste it with fresh butter. Pour in the dish good caper sauce and serve it up. Split leg of mutton and onion sauce. Split the leg from the shank to the end. Stick a skewer in to keep the nick open. Baste it with red wine till it is half roasted. Then take the wine out of the dripping pan and put to it one anchovy. Set it over the fire till the anchovy is dissolved. Rub the yolk of a hard egg in a little cold butter. Mix it with the wine and put it in your sauce boat. Pour good onion sauce over the leg when it is roasted and serve it up. To force a leg of mutton. Raise the skin and take out the lean part of the mutton. Chop it exceeding fine with one anchovy. Shred a bundle of sweet herbs. Grate a penny loaf, half a lemon, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your taste. Make them into a force meat with three eggs and a large glass of red wine. Fill up the skin with the force meat, but leave the bone and shank in their place, and it will appear like a whole leg. Lay it on an earthen dish with a pint of red wine under it, and send it to the oven. It will take two hours and a half. When it comes out, take off all the fat, strain the gravy over the mutton, Lay round it hard yolks of eggs and pickled mushrooms. Garnish with pickles and serve it up. To dress sheep's rumps and kidneys. Boil six sheep's rumps in veal gravy. Then lard your kidneys with bacon and set them before the fire in a tin oven. When the rumps are tender, rub them over with the yolk of an egg, a little cheyenne and grated nutmeg. Skim the fat off the gravy Put it in a clean tossing pan with three ounces of boiled rice, a spoonful of good cream, a little mushroom powder or ketchup. Thicken it with flour and butter and give it a gentle boil. Fry your rumps a light brown. When you dish them up, lay them round on your rice so that the small ends meet in the middle and lay a kidney between every rump. Garnish with red cabbage or barberries and serve it up. It is a pretty side or corner dish. To dress a leg of mutton to eat like venison. Get the largest and fattest leg of mutton you can get, cut out like a haunch of venison as soon as it is killed. Whilst it is warm it will eat the tenderer. Take out the bloody vein, stick it in several places in the underside with a sharp pointed knife, pour over it a bottle of red wine, Turn it in the wine four or five times a day for five days. Then dry it exceeding well with a clean cloth. Hang it up in the air with the thick end uppermost for five days. Dry it night and morning to keep it from being damp or growing musty. When you roast it, cover it with paper and paste as you do venison. Serve it up with venison sauce. It will take four hours roasting. A bask of mutton. Take the caul of a leg of veal, lay it in a copper dish the size of a small punch bowl. Take the lean of a leg of mutton that has been kept a week, chop it exceeding small. Take half its weight in beef marrow, the crumbs of a penny loaf, the yolks of four eggs, two anchovies, half a pint of red wine, the rind of half a lemon grated. Mix it like sausage meat and lay it in your caul in the inside of your dish. Close up the caul and bake it in a quick oven. 
When it comes out, lay your dish upside down and turn the whole out. Pour over it brown gravy and send it up with venison sauce in a boat. Garnish with pickle. Oxford John Take a stale leg of mutton. Cut it in as thin collops as you possibly can. Take out all the fat sinews. Season them with mace, pepper and salt. Strew among them a little shred parsley, thyme and two or three shallots. Put in a good lump of butter into a stew pan. When it is hot, put in your collops. Keep stirring them with a wooden spoon till they are three parts done. Then add half a pint of gravy, a little juice of lemon. Thicken it a little with flour and butter. Let them simmer four or five minutes and they will be quite enough. If you let them boil or have them ready before you want them, they will grow hard. Serve them up hot with fried bread cut in dices, over and round them. To boil a leg of lamb and loin fried. Cut your leg from the loin. Boil the leg three quarters of an hour. Cut the loin in handsome steaks. Beat them with a cleaver and fry them a good brown. Then stew them a little in strong gravy. Put your leg on the dish and lay your steaks round it. Pour on your gravy, lay round lumps of stewed spinach, and crisp parsley on every steak. Send it to the table with a gooseberry sauce in a boat. To force a quarter of lamb. Take a hind quarter and cut off the shank. Raise the thick part of the flesh from the bone with a knife. Stuff the place with white force meat and stuff it under the kidney. Half roast it, then put it in a tossing pan with a quart of mutton gravy. Cover it close up and let it stew gently. When it is enough, take it up and lay it on your dish. Skim the fat off the gravy and strain it. Then put in a glass of Madeira wine, one spoonful of walnut ketchup, two of browning, half a lemon, a little cayenne, half a pint of oysters. Thicken it with a little butter rolled in flour. Pour your gravy hot on your lamb and serve it up. End of chapter 4, part 1「Chapter 4, part 2 of The Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To dress a lamb's head and pertinence Skin the head and split it. Take the black part out of the eyes. Then wash and clean it exceeding well. Lay it in warm water till it looks white. Wash and clean the pertinence. Take off the gall and lay them in water. Boil it half an hour. Then mince your heart, liver and lights very small. Put the mincemeat in a tossing pan with a quart of mutton gravy, a little ketchup, pepper and salt half a lemon. Thicken it with flour and butter, a spoonful of good cream, and just boil it up. When your head is boiled, rub it over with the yolk of an egg, strew over it bread crumbs, a little shred parsley, pepper and salt. Baste it well with butter, and brown it before the fire, or with a salamander. Put the pertinence on your dish, and lay the head over it. Garnish with lemon or pickle, and serve it up. To fricassee lamb stones. Skin six lamb stones, or what quantity you please. Dip them in batter, and fry them in hog's lard a nice brown. Have ready a little veal gravy. Thicken it with flour and butter. Put in a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, and a little mushroom ketchup. A slice of lemon, a little grated nutmeg. Beat the yolk of an egg, and mix it with two spoonfuls of thick cream. Put in your gravy, keep shaking it over the fire till it looks white and thick, then put in the lamb stones, and give them a shake. When they are hot, dish them up, and lay round them boiled force meat balls. To roast pig in imitation of lamb. Let your pig be a month or five weeks old. Divide it down the middle, take off the shoulder, and leave the rest to the hind part. Then take the skin off, draw sprigs of parsley all over the outside, 
which must be done by running a skewer or larding pin and sticking the stalk of the parsley in it. Spit it and roast it before a quick fire. Dredge it and baste it well with fresh butter. Roast it a fine brown and send it up with a froth on it. Garnish with green parsley. It will eat and look like fat lamb. It is et with salad. To barbecue a pig. Dress a pig of ten weeks old, as if it were to be roasted. Make a force meat of two anchovies, six sage leaves, and the liver of the pig, all chopped very small. Then put them into a marble mortar, with the crumbs of half a penny loaf, four ounces of butter, half a teaspoonful of cayenne pepper, and half a pint of red wine. Beat them all together to a paste. Put it in your pig's belly, and sew it up. Lay your pig down at a good distance before a large brisk fire. Singe it well. Put in your dripping pan three bottles of red wine. Baste it with the wine all the time it is roasting. When it is half roasted, put under your pig two penny loaves. If you have not wine enough, put in more. When your pig is near enough, take the loaves and sauce out of your dripping pan. Put to the sauce one anchovy chopped small, a bundle of sweet herbs and half a lemon. Boil it a few minutes, then draw your pig. Put a small lemon or apple in the pig's mouth and a loaf on each side. Strain your sauce and pour it on them, boiling hot. Lay barberries and slices of lemon round it and send it up whole to the table. It is a grand bottom dish. It will take four hours roasting. To barbecue a leg of pork. Lay down your leg to a good fire. Put in the dripping pan two bottles of red wine. Baste your pork with it all the time it is roasting. When it is enough, take up what is left in the pan. Put to it two anchovies, the yolks of three eggs boiled hard and pounded fine, with a quarter of a pound of butter. Add half a lemon a bunch of sweet herbs, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a spoonful of ketchup, and one of tarragon vinegar, or a little tarragon shred small. Boil them a few minutes, then draw your pork and cut the skin down from the bottom of the shank, in rows an inch broad. Raise every other row, and roll it to the shank. Strain your sauce and pour it on boiling hot. Lay oyster patties all round your fork, and sprigs of green parsley. To stuff a chine of pork. Take a chine that has been hung about a month. Boil it half an hour, then take it up, and make holes in it all over the lean part, one inch from another. Stuff them, and betwixt the joints with shred parsley. Rub it all over with the yolk of eggs. Strew over it bread crumbs, baste it, and set it in a Dutch oven. When it is enough, lay round it boiled broccoli or stewed spinach. Garnish with parsley. To roast a ham or a gammon of bacon. Half boil your ham or gammon. Then take off the skin. Dredge it with oatmeal sifted very fine. Baste it with fresh butter. It will make a stronger froth than either flour or bread crumbs. Then roast it. When it is enough, Dish it up and pour brown gravy on your dish. Garnish with green parsley and send it to the table. To force the inside of a sirloin of beef. Spit your sirloin, then cut off from the inside all the skin and fat together, and then take off all the flesh to the bones. Chop the meat very fine with a little beaten mace, two or three shallots, one anchovy, half a pint of red wine, a little pepper and salt, and put it on the bones again. Lay your fat and skin on again, and skewer it close and paper it well. When roasted, take off the fat, and dish up the sirloin. Pour over it a sauce made of a little red wine, a shallot, one anchovy, two or three slices of horseradish, and serve it up. To stew a rump of beef. Half roast your beef, then put it in a large saucepan or cauldron, with two quarts of water and one of red wine, 
two or three blades of mace, a shallot, one spoonful of lemon pickle, two of walnut ketchup, the same of browning, cayenne pepper, and salt to your taste. Let it stew over a gentle fire, close covered for two hours. Then take up your beef and lay it on a deep dish. Skim off the fat and strain the gravy, and put in one ounce of morel and half a pint of mushrooms. Thicken your gravy and pour it over your beef. Lay round it forcemeat balls. Garnish with horseradish and serve it up. A fricando of beef. Cut a few slices of beef five or six inches long and half an inch thick. Lard it with bacon, dredge it well with flour, and set it before a brisk fire to brown. Then put it in a tossing pan with a quart of gravy, a few morels and truffles, half a lemon, and stew them half an hour. Then add one spoonful of ketchup, the same of browning, and a little cheyenne. Thicken your sauce and pour it over your fricando. Lay round them forcemeat balls and the yolks of hard eggs. To a la mode beef. Take the bone out of a rump of beef, lard the top with bacon, then make a forcemeat of four ounces of marrow, two heads of garlic, the crumbs of a penny loaf, a few sweet herbs chopped small, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your taste, and the yolks of four eggs well beat. Mix it up and stuff your beef where the bone came out, and in several places in the lean part. Skewer it round and bind it about with a fillet. Put it in a pot with a pint of red wine, and tie it down with strong paper. Bake it in the oven for three hours. When it comes out, if you want to eat it hot, skim the fat off the gravy, and add half an ounce of morels, a spoonful of pickled mushrooms. Thicken it with flour and butter, dish up your beef and pour on the gravy, lay round it forcemeat balls and send it up. To make a porcupine of the flat ribs of beef. Bone the flat ribs and beat it half an hour with a paste pin, then rub it over with the yolks of eggs, strew over it bread crumbs, parsley, leeks, sweet marjoram, lemon peel shred fine, nutmeg, pepper, and salt. Roll it up very close and bind it hard. Lard it across with bacon, then a row of cold boiled tongs, a third row of pickled cucumbers, a fourth row of lemon peel. Do it all over in rows as above, till it is larded all round. It will look like red, green, white, and yellow dices. Then spit it, or put it in a deep pot with a pint of water. Lay over it the call of veal to keep it from scorching. Tie it down with strong paper and send it to the oven. When it comes out, skim off the fat and strain your gravy into a saucepan, adding to it two spoonfuls of red wine, the same of browning, one of mushroom ketchup, half a lemon. Thicken it with a lump of butter rolled in flour. Dish up the meat and pour the gravy on the dish. Lay round forcemeat balls. Garnish with horseradish and serve it up. To make brisket of beef a la royale. Bone a brisket of beef and make holes in it with a knife about an inch one from another. Fill one hole with fat bacon, a second with chopped parsley and a third with chopped oysters, seasoned with nutmeg, pepper and salt, till you have done the brisket over. Then pour a pint of red wine boiling hot upon the beef. Dredge it well with flour. Send it to the oven and bake it three hours or better. When it comes out of the oven, take off the fat and strain the gravy over your beef. Garnish with pickles and serve it up. Beef Olives Cut slices off a rump of beef about six inches long and half an inch thick. Beat them with a paste pin and rub them over with the yolk of an egg, a little pepper, salt, and beaten mace, the crumbs of half a penny loaf, two ounces of marrow sliced fine, a handful of parsley chopped small, and the outrind of half a lemon grated. Strew them all over your steaks and roll them up, 
skewer them quite close and set them before the fire to brown then put them into a tossing pan with a pint of gravy a spoonful of ketchup the same of browning a teaspoonful of lemon pickle thicken it with a little butter rolled in flour lay round force meat balls mushrooms or the yolks of hard eggs to make mock hair of a beast's heart wash a large beast's heart clean and cut off the deaf ears and stuff it with some force meat as you do a hair lay a call of veal or paper over the top to keep in the stuffing roast it either with a cradle spit or a hanging one it will take an hour and a half before a good fire baste it with red wine when roasted take the wine out of the dripping pan and skim off the fat and add a glass more of wine when it is hot put in some lumps of red currant jelly and pour it in the dish serve it up and send in red currant jelly cut in slices on a saucer Beef heart larded. Take a good beast heart, stuff it as before, and lard it all over with little bits of bacon. Dust it with flour and cover it with paper to keep it from being too dry, and send it to the oven. When baked, put the heart on your dish, take off the fat, and strain the gravy through a hair sieve. Put it in a saucepan with one spoonful of red wine the same of browning, and one of lemon pickle, half an ounce of morals, one anchovy cut small, a little beaten mace. Thicken it with flour and butter, pour hot on your heart and serve it up. Garnish with barberries. To stew ox palates. Wash four ox palates in several waters, and then lay them in warm water for half an hour. Then wash them out and put them in a pot, and tie them down with strong paper, and send them to the oven with as much water as will cover them, or boil them till tender, then skin them, and cut them in pieces half an inch broad and three inches long, and put them in a tossing pan with a pint of veal gravy, one spoonful of Madeira wine, the same of ketchup and browning, one onion stuck with cloves, and a slice of lemon, Stew them half an hour, then take out the onion and lemon. Thicken your sauce and put them in a dish. Have ready boiled artichoke bottoms. Cut them in quarters and lay them over your palates with force meat balls and morals. Garnish with lemon and serve them up. To Fricando Ox Palates When you have washed and cleaned your palates as before, cut them in square pieces lard them with little bits of bacon fry them in hog's lard a pretty brown and put them in a sieve to drain the fat from them then take better than half a pint of beef gravy one spoonful of red wine half as much of browning a little lemon pickle one anchovy a shallot and a bit of horse radish give them a boil and strain your gravy then put in your palates and stew them half an hour Make your sauce pretty thick, dish them up, and lay round them stewed spinach, pressed and cut like sippets, and serve them up. To fricassee ox palates. Clean your palates very well as before. Put them in a stew pot and cover them with water. Set them in the oven for three or four hours. When they come from the oven, strip off the skins and cut them in square pieces. Season them with mace, nutmeg, chayan, and salt. Mix a spoonful of flour with the yolks of two eggs. Dip in your palates and fry them a light brown. Then put them in a sieve to drain. Have ready half a pint of veal gravy with a little caper liquor, a spoonful of browning and a few mushrooms. Thicken it well with flour and butter. Pour it hot on your dish and lay in your palates. Garnish with fried parsley and barberries. To stew a turkey with celery sauce. Take a large turkey and make a good white forcemeat of veal and stuff the craw of the turkey. Skewer it as for boiling, then boil it in soft water till it is almost enough. And then take up your turkey and put it in a pot with some of the water it was boiled in 
to keep it hot. Put seven or eight heads of celery that is washed and cleaned very well into the water that the turkey was boiled in, till they are tender. Then take them up, and put in your turkey with the breast down, and stew it a quarter of an hour. Then take it up, and thicken your sauce with half a pound of butter and flour, to make it pretty thick, and a quarter of a pint of rich cream. Then put in your celery. Pour the sauce and celery hot upon the turkey's breast, and serve it up. It is a proper top dish for dinner or supper. To stew a turkey brown. When you have drawn the craw out of your turkey, cut it up the back and take out the entrails, that the turkey may appear whole, and take all the bones out of the body very carefully. The rump, legs and wings is to be left whole. Then take the crumb of a penny loaf, and chop half a hundred of oysters very small, with half a pound of beef marrow, a little lemon peel cut fine, and pepper and salt. Mix them well up together, with the yolks of four eggs, and stuff your turkey with it. Sew it up and lard it down each side with bacon. Half roast it, then put it into a tossing pan with two quarts of veal gravy, and cover it close up. When it has stewed one hour, add a spoonful of mushroom ketchup, half an anchovy, a slice or two of lemon, a little cayenne pepper, and a bunch of sweet herbs. Cover them close up again, and stew it half an hour longer. Then take it up and skim the fat off the gravy, and strain it. Thicken it with flour and butter. Let it boil a few minutes, and pour it hot upon your turkey. Lay round it oyster patties and serve it up. Fowls a la braise Skewer your fowl as for boiling, with the legs in the body. Then lay over it a layer of fat bacon, cut in pretty thin slices. Then wrap it round in beet leaves, then in a call of veal, and put it into a large saucepan with three pints of water, a glass of Madeira wine, a bunch of sweet herbs, two or three blades of mace, and half a lemon. Stew it till quite tender, take it up and skim off the fat. Make your gravy pretty thick with flour and butter, and strain it through a hair sieve, and put to it a pint of oysters, a teacup full of thick cream. Keep shaking your tossing pan over the fire, and when it has simmered a little, serve up your fowl with the bacon, beet leaves, and call on, and pour your sauce hot upon it. Garnish with barberries or red beetroot. To force a fowl. Take a large fowl, pick it clean and cut it down the back. Take out the entrails and take the skin off whole. Cut the flesh from the bones and chop it with half a pint of oysters, one ounce of beef marrow, a little pepper and salt. Mix it up with cream, then lay the meat on the bones and draw the skin over it and sew up the back. Then cut large thin slices of bacon, and lay them over the breast of your fowl. Tie the bacon on with a pack thread in diamonds. It will take one hour roasting by a moderate fire. Make a good brown gravy sauce, pour it upon your dish. Take the bacon off and lay in your fowl, and serve it up. Garnish with pickles, mushrooms, or oysters. It is proper for a side dish for dinner, or top for supper. To fricassee chickens. Skin them and cut them in small pieces. Wash them in warm water, and then dry them very clean with a cloth. Season them with pepper and salt, and then put them into a stew pan with a little fair water and a good piece of butter, a little lemon pickle or half a lemon, a glass of white wine, one anchovy, a little mace and nutmeg, an onion stuck with cloves, a bunch of lemon thyme and sweet marjoram. Let them stew together till your chickens are tender, and then lay them on your dish. Thicken the gravy with flour and butter, strain it, then beat the yolks of three eggs a little, and mix them with a large teacupful of rich cream, and put in your gravy and shake it over the fire, but don't let it boil, and pour it over your chickens. To force chickens. 
roast your chickens better than half take off the skin then the meat and chop it small with shred parsley and crumbs of bread pepper and salt and a little good cream then put in the meat and close the skin brown it with a salamander and serve it up with white sauce to marinate a goose cut your goose up the backbone then take out all the bones and stuff it with force meat and sew up the back again fry the goose a good brown then put it into a deep stew pan with two quarts of good gravy and cover it close and stew it two hours then take it out and skim off the fat add a large spoonful of lemon pickle one of browning and one of red wine one anchovy shred fine beaten mace pepper and salt to your palate thicken with flour and butter boil it a little dish up your goose and strain your gravy over it note make your stuffing thus take ten or twelve sage leaves two large onions two or three large sharp apples shred them very fine mix them with the crumbs of a penny loaf four ounces of beef marrow one glass of red wine half a nutmeg grated pepper salt and a little lemon peel shred small make a light stuffing with the yolks of four eggs observe to make it one hour before you want it to stew ducks take three young ducks lard them down each side the breast dust them with flour and set them before the fire to brown then put them in a stew pan with a quart of water a pint of red wine one spoonful of walnut ketchup the same of browning one anchovy half a lemon a clove of garlic a bundle of sweet herbs cayenne pepper to your taste let them stew slowly for half an hour or till they are tender lay them on a dish and keep them hot skim off the fat strain your gravy through a hair sieve add to it a few morels and truffles boil it quick till reduced to little more than half a pint pour it over your ducks and serve it up it is proper for a side dish for dinner or bottom for supper to stew ducks with green peas half roast your ducks then put them into a stew pan with a pint of good gravy a little mint and three or four sage leaves chopped small cover them close and stew them half an hour boil a pint of green peas as for eating and put them in after you have thickened the gravy dish up your ducks and pour the gravy and peas over them ducks a la braise dress and singe your ducks lard them quite through with bacon rolled in shred parsley thyme onions beaten mace cloves pepper and salt put in the bottom of a stew pan a few slices of fat bacon the same of ham or gammon of bacon two or three slices of veal or beef lay your ducks in with the breast down and cover the ducks with slices the same as put under them cut in a carrot or two a turnip one onion a head of celery a blade of mace four or five cloves a little whole pepper cover them close down and let them simmer a little over a gentle stove till the breast is a light brown then put in some broth or water cover them as close down again as you can stew them gently betwixt two and three hours till enough then take parsley onion or shallot two anchovies a few gherkins or capers chop them all very fine put them in a stew pan with part of the liquor from the ducks a little browning the juice of half a lemon boil it up and cut the ends of the bacon even with the breast of your ducks lay them on your dish pour the sauce hot upon them and serve them up some put garlic instead of onions ducks a la mode slit two ducks down the back and bone them carefully make a force meat of the crumbs of a penny loaf four ounces of fat bacon scraped a little parsley thyme lemon peel two shallots or onions shred very fine with pepper salt and nutmeg to your taste and two eggs 
stuff your ducks with it and sew them up, lard them down each side of the breast with bacon, dredge them well with flour, and put them in a Dutch oven to brown. Then put them into a stew pan with three pints of gravy, a glass of red wine, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a large one of walnut and mushroom ketchup, one of browning, and one anchovy with cayenne pepper to your taste. Stew them gently over a slow fire for an hour. When enough, thicken your gravy and put in a few truffles and morels. Strain your gravy and pour it upon them. You may a la mode a goose the same way. Pigeons Compote Take six young pigeons and skewer them as you do for boiling. Put force meat into the craws, lard them down the breast and fry them brown. Then put them into strong brown gravy and let them stew three quarters of an hour. Thicken it with a lump of butter rolled in flour. When you dish them up, lay force meat balls round them and strain the gravy over them. The force meat must be left thus. Grate the crumbs of half a penny loaf and scrape a quarter of a pound of fat bacon instead of suet. Chop a little parsley, thyme, two shallots or an onion. Grater a little nutmeg, lemon peel, some pepper and salt. Mix them all up with eggs. It is proper for a top dish for second course, or a side dish for the first. Pigeons in a hole. Pick, draw and wash four young pigeons. Stick their legs into their belly as you do boiled pigeons. Season them with pepper, salt and beaten mace. Put into the belly of every pigeon a lump of butter the size of a walnut. Lay your pigeons in a pie dish. Pour over them a batter made of three eggs, two spoonfuls of flour and half a pint of good milk. Bake it in a moderate oven and serve them to table the same dish. Pigeons transmogrified. Pick and clean six small young pigeons but do not cut off their heads. Cut off their pinions and boil them ten minutes in water. Then cut off the ends of six large cucumbers and scrape out the seeds. Put in your pigeons but let the heads be cut at the ends of the cucumbers and stick a bunch of barberries in their bills and then put them into a tossing pan with a pint of veal gravy, a little anchovy, a glass of red wine, a spoonful of browning, a little slice of lemon, cayenne and salt to your taste. Stew them seven minutes, take them out, thicken your gravy with a little butter rolled in flour, boil it up and strain it over your pigeons and serve it up. To broil pigeons. Take young pigeons, pick and draw them, split them down the back and season them with pepper and salt. Lay them on the gridiron with the breast upward, then turn them, but be careful you do not burn the skin. Rub them over with butter and keep turning them till they are enough. Dish them up and lay round them crisped parsley and pour over them melted butter or a gravy which you please and send them up. To boil pigeons in rice. When you have pickled and drawn your pigeons, turn the legs under the wings and cut off the pinions and then lay over every pigeon thin slices of bacon and a large beet leaf. Wrap them in clean cloth separately and boil them till enough. Have ready four ounces of rice boiled soft and put into a sieve to drain. Put the rice into a little good veal gravy thickened with flour and butter. Boil your rice a little in the gravy and add two spoonful of good cream. Take your pigeons out of the cloths and leave on the bacon and beet leaves. Pour the rice over them and serve them up. To Fricando Pigeons Pick, draw and wash your pigeons very clean. Stuff the craws and lard them down the sides of the breast. Fry them in butter a fine brown and then put them into a tossing pan with a quart of gravy. Stew them till they are tender. Then take off the fat and put in a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a large spoonful of browning, the same of walnut ketchup, a little cayenne and salt. Thicken your gravy 
and add half an ounce of morals and four yolks of hard eggs. Lay the pigeons in your dish and put the morals and eggs around them and strain your sauce over them. Garnish with barberries and lemon peel and serve it up. Jugged Pigeons Take six pigeons, pluck and draw them, wash them clean and dry them with a cloth. Season them with beaten mace, white pepper and salt. Put them in a jug and put half a pound of butter upon them. Stop up your jug close with a cloth that no steam can get out. Set it in a kettle of boiling water and let it boil one hour and a half. Then take out your pigeons and put the gravy that is come from the pigeons into a pan and put to it one spoonful of wine, one of ketchup, a slice of lemon, half an anchovy chopped small, and a bundle of sweet herbs. Boil it a little, thicken it with a little butter rolled in flour. Lay your pigeons on the dish, and strain the gravy on them. Garnish with parsley and red cabbage, and serve them up. You may lay mushrooms or forcemeat balls. It is a pretty side or corner dish. Boiled Pigeons and Bacon Take six young pigeons, wash them clean as before, turn their legs under their wings, boil them in milk and water by themselves twenty minutes. Have ready boiled a square piece of bacon. Take off the skin and brown it, put the bacon in the middle of your dish, and lay the pigeons round it, and lumps of stewed spinach. Pour plain melted butter over them, and send parsley and butter in a boat. Pigeons fricassee. Cut your pigeons as you would do chickens for fricassee. Fry them a light brown. Then put them into some good mutton gravy and stew them near half an hour. And then put in half an ounce of morals, a spoonful of browning and a slice of lemon. Take up your pigeons and thicken your gravy. Strain it over your pigeons and lay round them force meat balls and garnish with pickles. Partridge in pains. Half roast two partridges and take the flesh from them and mix it with the crumbs of a penny loaf steeped in rich gravy, six ounces of beef marrow or half a pound of fat bacon scraped, ten morals boiled soft and cut small, two artichoke bottoms boiled and shred small, the yolks of three eggs, pepper, salt, nutmeg and shred lemon peel to your palate. Work them together and bake them in moulds the shape of an egg and serve them up cold or in jelly. Garnish with curled parsley. To stew partridges. Truss your partridges as for roasting. Stuff the craws and lard them down each side of the breast. Then roll a lump of butter in pepper, salt and beaten mace and put it into the bellies. Sew up the vents dredge them well and fry them a light brown then put them into a stew pan with a quart of good gravy a spoonful of madeira wine the same of mushroom ketchup a teaspoonful of lemon pickle and half the quantity of mushroom powder one anchovy half a lemon a sprig of sweet marjoram cover the pan close and stew them half an hour then take them out and thicken the gravy boil it a little and pour it over the partridges, and lay round them artichoke bottoms, boiled and cut in quarters, and the yolks of four hard eggs if agreeable. To stew partridges a second way. Take three partridges. When dressed, singe them, blanch and beat three ounces of almonds, and grate the same quantity of fine white bread. Chop three anchovies, mix them with six ounces of butter, Stuff the partridges and sew them up at both ends. Truss them and wrap slices of fat bacon round them. Half roast them. Then take one and pull the meat off the breast and beat it in a marble mortar with the force meat it was stuffed with. Have ready a strong gravy made of ham and veal. Strain it into a stew pan. Then take the bacon off the other two. Wipe them clean and put them into the gravy with a good deal of shallots. Let them stew till tender, then take them out and boil the gravy till it is almost as thick as bread sauce. 
then add to it a glass of sweet oil, the same of champagne, and the juice of a china orange. Put your partridges in and make them hot. Garnish with slices of bacon and lemon. To stew a hare. When you have paunched and cased your hare, cut her as for eating. Put her into a large saucepan with three pints of beef gravy, a pint of red wine, a large onion stuck with cloves, a bundle of winter savoury, a slice of horseradish, two blades of beaten mace, one anchovy, a spoonful of walnut or mum ketchup, one of browning, half a lemon, cheyenne and salt to your taste. Put on a close cover and set it over a gentle fire and stew it for two hours. Then take it up into a soup dish and thicken your gravy with a lump of butter rolled in flour. Boil it a little and strain it over your hair. Garnish with lemon peel cut like straws and serve it up. To jug a hair. Cut the hair as for eating. Season it with pepper, salt and beaten mace. Put it into a jug or pitcher with a close top. Put to it a bundle of sweet herbs and set it in a kettle of boiling water. Let it stand till it is tender. Then take it up and pour the gravy into a tossing pan with a glass of red wine, one anchovy, a large onion stuck with cloves, a little beaten mace and cayenne pepper to your taste. Boil it a little and thicken it. Dish up your hair and strain the gravy over it. Then send it up. To Florendina Hair Take a grown hair and let her hang up four or five days. Then case her and leave on the ears and take out all the bones except the head, which must be left on whole. Lay your hair flat on the table and lay over the inside a force meat. Then roll it up to the head. Skewer it with the head and ears leaning back. Tie it with pack thread as you would a collar of veal. Wrap it in a cloth and boil it an hour and a half in a saucepan with a close cover on it, with two quarts of water. When your liquor is reduced to one quart, put in a pint of red wine, a spoonful of lemon pickle and one of ketchup, the same of browning, and stew it till it is reduced to a pint. Thicken it with butter rolled in flour. Lay round your hair a few morals and four slices of force meat, boiled in a call of a leg of veal. When you dish it up, draw the jaw bones and stick them in the eyes for horns. Let the ears lie back on the roll and stick a sprig of myrtle in the mouth. Strain over your sauce and serve it up. Garnish with barberries and parsley. Forced meat for the hare. Take the crumb of a penny loaf, the liver shred fine, half a pound of fat bacon scraped, a glass of red wine, one anchovy, two eggs, a little winter savoury, sweet marjoram, lemon, thyme, pepper, salt and nutmeg to your taste. To Florendine Rabbits Take three young rabbits, skin them, but leave on the ears. Wash and dry them with a cloth. Take out the bones carefully, leaving the head whole, then lay them flat. Make a force meat of a quarter of a pound of bacon scraped. It answers better than suet. It makes the rabbits eat tenderer and whiter. Add to the bacon the crumbs of a penny loaf, a little lemon thyme or lemon peel shred fine, parsley chopped small, nutmeg, cheyenne and salt to your palate. Mix them up together with an egg and spread it over the rabbits. Roll them up to the head, skewer them straight and close the ends to prevent the force meat from coming out. Skewer the ears back and tie them in separate cloths and boil them half an hour. When you dish them up, take out the jaw bones and stick them in the eyes for ears. Put round them force meat balls and mushrooms. Have ready a white sauce of veal gravy, a little anchovy, the juice of half a lemon or a teaspoonful of lemon pickle. Strain it, take a quarter of a pound of butter rolled in flour, so as to make the sauce pretty thick. Keep stirring it whilst the flour is dissolving. Beat the yolk of an egg, put to it some thick cream, nutmeg and salt, mix it with the gravy, and let it simmer a little over the fire, but not boil 
for it will curdle the cream. Pour it over the rabbits and serve it up. Rabbits surprised. Take young rabbits, skewer them and put the same pudding as for the roasted rabbits. When they are roasted, draw out the jaw bones and stick them in the eyes to appear like horns. Then take off all the meat from the back, clean from the bones, but leave them whole. Chop the meat exceeding fine with a little shred parsley, lemon peel, one ounce of beef marrow, a spoonful of good cream and a little salt. Beat the yolks of two hard eggs and a piece of butter the size of a walnut in a marble mortar, very fine. Then mix all together and put it in a tossing pan. When it has stewed five minutes, lay it on the rabbit where you took the meat off and put it close down with your hand to appear like a whole rabbit. Then heat a salamander and brown it all over. Pour a good brown gravy made as thick as cream in the dish. Stick a bunch of myrtle in their mouths and serve them up with their livers broiled and frothed. To fricassee rabbits brown. Cut up your rabbits as for eating. Fry them in butter a little light brown. Put them into a tossing pan with a pint of water, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, a large spoonful of mushroom ketchup, the same of browning, one anchovy, a slice of lemon, cayenne pepper and salt to your taste. Stew them over a slow fire till they are enough. Thicken your gravy and strain it. Dish up your rabbits and pour the gravy over. To fricassee rabbits white. Cut your rabbits as before and put them into a tossing pan with a pint of veal gravy, a teaspoonful of lemon pickle, one anchovy, a slice of lemon, a little beaten mace, cayenne pepper and salt. Stew them over a slow fire. When they are enough, thicken your gravy with flour and butter, strain it, then add the yolks of two eggs mixed with a large teacupful of thick cream and a little nutmeg grated in it. Don't let it boil and serve it up. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of The Experienced English Housekeeper » by Elizabeth Raffold This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on Pies Raised pies should have a quick oven and well closed up, or your pie will fall in the sides. It should have no water put in till the minute it goes to the oven. It makes the crust sad and is a great hazard of the pie running. Light paste requires a moderate oven, but not too slow. It will make them sad, and a quick oven will catch and burn it, and not give it time to rise. Tarts that are iced require a slow oven, or the icing will be brown, and the paste not be near baked. These sorts of tarts ought to be made of sugar paste, and rolled very thin. To make a crisp paste for tarts. Take one pound of fine flour, mixed with one ounce of loaf sugar, beat and sifted. Make it into a stiff paste with a gill of boiling cream, and three ounces of butter in it. Work it well, roll it very thin. When you have made your tarts, beat the white of an egg a little, rub it over them with a feather, sift a little doubled refined sugar over them, and bake them in a moderate oven. Icing a second way. Beat the white of an egg to a strong froth. Put in by degrees four ounces of double refined sugar with as much gum as will lie on a sixpence. Beat and sifted fine. Beat them half an hour, then lay it over your tarts the thickness of a straw. To make a light paste for tarts. Take one pound of fine flour, Beat the white of an egg to a strong froth. Mix it with as much water as will make three quarters of a pound of flour into a pretty stiff paste. Roll it out very thin. Lay the third part of half a pound of butter in thin pieces. Dredge it with part of the quarter of your flour left out for that purpose. 
roll it up tight, then with your paste pin, roll it out again. Do so until all your half pound of butter and flour is done. Cut it into square pieces and make your tarts. It requires a quicker oven than crisp paste. To make a paste for a goose pie. Take 18 pounds of fine flour, put 6 pounds of fresh butter and 1 pound of rendered beef suet in a kettle of water. Boil it 2 or 3 minutes, then pour it boiling hot upon your flour. Work it well into a pretty stiff paste, pull it in lumps to cool and raise your pie. Bake it in a hot oven. You may make any raised pie the same way, only take a smaller quantity in proportion. To make a cold paste for dish pies. Take a pound of fine flour, rub it into half a pound of butter, beat the yolks of two eggs, put them into as much water as will make it a stiff paste, roll it out, then put your butter on in thin pieces. Dust it with flour, Roll it up tight when you have done it so for three times. Roll it out pretty thin and bake it in a quick oven. To make paste for custards. Pour half a pound of butter in a pan of water. Take two pounds of flour. When your butter boils, pour it on your flour with as much water as will make it into a good paste. Work it well and when it has cooled a little, Raise your custards and put a paper round the inside of them. When they are half baked, fill them. When you make any kind of dripping paste, boil it four or five minutes in a good quantity of water to take the strength off it. When you make a cold crust with suet, shred it fine, rub part of it into the flour, then make it into a paste and roll it out as before, only strew in suet instead of butter. To make a French pie. To two pounds of flour, put three quarters of a pound of butter. Make it into a paste and raise the walls of the pie. Then roll out some paste thin as for a lid. Cut it into vine leaves or the figures of any moulds you have. If you have no moulds, you may make use of a crockeran and pick out pretty shapes. Beat the yolks of two eggs and rub the outside of the walls of the pie with it and lay the vine leaves or shapes round the walls, and rub them over with the eggs. Fill the pie with the bones of the meat, to keep the pie in shape, and lay a thin lid on to keep the steam in, that the crust may be well soaked. It is to go to table without a lid. Take a calf's head, wash and clean it well, boil it half an hour. When it is cold, cut it in thin slices and put it in a tossing pan with three pints of veal gravy, and three sweetbreads cut thin, and let it stew one hour, with half an ounce of morals, and half an ounce of truffles. Then have ready two calf's feet, boiled and boned. Cut them in small pieces, and put them into your tossing pan, with a spoonful of lemon pickle, and one of browning, cayenne pepper, and a little salt. When the meat is tender, thicken the gravy a little with flour and butter, Strain it and put in a few pickled mushrooms, but fresh ones if you can get them. Put the meat into the pie you took the bones out, and lay the nicest part at the top. Have ready a quarter of a hundred of asparagus heads. Strew them over the top of the pie, and serve it up. A Yorkshire Goose Pie Take a large fat goose, split it down the back, and take all the bones out. Bone a turkey and two ducks the same way. Season them very well with pepper and salt, with six woodcocks. Lay the goose down on a clean dish, with the skin side down, and lay the turkey into the goose, with the skin down. Have ready a large hare, cleaned well, cut in pieces and stewed in the oven, with a pound of butter, a quarter of an ounce of mace, beat fine, the same of white pepper and salt to your taste till the meat will leave the bones, and scum the butter off the gravy. Pick the meat clean off, and beat it in a marble mortar very fine with the butter you took off, and lay it in the turkey. Take twenty-four pounds of the finest flour, six pounds of butter, 
half a pound of fresh rendered suet. Make the paste pretty stiff and raise the pie oval. Roll out a lump of paste and cut it in vine leaves, or what form you please. Rub the pie with the yolks of eggs and put on your ornaments on the walls. Then turn the hare, turkey and goose upside down and lay them in your pie with the ducks at each end and the woodcocks on the sides. Make your lid pretty thick and put it on. You may lay flowers or the shape of the fowls in paste on the lid and make a hole in the middle of your lid. The walls of the pie is to be one inch and a half higher than the lid. Then rub it all over with the yolks of eggs and bind it round with threefold paper and lay the same over the top. It will take four hours baking in a brown bread oven. When it comes out, melt two pounds of butter in the gravy that comes from the hare and put it hot in the pie through a tun dish. Close it well up and let it be eight or ten days before you cut it. If you send it any distance, make up the hole in the middle with cold butter to prevent the air from getting in. A hare pie. Cut a large hare in pieces. Season it well with mace, nutmeg, pepper and salt. Put it in a jug with half a pound of butter. Cover it close up with a paste or cloth. Set it in a copper of boiling water and let it stew one hour and a half. Then take it out to cool and make a rich force meat of a quarter of a pound of scraped bacon, two onions, a glass of red wine, the crumb of a penny loaf, a little winter savoury, the liver cut small, a little nutmeg. Season it high with pepper and salt, mix it well up with the yolks of three eggs, raise the pie and lay the force meat in the bottom. Lay in the hare with the gravy that came out of the hare, lay the lid on and put flowers or leaves on it. It will take an hour and a half to bake it. It is a handsome side dish for a large table. A salmon pie. Boil your salmon as for eating. Take off the skin and all the bones out, and pound the meat in a mortar very fine, with mace, nutmeg, pepper and salt to your taste. Raise the pie and put flowers or leaves on the walls. Put the salmon in and lid it. Bake it an hour and a half. When it comes out of the oven, take off the lid and put in four ounces of rich melted butter. Cut a lemon in slices and lay over it. Stick in two or three leaves of fennel and send it to table without a lid. A beef steak pie. Beat five or six rump steaks very well with a paste pin and season them well with pepper and salt. Lay a good puff paste round the dish and put a little water in the bottom. Then lay the steaks in with a lump of butter upon every steak and put on the lid. Cut a little paste in what form you please and lay it on. A thatched house pie. Take an earthen dish that is pretty deep. Rub the inside with two ounces of butter. Then spread over it two ounces of vermicelli. Make a good puff paste and roll it pretty thick and lay it on the dish. Take three or four pigeons. Season them very well with pepper and salt and put a good lump of butter in them and lay them in the dish with the breast down and put a thick lid over them and bake it in a moderate oven. When enough, take the dish you intend for it and turn the pie onto it and the vermicelli will appear like thatch which gives it the name of thatched house pie. It is a pretty side or corner dish for a large dinner or a bottom for supper. Egg and bacon pie to eat cold. Steep a few thin slices of bacon all night in water to take out the salt. Lay your bacon in the dish. Beat eight eggs with a pint of thick cream. Put in a little pepper and salt and pour it on the bacon. Lay over it a good cold paste. Bake it a day before you want it in a moderate oven. A calf's head pie. Parboil a calf's head. When cold, cut it in pieces. Season it well with pepper and salt. 
put it in a raised crust with half a pint of strong gravy. Bake it an hour and a half. When it comes out of the oven, cut off the lid and chop the yolks of three hard eggs small. Strew them over the top of the pie and lay three or four slices of lemon and pour on some good melted butter and send it to table without a lid. A savoury chicken pie. Lest your chickens be small, season them with mace, pepper and salt. Put a lump of butter into every one of them. Lay them in the dish with the breasts up and lay a thin slice of bacon over them. It will give them a pleasant flavour. And then put in a pint of strong gravy and make a good puff paste. Lid it and bake it in a moderate oven. French cooks generally put morals and yolks of eggs chopped small. A mince pie. Boil a neat's tongue two hours, then skin it and chop it as small as possible. Chop very small three pounds of fresh beef suet, three pounds of good baking apples, four pounds of currants clean washed, picked and well dried before the fire, one pound of jar raisins stoned and chopped small, and one pound of powder sugar. Mix them all together with half an ounce of mace, the same of nutmeg grated, cloves and cinnamon a quarter of an ounce of each, and one pint of French brandy, and make a rich puff paste. As you fill the pie up, put in a little candied citron and orange, cut in little pieces. What you have to spare, put close down in a pot and cover it up. Put no citron nor orange in till you use it. A codling pie. Gather small codlings. Put them in a clean brass pan with spring water. Lay vine leaves on them and cover them with a cloth wrapped round the cover of the pan to keep in the steam. When they grow softish, peel off the skin and put them in the same water with the vine leaves. Hang them a great height over the fire to green. When you see them a fine green, take them out of the water and put them in a deep dish with as much powder or loaf sugar as will sweeten them. Make the lid of rich puff paste and bake it. When it comes from the oven, take off the lid and cut in little pieces like sippets and stick them round the inside of your pie with the points upwards. Pour over your codlings a good custard made thus. Boil a pint of cream with a stick of cinnamon and sugar enough to make it a little sweet. Let it stand till cold, then put in the yolks of four eggs well beaten. Set it on the fire and keep stirring it till it grows thick, but do not let it boil lest it curdle. Then pour it into your pie, pare a little lemon thin, cut the peel like straws and lay it on your codlings over the top. An herb pie for Lent. Take lettuce, leeks and spinach, beets and parsley, of each a handful. Give them a boil, then chop them small, and have ready boiled in a cloth one quart of groats with two or three onions in them. Put them in a frying pan with the herbs and a good deal of salt, a pound of butter and a few apples cut thin. Stew them a few minutes over the fire. Fill your dish or raised crust with it. One hour will bake it, then serve it up. A venison pasty. Bone a breast or shoulder of venison. Season it well with mace, pepper and salt. Lay it in a deep pot with the best part of a neck of mutton cut in slices and laid over the venison. Pour in a large glass of red wine. Put a coarse paste over it and bake it two hours in an oven. Then lay the venison in a dish and pour the gravy over it, and put one pound of butter over it. Make a good puff paste, and lay it near half an inch thick round the edge of the dish. Roll out the lid, which must be a little thicker than the paste on the edge of the dish, and lay it on. Then roll out another lid pretty thin, and cut it in flowers, leaves, or whatever form you please, and lay it on the lid. If you don't want it, it will keep in the pot that it was baked in eight or ten days, but keep the crust on to prevent the air from getting it. A breast and shoulder of venison is the most proper for a pasty. A hot and top pie. 
boil and bone two calf's feet clean very well a calf's chitterling boil it and chop it small take two chickens and cut them up as for eating put them in a stew pan with two sweetbreads a quart of veal or mutton gravy half an ounce of morels cheyenne pepper and salt to your palate stew them all together an hour over a gentle fire then put in six forcemeat balls that have been boiled and the yolks of four hard eggs and put them in a good raised crust that have been baked for it strew over the top of your pie a few green peas boiled as for eating or peel and cut some young green broccoli stalks about the size of peas give them a gentle boil and strew them over the top of your pie and send it up hot without a lid the same way as the french pie a bride's pie boil two calf's feet pick the meat from the bones and chop it very fine shred small one pound of beef suet and a pound of apples wash and pick one pound of currants very small dry them before the fire stone and chop a quarter of a pound of jar raisins a quarter of an ounce of cinnamon the same of mace and nutmeg two ounces of candied citron two ounces of candied lemon cut thin a glass of brandy and one of champagne put them in a china dish with a rich puff paste over it roll another lid and cut it in leaves flowers figures and put a glass ring in it an eel pie skin and wash your eels very clean cut them in pieces one inch and a half long season them with pepper salt and a little dried sage rubbed small raise your pies about the size of the inside of a plate fill your pies with eels lay a lid over them and bake them in a quick oven they require to be well baked a yorkshire giblet pie when the blood is warm put in a teacupful of groats to swell grate the crumb of a penny loaf and pour a gill of boiling milk on them shred half a pound of beef suet very fine chop two leeks and four or five leaves of sage small three yolks of eggs pepper salt and nutmeg to your palate mix them all up together have ready the giblets seasoned very well with pepper and salt and lay them round a deep dish then put a pound of fat beef over the pudding in the middle of the dish pour in half a pint of gravy lay on a good paste and bake it in a moderate oven a rook pie skin and draw six young rooks and cut out the backbones season them well with pepper and salt put them in a deep dish with a quarter of a pint of water lay over them half a pound of butter make a good puff paste and cover the dish lay a paper over for it requires a good deal of baking a sweet veal pie lay marrow or beef suet shred very fine in the bottom of your dish cut into steaks the best end of a neck of veal and lay them in strew over them some marrow or suet it makes them eat tenderer stone a quarter of a pound of jar raisins chop them a little wash half a pound of currants and put them over the steaks cut three ounces of candied citron and two ounces of candied orange and lay them on the top boil half a pint of sweet mountain or sack with a stick of cinnamon and pour it in lay a little light paste round the dish and then lid it an hour will bake it when it comes out of the oven put in a glass of french brandy or shrub and serve it up an olive pie cut a fillet of veal into thin slices rub them over with the yolks of eggs strew over them a few crumbs of bread shred a little lemon peel very fine and put it on them with a little grated nutmeg pepper and salt roll them up very tight and lay them in a pewter dish pour over them half a pint of good gravy made of bones put half a pound of butter over it and make a light paste and lay it round the dish roll the lid half an inch thick and lay it on make a beef olive pie the same way 
a savoury veal pie. Cut a loin of veal into steaks, season it with beaten mace, nutmeg, pepper and salt. Lay the meat in your dish with sweetbread seasoned with the meat and the yolks of six hard eggs, a pint of oysters and half a pint of good gravy. Lay round your dish a good puff paste half an inch thick and cover it with a lid the same thickness. Bake it in a quick oven an hour and a quarter. When you take it out of the oven, cut off the lid, then cut the lid in eight or ten pieces and stick it round the inside of the rim. Cover the meat with slices of lemon and serve it up. To make savoury patties. Take one pound of the inside of a cold loin of veal or the same quantity of cold fowl that have been either boiled or roasted, a quarter of a pound of beef suet. Chop them as small as possible with six or eight sprigs of parsley. Season them well with half a nutmeg grated fine, pepper and salt. Put them in a tossing pan with half a pint of veal gravy, thicken the gravy with a little flour and butter and two spoonfuls of cream and shake them over the fire two minutes and fill your patties. You must make your patties thus. Raise them of an oval form and bake them as for custards. Cut some long narrow bits of paste and bake them on a dusting box, but not to go round. They are for handles. Fill your patties when quite hot with the meat, then set your handles across the patties. They will look like baskets if you have nicely pinched the walls of the patties when you raise them. Five will be a dish. You may make them with sugar and currants instead of parsley. Fried Patties Cut half a pound of a leg of veal very small with six oysters. Put the liquor of the oysters to the crumb of a penny loaf. Mix them together with a little salt. Put it in a tossing pan with a quarter of a pound of butter and keep stirring it for three or four minutes over the fire. Then make a good puff paste, roll it out and cut it in little bits about the size of a crown piece, some round, square and three-cornered. Put a little of the meat upon them and lay a lid upon them. Turn up the edges as you would a pasty to keep the gravy in. Fry them in a panful of hog's lard. They are a pretty corner dish for dinner or supper. If you want them for garnish to a cod's head, put in only oysters. They are very pretty for a calf's head hash. Sweet Patties Take the meat of a boiled calf's foot, two large apples and one ounce of candied orange. Chop them very small, grate half a nutmeg, mix them with the yolk of an egg, a spoonful of French brandy and a quarter of a pound of currants, clean washed and dried. Make a good puff paste, roll it in different shapes, as the fried ones, and fill them the same way. You may either fry or bake them. They are a pretty side dish for supper. Common Patties Take the kidney part of a very fat loin of veal. Chop the kidney, veal and fat very small all together. Season it with mace, pepper and salt to your taste. Raise little patties the size of a teacup, fill them with your meat, put thin lids on them, bake them very crisp. Five is enough for a side dish. To make common fritters. Take half a pint of ale and two eggs. Beat in as much flour as will make it rather thicker than a common pudding, with nutmeg and sugar to your taste. Let it stand three or four minutes to rise, then drop them with a spoon into a pan of boiling lard, fry them a light brown, drain them on a sieve, serve them up with sugar grated over them, and wine sauce in a boat. To make apple fritters. Pare the largest baking apples you can get. Take out the core with an apple scraper, put them in round slices, and dip them in batter. Made as for common fritters. Fry them crisp, Serve them up with sugar grated over them, and wine sauce in a boat. They are proper for a side dish for supper. To make German puffs. Put half a pint of good milk into a tossing pan, and dredge in flour till it is thick as hasty pudding. 
keep stirring it over a slow fire till it is all of a lump then put it in a marble mortar when it is cold put to it the yolks of eight eggs four ounces of sugar a spoonful of rose water grater a little nutmeg and the rind of half a lemon beat them together an hour or more when it looks light and bright drop them into a pan of boiling lard with a teaspoon the size of a large nutmeg they will rise and look like a large yellow plum if they are well beat as you fry them lay them on a sieve to drain grate a sugar round your dish and serve them up with sack for sauce it is a proper corner dish for dinner or supper to make gophers beat three eggs well with three spoonful of flour and a little salt then mix them with a pint of milk and an ounce of sugar half a nutmeg grated beat them well together then make your gopher tongs hot rub them with fresh butter fill the bottom part of your tongs and clap the top upon then turn them and when a fine brown on both sides put them in a dish and pour white wine sauce over them five is enough for a dish don't lay them one upon the other it will make them soft you may put in currants if you please to make wafer pancakes beat four eggs well with two spoonfuls of fine flour and two of cream one ounce of loaf sugar beat and sifted half a nutmeg grated put a little cold butter in a clean cloth and rub your pan well with it pour in your batter and make it as thin as a wafer fry it only on one side Put them on a dish and grate a sugar betwixt every pancake and send them hot to the table to make cream pancakes take the yolks of two eggs mix them with half a pint of good cream two ounces of sugar rub your pan with lard and fry them as thin as possible grate a sugar over them and serve them up hot to make clary pancakes beat three eggs with three spoonfuls of fine flour and a little salt exceeding well mix them with a pint of milk and put lard into your pan when it is hot pour in your batter as thin as possible then lay in your clary leaves and pour a little more batter thin over them fry them a fine brown and serve them up to make batter pancakes beat three eggs with a pound of flour very well put to it a pint of milk and a little salt fry them in lard or butter grate sugar over them cut them in quarters and serve them up end of chapter five Chapter six of the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on Puddings Bread and custard puddings require time and a moderate oven that will raise and not burn them. Batter and rice puddings a quick oven, and always butter the pan or dish before you pour the pudding in. When you boil a pudding, Take great care your cloth is very clean, dip it in boiling water and flour it well, and give your cloth a shake. If you boil it in a basin, butter it, and boil it in plenty of water, and turn it often, and don't cover the pan. When enough, take it up into a basin, let it stand a few minutes to cool, then untie the string, wrap the cloth round the basin, lay your dish over it, and turn the pudding out and take the basin and cloth off very carefully, for often a light pudding is broken in turning out. A hunting pudding. Beat eight eggs and mix them with a pint of good cream and a pound of flour. Beat them well together and put to them a pound of beef suet chopped very fine, a pound of currants well cleaned, half a pound of jar raisins stoned and chopped small, a quarter of a pound of powder sugar, two ounces of candied citron the same of candied orange cut small grate a large nutmeg 
and mix all well together with half a gill of brandy. Put it in a cloth and tie it up close. It will take four hours boiling. A boiled custard pudding. Boil a stick or two of cinnamon in a quart of thin cream with a quarter of a pound of sugar. When it is cold, put in the yolks of six eggs well beat and mix them together. Set it over a slow fire and stir it round one way till it grows pretty thick, but don't let it boil. Take it off and let it stand till it be quite cold. Butter a cloth very well and dredge it with flour. Put in your custard and tie it up very close. It will take three quarters of an hour boiling. When you take it up, put it in a round basin to cool a little, then untie the cloth and lay the dish on the bowl and turn it upside down. Be careful how you take off the cloth, for a very little will break the pudding. Grate over it a little sugar. For sauce, white wine thickened with flour and butter, put in the dish. A lemon pudding. Blanch and beat eight ounces of Jordan almonds with orange flower water. Add to them half a pound of cold butter, the yolks of ten eggs, the juice of a large lemon, half the rind grated fine. Work them in a marble mortar or wooden basin till they look white and light. Lay a good puff paste pretty thin in the bottom of a china dish and pour in your pudding. It will take half an hour baking. A ground rice pudding. Boil four ounces of ground rice in water till it is soft. Then beat the yolks of four eggs and put to them a pint of cream, four ounces of sugar and a quarter of a pound of butter. Mix them all well together. You may either boil or bake it. An orange pudding. Boil the rind of a Seville orange very soft. Beat it in a marble mortar with the juice. Put to it two Naples biscuits, grated very fine, half a pound of butter, a quarter of a pound of sugar, and the yolks of six eggs. Mix them well together. Lay a good puff paste round the edge of your china dish. Bake it in a gentle oven half an hour. You may make a lemon pudding the same way by putting in a lemon instead of the orange. Calf's foot pudding. Boil a gang of calf's feet. Take the meat from the bones and chop it exceeding fine. Put to it the crumb of a penny loaf, a pound of beef suet shred very small, half a pint of cream, eight eggs, a pound of currants well cleansed, four ounces of citron cut small, two ounces of candied orange cut like straws, a large nutmeg grated and a large glass of brandy. Mix them all very well together. Butter your cloth and dust it with flour. Take it close up. Boil it three hours. When you take the pudding up, it is best to put it in a bowl that will just hold it and let it stand a quarter of an hour. Before you turn it out, lay your dish upon the top of the basin and turn it upside down. A boiled rice pudding. Boil a quarter of a pound of rice in water till it be soft and put it in a hair sieve to drain. Beat it in a marble mortar with the yolks of five eggs, a quarter of a pound of butter, the same of sugar. Grater a small nutmeg and the rind of half a lemon. Work them well together for half an hour, then put in half a pound of currants, well washed and cleaned. Mix them well together. Butter your cloth and tie it up. Boil it an hour and serve it up with white wine sauce. Bread pudding. Take the crumb of a penny loaf and pour on them a pint of good milk boiling hot. When it is cold, beat it very fine with two ounces of butter and sugar to your palate. Grate a half a nutmeg in it. Beat it up with four eggs and put them in and beat all together near half an hour. Tie it in a cloth and boil it an hour. You may put in half a pound of currants for change and pour over it white wine sauce. To make a sippet pudding. Cut a penny loaf as thin as possible. Put a layer of bread in the bottom of a pewter dish. 
then strew over it a layer of marrow or beef suet, a handful of currants, then lay a layer of bread, and so on till you fill your dish. As the first lay, let the marrow or suet and currants be at the top. Beat four eggs, and mix them with a quart of cream, a quarter of a pound of sugar, and a large nutmeg grated. Pour it on your dish, and bake it in a moderate oven. When it comes out of the oven, pour over it wine sauce. An apricot pudding. Take twelve large apricots, pare them, and give them a scald in water, till they are soft. Then take out the stones, grate the crumb of a penny loaf, and pour on it a pint of cream boiling hot. Let it stand till half cold, then add a quarter of a pound of sugar, and the yolks of four eggs. Mix all together with a glass of Madeira wine. Pour it in a dish with thin puff paste round. Bake it half an hour in a moderate oven. A transparent pudding. Beat eight eggs very well, and put them in a pan with half a pound of butter and the same weight of loaf sugar beat fine, a little grated nutmeg. Set it on the fire, and keep stirring till it thickens like buttered eggs. Then put it in a basin to cool. Roll a rich puff paste very thin, Lay it round the edge of a china dish, then pour in the pudding, and bake it in a moderate oven half an hour. It will cut light and clear. It is a pretty pudding for a corner, for dinner, and a middle for supper. A vermicelli pudding. Boil four ounces of vermicelli in a pint of new milk till it is soft, with a stick or two of cinnamon. Then put in half a pint of thick cream a quarter of a pound of butter, a quarter of a pound of sugar, and the yolks of four beaten eggs. Bake it in an earthen dish without a paste. A red sago pudding. Take two ounces of sago, boil it in water with a stick of cinnamon till it be quite soft and thick. Let it stand till quite cold. In the meantime, grate the crumb of a halfpenny loaf, and pour over it a large glass of red wine. Chop four ounces of marrow and half a pound of sugar, and the yolks of four beaten eggs. Beat them all together for a quarter of an hour. Lay a puff paste round your dish, and send it to the oven. When it comes back, stick it over with blanched almonds, cut the long way, and bits of citron, cut the same. Send it to table. A boiled tansy pudding. Grate four Naples biscuits. Put as much cream boiling hot as will wet them. Beat the yolks of four eggs. Have ready a few chopped tansy leaves with as much spinach as will make it a pretty green. Be careful you don't put too much tansy in. It will make it bitter. Mix all together when the cream is cold with a little sugar and set it over a slow fire till it grows thick. Then take it off, and when cold, put it in a cloth, well buttered and floured. Tie it up close, and let it boil three quarters of an hour. Take it up in a basin, and let it stand one quarter. Then turn it carefully out, and put white wine sauce round it. A tansy pudding with almonds. Blanch four ounces of almonds, and beat them very fine with rose water. Slice a French roll very thin, pour on a pint of cream boiling hot. Beat four eggs very well, and mix with the eggs when beaten, a little sugar and grated nutmeg, a glass of brandy, a little juice of tansy, and the juice of spinach to make it green. Put all the ingredients into a stew pan with a quarter of a pound of butter, and give it a gentle boil. You may either boil it or bake it in a dish either with a crust or writing paper. A tansy pudding of ground rice. Boil six ounces of ground rice in a quart of good milk till it is soft. Then put in half a pound of butter with six eggs very well beat and sugar and rose water to make it palatable. Beat some spinach in a mortar with a few leaves of tansy. Squeeze out the juice through a cloth and put it in Mix all well together, 
cover your dish with writing paper, well buttered, and pour it in. Three quarters of an hour will bake it. When you dish it up, stick it all over with a Seville or sweet orange in half quarters. A Sago Pudding Another Way Boil two ounces of sago till it is quite thick in milk. Beat six eggs, leaving out three of the whites. Put to it half a pint of cream and two spoonfuls of sack, nutmeg and sugar to your taste. Put a paste round your dish. Little Citron Puddings Take half a pint of cream, one spoonful of fine flour, two ounces of sugar, a little nutmeg. Mix them all well together with the yolks of three eggs. Put it in teacups and stick in it two ounces of citron cut very thin. Bake them in a pretty quick oven and turn them out upon a china dish. Five is enough for a side dish. A baked tansy pudding. Grate the crumb of a penny loaf. Pour on them a pint of boiling milk with a quarter of a pound of butter in it. Let it stand till almost cold. Then beat five eggs and put them in with a quarter of a pound of sugar, a large nutmeg grated and a glass of brandy. Stir them about and put them in a tossing pan with as much juice of spinach as will green it and a little tansy chopped small. Stir it about over a slow fire till it grows thick. Butter a sheet of writing paper and lay it in the bottom of a pewter dish. Pin the corners of the paper to make it stand one inch above the dish to keep the pudding from spreading and let it stand three quarters of an hour in the oven. When baked, put the dish over it you send it up in and turn it out upon it. Take off the paper, stick it round with a Seville orange cut in half quarters. Stick one quarter in the middle and serve it up with wine sauce. It will look as green as if it had not been baked when turned out. A green codling pudding. Green a quart of codlins as for a pie. Rub them through a hair sieve with the back of a wooden spoon and as much of the juice of beets as will green your pudding. Put in the crumb of half a penny loaf, half a pound of butter and three eggs well beaten. Beat them all together with half a pound of sugar and two spoonfuls of cider. Lay a good paste round the rim of the dish and pour it in. Half an hour will bake it. To make a common rice pudding. Wash half a pound of rice. Put to it three pints of good milk. Mix it well with a quarter of a pound of butter, a stick or two of cinnamon beaten fine, half a nutmeg grated, one egg well beat, a little salt and sugar to your taste. One hour and a half will bake it in a quick oven. When it comes out, take off the top and put the pudding in breakfast cups. Turn them into a hot dish like little puddings and serve it up. A marrow pudding. Pour on the crumb of a penny loaf, a pint of cream boiling hot, Cut a pound of beef marrow very thin, beat four eggs very well, then add a glass of brandy with sugar and nutmeg to your taste and mix them all well up together. You may either boil or bake it. Three quarters of an hour will do it. Cut two ounces of citron very thin and stick them all over it when you dish it up. Marrow pudding a second way. Half boil four ounces of rice. Shred half a pound of marrow very fine. Stone a quarter of a pound of raisins. Chop them very small with two ounces of currants well cleaned. Beat four eggs a quarter of an hour. Mix it all together with a pint of good cream, a spoonful of brandy, sugar and nutmeg to your taste. You may either bake it or put it in hog skins. Marrow pudding a third way. Blanch half a pound of almonds, put them in cold water all night. The next day beat them in a marble mortar very fine with orange flour or rose water. Take the crumb of a penny loaf and pour on them a pint of boiling cream whilst the cream is cooling. Beat the yolks of four eggs and two whites a quarter of an hour. Add a little sugar 
and grate nutmeg to your palate. Have ready shred the marrow of two bones, and mix them all well together with a little candied orange cut small. This is usually made to fill in skins, but is a good baked pudding. If you put it in skins, don't fill them too full, for it will swell, but boil them gently. White Puddings in Skins Wash half a pound of rice in warm water, boil it in milk till it is soft, put it in a sieve to drain. Blanch and beat half a pound of Jordan almonds very fine, with rose water. Wash and dry a pound of currants, then cut in small bits a pound of hog's lard. Take six eggs and beat them well, half a pound of sugar, a large nutmeg grated, a stick of cinnamon, a little mace and a little salt. Mix them very well together. Fill your skins and boil them. To make a quaking pudding. Boil a quart of cream and let it stand till almost cold. Then beat four eggs a full quarter of an hour with a spoonful and a half of flour. Then mix them with your cream. Add sugar and nutmeg to your palate. Tie it close up in a cloth well buttered and let it boil an hour and turn it carefully out. To make Yorkshire pudding to bake under meat. Beat four eggs with four large spoonfuls of fine flour and a little salt. For a quarter of an hour, put to them one quart and a half of milk, mix them well together, then butter a dripping pan, then set it under beef mutton or a loin of veal when roasting, and when it is brown, cut it in square pieces, and turn it over when well browned on the underside. Send it to table on a dish. You may mix a boiled pudding the same way. A boiled milk pudding. Pour a pint of new milk boiling hot on three spoonfuls of fine flour. Beat the flour and milk for half an hour, then put in three eggs and beat it a little longer. Grate in half a teaspoonful of ginger. Dip the cloth in boiling water, butter it well and flour it. Put in the pudding and tie it close up and boil it an hour. It requires great care when you turn it out. Pour over it thick melted butter. Herb Pudding Of spinach, beets, parsley and leeks, take each a handful. Wash them and give them a scald in boiling water, then shred them very fine. Have ready a quart of groats, steeped in warm water half an hour, and a pound of hog's lard cut in little bits, three large onions chopped small, and three sage leaves hacked fine. Put in a little salt, mix all well together, and tie it close up. It will require to be taken up in boiling to slacken the string a little. Gooseberry Pudding Scull half a pint of green gooseberries in water till they are soft. Put them into a sieve to drain. When cold, work them through a hair sieve with the back of a clean wooden spoon. Add to them half a pound of sugar and the same of butter, four ounces of Naples biscuits. Beat six eggs very well and then mix all together and beat them a quarter of an hour. Pour it in an earthen dish without a paste. Half an hour will bake it. To make raspberry dumplings. Make a good cold paste. Roll it a quarter of an inch thick and spread over it raspberry jam to your own liking. Roll it up and boil it in a cloth one hour at least. Take it up and cut it in five slices and lay one in the middle and the other four round it. Pour a little good melted butter in the dish and grate fine sugar round the edge of the dish. It is proper for a corner or side for dinner. To make damson dumplings. Make a good hot paste crust. Roll it pretty thin. Lay it in a basin, and put in what quantity of damsons you think proper. Wet the edge of the paste, and close it up. Boil it in a cloth one hour, and send it up whole. Pour over it melted butter and grate sugar round the edge of the dish. Note, you make any kind of preserved fruit the same way. To make apple dumplings. 
pare your apples, take out the core with an apple scraper, fill the whole with quince or orange marmalade or sugar, which suits you. Then take a piece of cold paste and make a hole in it, as if you was going to make a pie. Lay in your apple and put another piece of paste in the same form and close it up round the side of your apple. It is much better than gathering it in a lump at one end. Tie it in a cloth and boil it three quarters of an hour. Pour melted butter over them and serve them up. Five is enough for a dish. To make a sparrow dumpling. Mix half a pint of good milk with three eggs, a little salt and as much flour as will make it a thick batter. Put a lump of butter rolled in pepper and salt in every sparrow. Mix them in the batter and tie them in a cloth. Boil them one hour and a half. Pour melted butter over them and serve it up. To make a balm dumpling. Take a pound of flour, mix a spoonful of balm in it with a little salt and make it into a light paste with warm water. Let it lie one hour, then make it up into round balls and tie them up in little nets and put them in a pan of boiling water. Don't cover them. It will make them sad. Nor don't let them boil so fast as to let the water boil over them. Turn them when they have been in six or seven minutes, and they will rise through the nets and look like diamonds. Twenty minutes will boil them. Serve them up and pour sweet sauce over them. To make clary fritters. Beat two eggs exceeding well with one spoonful of cream one of ratafia water, one ounce of loaf sugar, and two spoonfuls of flour. Grate in half a nutmeg. Have ready washed and dried clary leaves. Dip them in the batter and fry them a nice brown. Serve them up with quarters of Seville oranges laid round them and good melted butter in a boat. To make raspberry fritters. Grate two Naples biscuits. Pour over them half a gill of boiling cream. When it is almost cold, beat the yolks of four eggs to a strong froth. Beat the biscuits a little, then beat both together exceeding well. Put to it two ounces of sugar and as much juice of raspberry as will make it a pretty pink colour and give it a proper sharpness. Drop them into a pan of boiling lard the size of a walnut. When you dish them up, Stick bits of citron in some, and blanched almonds cut lengthways in others. Lay round them green and yellow sweetmeats, and serve them up. They are a pretty corner dish for either dinner or supper. To make a tansy fritter. Take the crumb of a penny loaf. Pour on them half a pint of boiling milk. Let it stand an hour, then put in as much juice of tansy as will give it a flavour but not to make it bitter. Then make it a pretty green with the juice of spinach. Put to it a spoonful of ratafia water or brandy. Sweeten it to your taste. Grate the rind of half a lemon. Beat the yolks of four eggs. Mix them all together. Put them in a tossing pan with four ounces of butter. Stir it over a slow fire till it is quite thick. Take it off and let it stand two or three hours, then drop them into a pan full of boiling lard. A spoonful is enough for a fritter. Serve them up with slices of orange round them, grate sugar over them, and wine sauce in a boat. To make plum fritters with rice. Grate the crumbs of a penny loaf, pour over them a pint of boiling cream or good milk, let them stand four or five hours, then beat it exceeding fine. Put to it the yolks of five eggs, four ounces of sugar, and a nutmeg grated. Beat them well together, and fry them in hog's lard. Drain them on a sieve, and serve them up with white wine sauce under them. N.B. You may put currants in if you please. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on making decorations for a table. When you spin a silver web or a dessert, always take particular care. Your fire is clear, and a pan of water upon the fire to keep the heat from your face and stomach, for fear the heat should make you faint. You must not spin it before a kitchen fire, for the smaller the grate is, so that the fire be clear and hot, the better able you will be to sit a long time before it. For if you spin a whole dessert, you will be several hours in spinning it. Be sure to have a tin box, to put every basket in as you spin them, and cover them from the air, and keep them warm, until you have done the whole as your receipt directs you. If you spin a gold web, take care your chafing dish is burnt clear, before you set it upon the table where your mould is. Set your ladle on the fire, and keep stirring it with a wood skewer till it just boils. Then let it cool a little, for it will not spin when it is boiling hot, and if it grows cold it is equally as bad. But as it cools on the sides of your ladle, dip the point of your knife in, and begin to spin round your mould as long as it will draw, then heat it again. The only art is to keep it of a proper heat, and it will draw out like a fine thread, and of a gold colour. It is a great fault to put in too much sugar at a time, for often heating takes the moisture out of the sugar, and burns it. Therefore the best way is to put in a little at a time, and clean out your ladle. When you make a hen or bird, next, let part of your jelly be set in your bowl, before you put on your flummery, or straw, for if your jelly is warm, they will settle to the bottom, and mix together. If it be a fish pond, or a transparent pudding, put in your jelly at three different times, to make your fish or fruit keep at a proper distance, one from another. And be sure your jelly is very clear and stiff, or it will not show the figures, nor keep whole. When you turn them out, dip your basin in warm water, as your receipt directs, then turn your dish or salver upon the top of your basin, and turn your basin upside down. When you make flummery, always observe to have it pretty thick, and your moulds wet in cold water, before you put in your flummery, or your jelly will settle to the bottom, and the cream swim at the top, so that it will look to be two different colours. If you make custards, do not let them boil after the yolks are in, but stir them all one way, and keep them of a good heat till they be thick enough, and the rawness of the eggs is gone off. When you make whips or syllabubs, raise your froth with a chocolate mill, and lay it upon a sieve to drain. It will be much prettier, and will lie upon your glasses, without mixing with your wine, or running down the sides of your glasses. And when you have made any of the before-mentioned things, keep them in a cool, airy place, for a close place will give them a bad taste, and soon spoil. To spin a silver web for covering sweetmeats. Take a quarter of a pound of treble refined sugar, in one lump, and set it before a moderate fire, on the middle of a silver salver or pewter plate. Set it a little aslant, and when it begins to run like clear water to the edge of the plate or salver, have ready a tin cover or china bowl set on a stool, with the mouth downward, close to your sugar, that it may not cool by carrying too far. Then take a clean knife, and take up as much of the syrup as the point will hold, and a fine thread will come from the point, which you must draw as quick as possible backwards and forwards, and also around the mould, as long as it will spin from the knife. Be very careful you do not drop the syrup on the web. If you do, it will spoil it. Then dip your knife into the syrup again, and take up more. And so keep spinning till your sugar is done, or your web is thick enough. Be sure you do not let the knife touch the lump on the plate that is not melted. It will make it brittle, and not spin at all. If your sugar is spent before your web is done, Put fresh sugar on a clean plate or salver, and not spin from the same plate again. If you don't want the web to cover the sweetmeats immediately, set it in a deep pewter dish, and cover it with a tin cover, and lay a cloth over it, to prevent the air from getting to it, 
and set it before the fire. It requires to be kept warm, or it will fall. When your dinner or supper is dished, have ready a plate or dish of the size of your web, filled with different coloured sweetmeats, and set your web over it. It is pretty for a middle where the dishes are few, or corner where the number is large. To spin a gold web for covering sweetmeats. Beat four ounces of treble refined sugar in a marble mortar, and sift it through a hair sieve, and then put it in a silver or brass ladle, but silver makes the colour better. Set it over a chafing dish of charcoal that is burnt clear, and set it on a table, and turn a tin cover or china bowl upside down upon the same table. And when your sugar is melted, it will be of a gold colour. Take your ladle off the fire, and begin to spin it with a knife, the same way as the silver web. When the sugar begins to cool and set, put it over the fire to warm, and spin it as before, but don't warm it too often. It will turn the sugar a bad colour. If you have not enough of sugar, clean the ladle before you put in more, and spin it till your web is thick enough. Then take it off and set it over the sweetmeats, as you did the silver web. To make a dessert of spun sugar. Spin two large webs, and turn one upon the other to form a globe, and put in the inside of them a few sprigs of small flowers and myrtle, and spin a little more round to bind them together, and set them covered close up before the fire. Then spin two more on a lesser bowl, and put in a sprig of myrtle, and a few small flowers, and bind them as before. Set them by, and spin two more less than the last, and put in a few flowers, bind them, and set them by. Then spin twelve couple on teacups of three different sizes, in proportion to the globes, to represent baskets, and bind them two and two as the globes with spun sugar. Set the globes on a silver salver, one upon another, the largest at the bottom, and the smallest at the top. When you have fixed the globes, run two small wires through the middle of the largest globes, across each other. Then take a large darning needle and silk, and run it through the middle of the largest baskets. Cross it at the bottom, and bring it up to the top, and make a loop to hang them on the wire, and do so with the rest of your baskets. Hang the largest baskets on the wires, then put two more wires a little shorter across, through the middle of the second globes, and put the ends of the wires out betwixt the baskets, and hang on the four middle ones. Then run two more wires shorter than the last through the middle of the top globe, and hang the baskets over the lowest. Stick a sprig of myrtle on the top of your globes, and set it on the middle of the table. Observe you don't put too much sugar down at a time for a silver web, because the sugar will lose its moisture, and run in lumps instead of drawing out. Nor too much in the ladle, for the gold web will lose its colour by heating too oft. You may make the baskets a silver, and the globes a gold colour, if you choose them. It is a pretty dessert for a grand table. To make calf's foot jelly. Put a gang of calf's feet well cleaned into a pan, with six quarts of water, and let them boil gently till reduced to two quarts. Then take out the feet, scum off the fat clean, and clear your jelly from the sediment. Beat the whites of five eggs to a froth, then add one pint of Lisbon, Madeira, or any pale made wine. If you choose it, then squeeze in the juice of three lemons. When your stock is boiling, take three spoonfuls of it, and keep stirring it with your wine and eggs, to keep it from curdling. Then add a little more stock, and still keep stirring it, and then put it in the pan, and sweeten it with loaf sugar to your taste. A glass of French brandy will keep the jelly from turning blue in frosty air. Put in the outer rind of two lemons, and let it boil one minute altogether, and pour it into a flannel bag, and let it run into a basin, and keep pouring it back gently into the bag, till it runs clear and bright. Then set your glasses under the bag, and cover it lest dust gets in. 
if you would have the jelly for a fish pond, transparent pudding or hen's nest, to be turned out of the mould, boil half a pound of icing glass in a pint of water till reduced to one quarter, and put it into the stock before it's refined. To make flummery. Put one ounce of bitter and one of sweet almonds into a basin. Pour over them some boiling water to make the skins come off, which is called blanching. Strip off the skins and throw the kernels into cold water. Then take them out and beat them in a marble mortar with a little rose water to keep them from oiling. When they are beat, put them into a pint of calf's foot stock, set it over the fire and sweeten it to your taste with loaf sugar. As soon as it boils, strain it through a piece of muslin or gauze. When a little cold, put it into a pint of thick cream and keep stirring it often till it grows thick and cold. Wet your moulds with cold water and pour in the flummery. Let it stand five or six hours at least before you turn them out. If you make the flummery stiff and wet the moulds, it will turn out without putting it into warm water, for water takes off the figures of the mould and makes the flummery look dull. NB. Be careful you keep stirring it till cold, or it will run into lumps when you turn it out of the mould. To make colouring for flummery and jellies. Take two pennyworth of cochineal, bruise it with the blade of a knife, and put it into half a teacupful of best French brandy, and let it stand a quarter of an hour, and filter it through a fine cloth, and put in as much as will make the jelly or flummery a fine pink. If yellow, take a little saffron and tie it in a rag, dissolve it in cold water. If green, take some spinach, boil it, take off the froth, and mix it with the jelly. If white, put in some cream. To make a fish pond. Fill four large fish moulds with flummery and six small ones. Take a china bowl and put in half a pint of stiff clear calf's foot jelly. Let it stand till cold, then lay two of the small fishes on the jelly, the right side down. Put in half a pint more jelly, let it stand till cold. Then lay in the four small fishes across one another, that when you turn the bowl upside down, the heads and tails may be seen. Then almost fill your bowl with jelly, and let it stand till cold. Then lay in the jelly four large fishes, and fill the basin quite full with jelly, and let it stand till the next day. When you want to chafe it, set your bowl to the brim in hot water for one minute. Take care that you don't let the water go into the basin. Lay your plate on the top of the basin and turn it upside down. If you want it for the middle, turn it out upon a salver. Be sure you make your jelly very stiff and clear. When you want to use it, set your bowl to the brim in hot water for one minute. To make a hen's nest. Take three or five of the smallest pullet eggs you can get. Fill them with flummery, and when they are stiff and cold, peel off the shells. Pare off the rinds of two lemons very thin, and boil them in sugar and water to take off the bitterness. When they are cold, cut them in long shreds to imitate straw, then fill a basin one-third full of stiff calf's foot jelly, and let it stand till cold. Then lay in the shreds of the lemons, in a ring, about two inches high in the middle of your basin. Strew a few corns of sago to look like barley, fill the basin to the height of the peel, and let it stand till cold. Then lay your eggs of flummery in the middle of the ring, that the straw may be seen around. Fill the basin quite full of jelly, and let it stand, and turn it out the same way of the fish pond. To make blamange of icing glass. Boil one ounce of icing glass in a quart of water, till it's reduced to a pint. Then put in the whites of four eggs, with two spoonfuls of rice water, to keep the eggs from poaching, and sugar to your taste, and run it through a jelly bag, then put to it two ounces of sweet, and one ounce of bitter almonds. Give them a scald in your jelly, and put them through a hair sieve. Put it in a china bowl. 
the next day turn it out and stick it all over with almonds blanched and cut lengthway garnish with green leaves or flowers green blancmange of icing glass dissolve your icing glass and put to it two ounces of sweet and two ounces of bitter almonds with as much juice of spinach as will make it green and a spoonful of french brandy set it over a stove fire till it be almost ready to boil then strain it through a gauze sieve when it grows thick put it into a melon mould and the next day turn it out garnish it with red and white flowers clear blancmange take a quart of strong calf's foot jelly skim off the fat and strain it beat the whites of four eggs and put them to your jelly set it over the fire and keep stirring it till it boils then pour it into a jelly bag and run it through several times till it is clear beat one ounce of sweet almonds and one of bitter to a paste with a spoonful of rose water squeezed through a cloth then mix it with your jelly and three spoonfuls of very good cream set it over the fire again and keep stirring it till it is almost boiling then pour it into a bowl and stir it very often till it is almost cold then wet your moulds and fill them yellow flummery take two ounces of icing glass beat it and open it put it into a bowl and pour a pint of boiling water upon it cover it up till almost cold then add a pint of white wine the juice of two lemons with the rind of one the yolks of eight eggs beat well sweeten it to your taste put it in a tossing pan and keep stirring it when it boils strain it through a fine sieve when almost cold put it into cups or moulds a good green lay an ounce of gambouge in a quarter of a pint of water put an ounce and a half of good stone blue in a little water when they are both dissolved mix them together add a quarter of a pint more water and a quarter of a pound of fine sugar boil it a little then put it in a galley pot cover it close and it will keep for years be careful not to make it too deep a green for a very little will do at a time fruit in jelly pour half a pint of clear stiff calf's foot jelly into a basin when it is set and stiff lay in three fine ripe peaches and a bunch of grapes with the stalks up put a few vine leaves over them then fill up your bowl with jelly and let it stand till the next day then set your basin to the brim in hot water and as soon as you find it leaves the basin lay your dish over it and turn your jelly carefully upon it garnish with flowers green melon in flummery make a little stiff flummery with a good deal of bitter almonds in it add to it as much juice of spinach as will make it a fine pale green when it is as thick as good cream wet your melon mould and put it in then put a pint of clear calf's foot jelly into a large basin and let them stand till the next day then turn out your melon and lay it on the right side down in the middle of your basin of jelly then fill up your basin with jelly that is beginning to set let it stand all night and turn it out the same way as the fruit in jelly make a garland of flowers and put it in your jelly it is a pretty dish for middle at supper or corner for a second course at dinner gilded fish in jelly make a little clear blancmange as is directed in the receipt then fill two large fish moulds with it and when it is cold turn it out and gild them with gold leaf or strew them over with gold and silver bian mixed then lay them on a soup dish and fill it with clear thin calf's foot jelly it must be so thin as they will swim in it if you have no jelly lisbon wine or any kind of pale made wines will do hens and chickens in jelly make some flummery with a deal of sweet almonds in it colour a little of it brown with chocolate and put it in a mould the shape of a hen then colour some more flummery with the yolk of a hard egg beat as fine as possible leave part of your flummery white 
then fill the moulds of seven chickens, three with white flummery, and three with yellow, and one the colour of the hen. When they are cold, turn them into a deep dish, put under and round them lemon peel, boil tender, and cut like straw. Then put a little clear calf's foot jelly under them, to keep them in their places, and let it stand till it is stiff. Then fill up your dish with more jelly. They are a pretty decoration for a grand table. To make a transparent pudding. Make your calf's foot jelly very stiff, and when it is quite fine, put a jill into a china basin. Let it stand till it is quite set. Blanch a few Jordan almonds, cut them, and a few jar raisins lengthways. Cut a little citron and candied lemon in little thin slices. Stick them all over the jelly, and throw in a few currants. Then pour more jelly on till it is an inch higher. When your jelly is set, stick in your almonds, raisins, citron, and candied lemon, with a few currants strewed in. Then more jelly as before. Then more almonds, raisins, citron, and lemons in layers, till your basin is full. Let it stand all night, and turn it out the same way as the fish pond. To make a desert island. Take a lump of paste, and form it into a rock three inches broad at the top. Colour it and set it in the middle of a deep china dish, and set a cast figure on it, with a crown on its head, and a knot of rock candy at the feet. Then make a roll of paste an inch thick, and stick it on the inner edge of the dish, two parts round, and cut eight pieces of candied eringo root, about three inches long, and fix them upright to the roll of paste on the edge. Make gravel walks of shot comfits from the middle to the edge of the dish, and set small figures in them. Roll out some paste and cut it open like Chinese rails. Bake it and fix it on either side of one of the gravel walks with gum. Have ready a web of spun sugar, and set it on the pillars of eringo root, and cut part of the web off to form an entrance where the Chinese rails are. It is a pretty middle dish for a second course at a grand table or a wedding supper, only set two crowned figures on the mount instead of one. To make a floating island. Grate the yellow rind of a large lemon into a quart of cream. Put in a large glass of Madeira wine. Make it pretty sweet with loaf sugar. Mill it with a chocolate mill to a strong froth. Take it off as it rises and lay it upon a sieve to drain all night. Then take a deep glass dish, and lay in your froth, with an apples biscuit in the middle of it. Then beat the white of an egg to a strong froth, and roll a sprig of myrtle in it to imitate snow. Stick it in the naples biscuit, then lay all over your froth currant jelly. Cut in very thin slices. Pour over it very strong calf's foot jelly. When it grows thick, Lay it all over till it looks like a glass, and your dish is full to the brim. Let it stand till it is quite cold and stiff. Then lay on rock candied sweetmeats upon the top of your jelly, and sheep and swans to pick at the myrtle. Stick green sprigs in two or three places upon the top of your jelly, amongst your shapes. It looks very pretty in the middle of a table for supper. You must not put the shapes on the jelly till you are going to send it to the table. To make a floating island a second way. Take calf's foot jelly that is set. Break it a little, but not too much, for it will make it frothy, and prevent it from looking clear. Have ready a middle-sized turnip, and rub it over with gum water, or the white of an egg. Then strew it thick over with green shot comfits and stick in the top of it a sprig of myrtle, or any other pretty green sprig. Then put your broken jelly round it. Set sheep or swans upon your jelly, with either a green leaf, or a knot of apple paste under them, to keep the jelly from dissolving. There are sheep and swans made for that purpose. You may put in snakes, or any wild animals of the same sort. To make the rocky island. Make a little stiff flummery, and put it into five fish moulds. Wet them before you put it in. When it is stiff, turn it out, and gild them with gold leaf. Then take a deep china dish, 
fill it near half full of clear calf's foot jelly, and let it stand till it is set. Then lay on your fishes and a few slices of red currant jelly, cut very thin round them. Then rasp a small French roll, and rub it over with the white of an egg, and strew all over it silver bran and glitter mixed together. Stick a sprig of myrtle in it, and put it into the middle of your dish. Beat the white of an egg to a very high froth, then hang it on your sprig of myrtle like snow, and fill your dish to the brim with clear jelly. When you send it to table, put lambs and ducks upon your jelly, with either green leaves or moss under them, with their heads towards the myrtle. To make moonshine. Take the shapes of a half moon and five or seven stars. Wet them and fill them with flummery. Let them stand till they are cold, then turn them into a deep china dish, and pour lemon cream round them, made thus. Take a pint of spring water, put to it the juice of three lemons, and the yellow rind of one lemon, the whites of five eggs well beaten, and four ounces of loaf sugar. Then set it over a slow fire, and stir it one way, till it looks white and thick. If you let it boil, it will curdle. Then strain it through a hair sieve, and let it stand till it is cold. Beat the yolks of five eggs, mix them with your whites, set them over the fire, and keep stirring it till it is almost ready to boil. Then pour it into a basin. When it is cold, pour it among your moon and stars. Garnish with flowers. It is a proper dish for a second course, either for dinner or supper. To make moon and stars in jelly. Take a deep china dish, turn the mould of a half moon and seven stars, with the bottom side upward, in the dish. Lay a weight upon every mould to keep them down, then make some flummery and fill your dish with it. When it is cold and stiff, take your moulds carefully out and fill the vacancy with clear calf's foot jelly. You may colour your flummery with cochineal and chocolate to make it look like the sky, and your moon and stars will show more clear. Garnish with rock candy sweetmeats. It is a pretty corner dish, or a proper decoration for a grand table. To make eggs and bacon in flummery. Take a pint of stiff flummery, and make part of it a pretty pink colour, with the colouring for the flummery. Dip a potting pot in cold water, and pour in red flummery, the thickness of a crown piece. Then the same of white flummery, and another of red, and twice the thickness of white flummery at the top. One layer must be stiff and cold before you pour on another. Then take five teacups, and put a large spoonful of white flummery into each teacup, and let them stand all night. Then turn your flummery out of your potting pots. On the back of a plate, wet with cold water, cut your flummery into thin slices, and lay them on a china dish. Then turn your flummery out of the cups on the dish, and take a bit out of the top of every one and lay in half of a preserved apricot. It will confine the syrup from discolouring the flummery, and make it like the yolk of a poached egg. Garnish with flowers. It is a pretty corner dish for dinner, or side for supper. Solomon's Temple in Flummery Make a quart of stiff flummery. Divide it into three parts. Make one part a pretty pink colour, with a little cochineal bruised fine and steeped in French brandy. Scrape one ounce of chocolate very fine, dissolve it in a little strong coffee, and mix it with another part of your flummery. To make it a light stone colour, the last part must be white. Then wet your temple mould, and fix it in a pot to stand even. Then fill the top of the temple with red flummery to the steps, and the four points with white. Then fill it up with chocolate flummery, let it stand till the next day, then loosen it round with a pin, and shake it loose very gently. But don't dip your mould in warm water, it will take off the gloss and spoil the colour. When you turn it out, stick a small sprig or a flower stalk down from the top of every point. It will strengthen them and make it look pretty. Lay round it rock candy sweetmeats. It is proper for a corner dish for a large table. 
to make cribbage cards in flummery fill five square tins the size of a card with very stiff flummery when you turn them out have ready a little cochineal dissolved in brandy and strain it through a muslin rag then take a camel's hair pencil and make hearts and diamonds with your cochineal then rub a little chocolate with a little eating oil upon a marble slab till it is very fine and bright then make clubs and spades pour a little lisbon wine into the dish and send it up to make a dish of snow take twelve large apples put them in cold water and set them over a very slow fire and when they are soft put them upon a hair sieve take off the skin and put the pulp into a basin then beat the whites of twelve eggs to a very strong froth beat and sift half a pound of double refined sugar and strew it into the eggs beat the pulp of your apples to a strong froth then beat them all together till they are like a stiff snow then lay it upon a china dish and heap it up as high as you can and set round it green knots of paste in imitation of chinese rails stick a sprig of myrtle into the middle of the dish and serve it up it is a pretty corner dish for a large table to make black caps take six large apples and cut a slice of the blossom end put them in a tin and set them in a quick oven till they are brown then wet them with rose water and grate a little sugar over them and set them in the oven again till they look bright and very black then take them out and put them into a deep china dish or plate and pour round them thick cream custard or white wine and sugar to make green caps take codlins just before they are ripe green them as you would for preserving then rub them over with a little oiled butter grate double refined sugar over them and set them in the oven till they look bright and sparkle like frost then take them out and put them into a deep china dish make a very fine custard and pour it round them stick single flowers in every apple and serve them up it is a pretty corner dish for either dinner or supper to stew pears pare the largest stewing pears and stick clove in the blossom end then put them in a well tinned saucepan with a new pewter spoon in the middle fill it with hard water and set it over a slow fire for three or four hours till your pears are soft and the water reduced to a small quantity then put in as much loaf sugar as will make it a thick syrup and give the pears a boil in it then cut some lemon peel like straw and hang them about your pears and serve them up with the syrup in a deep dish to make lemon syllabubs to a pint of cream put a pound of double refined sugar the juice of seven lemons grate the rinds of two lemons into a pint of white wine and half a pint of sack then put them all into a deep pot and whisk them for half an hour put it into glasses the night before you want it it is better for standing two or three days but it will keep a week if required to make solid syllabubs take a quart of rich cream and put in a pint of white wine the juice of four lemons and sugar to your taste whip it up very well and take off the froth as it rises put it upon a hair sieve and let it stand till the next day in a cool place fill your glasses better than half full with the thin then put on the froth and heap it as high as you can the bottom will look clear and keep several days whip syllabubs take a pint of thin cream rub a lump of loaf sugar on the outside of a lemon and sweeten it to your taste then put in the juice of a lemon and a glass of madeira wine or french brandy mill it to a froth with a chocolate mill and take it off as it rises and lay it upon a hair sieve then fill one half of your posset glasses a little more than half full with white wine and the other half of your glasses a little more than half full of red wine then lay on your froth as high as you can but observe that it is well drained on your sieve or it will mix with your wine and spoil your syllabubs to make lemon syllabubs a second way put a pint of cream to a pint of white wine 
then rub a quarter of a pound of loaf sugar upon the outrind of two lemons till you have got out all the essence then put the sugar to the cream and squeeze in the juice of both lemons let it stand for two hours then mill them with a chocolate mill to raise the froth and take it off with a spoon as it rises or it will make it heavy lay it upon a hair sieve to drain then fill your glasses with the remainder and lay on the froth as high as you can let them stand all night and they will be clear at the bottom send them to the table upon a salver with jellies to make a syllabub under the cow put a bottle of strong beer and a pint of cider into a punch bowl grate in a small nutmeg and sweeten it to your taste then milk as much milk from the cow as will make a strong froth and the ale look clear let it stand an hour then strew over it a few currants well washed picked and plumped before the fire then send it to the table end of chapter 7「Observations upon preserving. When you make any kind of jelly, take care you don't let any of the seeds from the fruit fall into your jelly, nor squeeze it too near, for that will prevent your jelly from being so clear. Pound your sugar and let it dissolve in the syrup before you set it on the fire. It makes the scum rise well, and the jelly a better colour. It is a great fault to boil any kind of jellies too high. It makes them a dark colour. You must never keep green sweetmeats in the first syrup longer than the receipt directs, lest you spoil their colour. You must take the same care with the oranges and lemons. As to cherries and damsons and most sorts of stone fruit, put over them either mutton suet rendered, or a board to keep them down, or they will rise out of the syrup and spoil the whole jar, by giving them a sour, bad taste. Observe to keep all wet sweetmeats in a dry, cool place, for a wet, damp place will make them mould, and a hot place will dry up the virtue and make them candy. The best direction I can give is to dip writing paper in brandy and lay it close to your sweetmeats. Tie them well down with white paper, and two fold of thick cap paper to keep out the air, for nothing can be a greater fault than bad tying down and leaving the pots open. To make orange jelly. Take half a pound of hartshorn shavings and two quarts of spring water. Let it boil till it be reduced to a quart. Pour it clear off. Let it stand till it is cold. Then take half a pint of spring water and the rinds of three oranges pared very thin and the juice of six. Let them stand all night, strain them through a fine hair sieve, melt the jelly and pour the orange liquor to it. Sweeten it to your taste with double refined sugar. Put to it a blade or two of mace, four or five cloves, half a small nutmeg and the rind of a lemon. Beat the whites of five eggs to a froth mix it very well with your jelly set it over a clear fire boil it three or four minutes run it through your jelly bag several times till it is clear and when you pour it in your bag take great care you don't shake it to make hearts horn jelly put two quarts of water into a clean pan with half a pound of hearts horn shavings let it simmer till near one half is reduced strain it off then put in the peel of four oranges and two lemons pared very thin. Boil them five minutes. Put to it the juice of the before mentioned lemons and oranges with about ten ounces of double refined sugar. Beat the whites of six eggs to a froth. Mix them carefully with your jelly that you do not poach the eggs. Just let it boil up, then run it through a jelly bag till it is clear. To make red currant jelly. Gather your currants when they are dry and full ripe. Strip them off the stalks, put them in a large stew pot, tie a paper over them and let them stand an hour in a cool oven. Strain them through a cloth and to every quart of juice add a pound and a half of loaf sugar broken into small lumps. 
stir it gently over a clear fire till your sugar is melted skim it well let it boil pretty quick twenty minutes pour it hot into your pots if you let it stand it will break the jelly it will not set so well as when it is hot put brandy papers over them and keep them in a dry place for use m b you can make jelly of half red and half white currants the same way to make black currant jelly get your currants when they are ripe and dry pick them off the stalks and put them in a large stew pot to every ten quarts of currants put a quart of water tie a paper over them and set them in a cool oven for two hours then squeeze them through a very thin cloth to every quart of juice add a pound and a half of loaf sugar broken in small pieces stir it gently till the sugar is melted when it boils skim it well let it boil pretty quick for half an hour over a clear fire then pour it into pots put brandy papers over them and keep them for use to make a red raspberry jam gather your raspberries when they are ripe and dry pick them very carefully from the stalks and dead ones crush them in a bowl with a silver or wooden spoon pewter is apt to turn them a purple colour as soon as you have crushed them strew in their own weight of loaf sugar and half their weight of currant juice baked and strained as for jelly then set them over a clear slow fire boil them half an hour skim them well and keep stirring them all the time then put them into pots or glasses with brandy papers over them and keep them for use m b as soon as you have got your berries strew in your sugar don't let them stand long before you boil them and it will preserve their flavour to make a white raspberry jam get your raspberries dry and full ripe crush them fine and strew in their own weight of loaf sugar and half their weight of the juice of white currants boil them half an hour over a clear slow fire skim them well and put them into pots or glasses tie them down with brandy papers and keep them dry for use n b strew in your sugar as in the red raspberry jam to make red strawberry jam gather the scarlet strawberries very ripe bruise them very fine and put to them a little juice of strawberries beat and sift their weight in sugar strew it among them and put them in the preserving pan set them over a clear slow fire skim them and boil them twenty minutes then put them in pots or glasses for use to make green gooseberry jam take the green walnut gooseberries when they are full grown but not ripe cut them in two and pick out the seeds then put them in a pan of water green them as you do the gooseberries in imitation of hops and lay them on a sieve to drain then beat them in a marble mortar with their weight in sugar then take a quart of gooseberries boil them to mash in a quart of water then squeeze them and to every pint of liquor put a pound of fine loaf sugar boil and skim it then put in your green gooseberries boil them till they are very thick clear and a pretty green then put them in glasses for use to make black currant jam get your black currants when they are full ripe pick them clear from the stalks and bruise them in a bowl with a wooden mallet to every two pounds of currants put a pound and a half of loaf sugar beat fine put them into a preserving pan boil them full half an hour skim it and stir it all the time then put it in the pots and keep for use to preserve red currants in bunches stone your currants and tie six or seven bunches together with a thread to a piece of split deal about the length of your finger weigh the currants and put the weight of double refined sugar in your preserving pan with a little water and boil it till the sugar flies then put the currants in and just give them a boil up and cover them till next day then take them out and either dry them or put them in glasses with the syrup boiled up with a little of the juice of red currants put brandy paper over them and tie them close down with another paper and set them in a dry place to preserve white currants in bunches stone your currants and tie them in bunches as before and put them in the preserving pan with their weight of double refined sugar 
beat and sifted fine. Let them stand all night, then take some pippins, pare, core and boil them, but don't stir the apples. Only press them down with the back of your spoon. When the water is strong of the apple, add to it the juice of a lemon, strain it through a jelly bag till it runs quite clear. To every pint of your liquor, put a pound of double refined sugar, boil it up to a strong jelly, put it to your currants and boil them till they look clear. Cover them in the preserving pan with paper till they are almost cold, then put a bunch of currants in your glasses and fill it up with jelly. When they are cold, wet papers in brandy and lay over them. Tie another on and set them in a dry place. To preserve currants for tarts. Get your currants when they are dry and pick them. To every pound and a quarter of currants, put a pound of sugar into a preserving pan with as much juice of currants as will dissolve it. When it boils, skim it and put in your currants and boil them till they are clear. Put them into a jar, lay brandy paper over, tie them down and keep them in a dry place. To preserve cucumbers. Take small cucumbers and large ones that will cut into quarters, the greenest and most free from seeds you can get. Put them in a strong salt and water in a straight mouth jar with a cabbage leaf to keep them down. Tie a paper over them, set them in a warm place till they are yellow, wash them out and set them over the fire in fresh water with a little salt in and a fresh cabbage leaf over them. Cover the pan very close, but take care they don't boil. If they are not a fine green, change your water and it will help them and make them hot and cover them as before. When they are a good green, take them off the fire, let them stand till they are cold, then cut the large ones in quarters, take out the seeds and soft part, then put them in cold water and let them stand two days, but change the water twice each day to take out the salt. Take a pound of single refined sugar and half a pint of water, set it over the fire. When you have skimmed it clean, Put the rind of a lemon, one ounce of ginger, with the outside scraped off. When your syrup is pretty thick, take it off, and when it is cold, wipe the cucumbers dry and put them in. Boil the syrup once in two or three days, for three weeks, and strengthen the syrup if required, for the greatest danger of them spoiling is at first. The syrup is to be quite cold when you put it to your cucumbers. To preserve grapes in brandy. Take some close bunches of grapes, but not too ripe, either red or white. Put them into a jar with a quarter of a pound of sugar candy, and fill the jar with common brandy. Tie it close with a bladder, and set them in a dry place. Morello cherries are done the same way. To preserve Kentish or Golden Pippins. Boil the rind of an orange very tender, then lay it in water for two or three days. Take a quart of golden pippins, pare, core, quarter and boil them to a strong jelly and run it through a jelly bag. Then take twelve pippins, pare them and scrape out the cores. Put two pounds of loaf sugar into a stew pan with near a pint of water. When it boils, skim it and put in your pippins with the orange rind in thin slices. Let them boil fast till the sugar is very thick and will almost candy. Then put in a pint of the pippin jelly, boil them fast till the jelly is clear. Then squeeze in the juice of a lemon, give it one boil and put them into pots or glasses with the orange peel. To preserve green codlings that will keep all the year. Take codlings about the size of a walnut with the stalks and a leaf or two on. Put a handful of vine leaves into a brass pan of spring water, then a lay of codlings, then vine leaves. Do so till the pan is full. Cover it close that no steam can get out. Set it on a slow fire. When they are soft, take off the skins with a penknife and put them in the same water with the vine leaves. It must be quite cold or it will be apt to crack them. Put in a little roach alum and set them over a very slow fire until they are green, which will be in three or four hours. Then take them out and lay them on a sieve to drain. 
Make a good syrup and give them a gentle boil once a day for three days. Then put them in small jars. Put brandy paper over and keep them for use. To preserve green apricots. Gather your apricots before their stones are hard. Put them into a pan of hard water with plenty of vine leaves. Set them over a slow fire till they are quite yellow. Then take them out and rub them with a flannel and salt to take off the lint. Put them into the pan to the same water and leaves. Cover them close. Set them a great distance from the fire till they are a fine light green. Then take them carefully up. Pick all the bad coloured and broken ones out. Boil the best gently for two or three times in a thin syrup. Let them be quite cold every time. When they look plump and clear, make a syrup of double refined sugar, but not too thick. Give your apricots a gentle boil in it, then put them into pots or glasses. Dip papers in brandy, lay it over them, and keep them for use. Then take all the broken and bad coloured ones, and boil them in the first syrup for tarts. To preserve gooseberries green. Take green walnut gooseberries when they are full grown, and take out the seeds. Put them in cold water, cover them close with vine leaves, and set them over a slow fire. When they are hot, take them off, and let them stand, and when they are cold, set them on again till they are pretty green, then put them on a sieve to drain, and have ready a syrup made of a pound of double refined sugar, and half a pint of spring water. The syrup is to be cold when the gooseberries are put in, and boil them till they are clear. Then set them by for a day or two, then give them two or three scalds, and then put them into pots or glasses for use. To preserve green gooseberries in imitation of hops. Take the largest green walnut gooseberries you can get. Cut them at the stalk end in four quarters, leaving them whole at the blossom end. Then take out all the seeds and put five or six, one in another. Take a needle full of strong thread with a large knot at the end. Run the needle through the bunch of gooseberries and tie a knot to fasten them together. They resemble hops and put cold spring water in your pan, a large handful of vine leaves in the bottom, and three or four lays of gooseberries, with plenty of vine leaves between every lay, and over the top of your pan, cover it so that no steam can get out, and set them on a slow fire. When they are scalding hot, take them off and let them stand till they are cold, then set them on again till they are a good green, then take them off and let them stand till they are quite cold, then put them in a sieve to drain. Make a thin syrup to every pint of water. Put in a pound of common loaf sugar. Boil and skim it well. When it is about half cold, put in your gooseberries and let them stand till the next day. Then give them one boil a day for three days. Then make a syrup. To every pint of water put a pound of fine sugar, a slice of ginger and a little lemon peel cut lengthway, exceeding thin. Boil and skim it well. Give your gooseberries a boil in it. When they are cold, put them into glasses or pots. Lay papers dipped in brandy over them, tie them up, and keep them for use. To preserve sprigs green. Gather the sprigs of mustard when it is going to seed. Put them in a pan of spring water, with a great many vine leaves under and over them. Put to them one ounce of roach alum. Set it over a gentle fire. When it is hot, take it off and let it stand till it is quite cold. Then cover it very close, and hang it a great height over a slow fire. When they are green, take out the sprigs, and lay them on a sieve to drain. Then make a good syrup. Boil your sprigs in it once a day for three days. Put them in, and keep them for use. They are very pretty to stick in the middle of a preserved orange, or garnish a set of salvers. You may preserve young peas when they are just come into pod the same way. To preserve green gauge plums. Take the finest plums you can get just before they are ripe. Put them in a pan with a lay of vine leaves at the bottom of your pan, then a lay of plums. Do so till your pan is almost full, then fill it with water. Set them on a slow fire. 
When they are hot and their skins begin to rise, take them off and take the skins carefully off. Put them on a sieve as you do them, then lay them in the same water with a lay of leaves betwixt. As you did at the first, cover them very close so that no steam can get out and hang them a great distance from the fire till they are green, which will be five or six hours at least. Then take them carefully up, lay them on a hair sieve to drain, make a good syrup, give them a gentle boil in it twice a day for two days, take them out and put them into a fine clear syrup. Put a paper dipped in brandy over them and keep them for use. To preserve walnuts black. Take the small kind of walnuts, put them in salt and water, change the water every day for nine days, then put them in a sieve. Let them stand in the air until they begin to turn black, then put them into a jug and pour boiling water over them and let them stand till the next day. Then put them in a sieve to drain. Stick a clove into each end of your walnut. Put them into a pan of boiling water. Let them boil five minutes. Then take them up. Make a thin syrup. Scald them in it three or four times a day till your walnuts are black and bright. Then make a thick syrup with a few cloves and a little ginger cut in slices. Skim it well. Put in your walnuts. Boil them five or six minutes and put them in your jars. Wet your paper with brandy, lay it over them, and tie them down with bladders. The first year they are a little bitter, but the second year they will be very good. To preserve walnuts green. Take large French walnuts when they are a little larger than a good nutmeg. Wrap every walnut in vine leaves, tie it round with a string, then put them into a large quantity of salt and water. Let them lie in it for three days. Then put them in fresh salt and water and let them lie in that for three days longer. Then take them out and lay a large quantity of vine leaves in the bottom of your pan. Then a lay of walnuts, then vine leaves. Do so till your pan is full, but take great care the walnuts do not touch one another. Fill your pan with hard water with a little bit of roach alum. Set it over the fire till the water is very hot but don't let it boil. Take it off, let them stand in the water till it is quite cold, then set them over the fire again. When they are green, take the pan off the fire, and when the water is quite cold, take out the walnuts. Lay on them a sieve, a good distance from each other. Have ready a thin syrup, boiled and skimmed. When it is pretty cool, put in your walnuts. Let them stand all night. The next day give them several scalds, but don't let them boil. Keep your preserving pan close covered, and when you see that they look bright and a pretty colour, have ready made a rich syrup of fine loaf sugar with a few slices of ginger and two or three blades of mace. Scald your walnuts in it. Put them in small jars with paper dipped in brandy over them. Tie them down with bladders and keep them for use. Preserve walnuts white. Take the large French walnuts full grown but not shelled. Pare them till you see the white appear. Put them in salt and water as you do them. Have ready boiling a large saucepan full of soft water. Boil them in it five minutes. Take them up and lay them betwixt two cloths till you have made a thin syrup. Boil them gently in it for four or five minutes. Then put them in a jar. Stop them up close that no steam can get out. If it does it will spoil their colour. The next day boil them again when they are cold. Make a fresh thick syrup with two or three slices of ginger and a blade of mace. Boil and skim it well. Then give your walnuts a boil in it and put them in glass jars with papers dipped in brandy laid over them and tie bladders over them to keep out the air. To make orange marmalade Take the clearest Seville oranges you can get. Cut them in two, then take all the pulp and juice out into a basin. Pick all the seeds and skins out of it. Boil the rinds in hard water till they are tender. Change the water two or three times while they are boiling. Then pound them in a marble mortar. Add to it the juice and pulp and put them in the preserving pan with double its weight of loaf sugar. 
set it over a slow fire, boil it a little more than half an hour, then put it into pots with brandy papers over them. To make transparent marmalade. Take very pale Seville oranges, cut them in quarters, take out the pulp and put it into a basin. Pick the skins and seeds out, put the peels in a little salt and water, let them stand all night, then boil them in a good quantity of spring water till they are tender. Then cut them in very thin slices and put them to the pulp. To every pound of marmalade put a pound and a half of double refined sugar beat fine. Boil them together gently for twenty minutes. If it is not clear and transparent, boil it five or six minutes longer. Keep stirring it gently all the time and take care you do not break the slices. When it is cold, put it into jelly or sweetmeat glasses. Tie them down with brandy papers over them. They are pretty for a dessert of any kind. To make quince marmalade. Get your quinces when they are full ripe. Pare them and cut them into quarters. Then take out the core and put them into a saucepan that is well tinned. Cover them with the parings. Fill the saucepan near full of spring water. Cover it close and let them stew over a slow fire till they are soft and of a pink colour. Then pick out all your quinces from the parings. Beat them to a pulp in marble mortar. Take their weight of fine loaf sugar. Put as much water to it as will dissolve it. Boil and skim it well. Then put in your quinces and boil them gently three quarters of an hour. Keep stirring it all the time or it will stick to the pan and burn. When it is cold, put it into flat sweetmeat pots and tie it down with brandy paper. To make apricot marmalade. When you preserve your apricots, pick out all the bad ones and those that are too ripe for keeping. Boil them in the syrup till they will mash, then beat them in a marble mortar to a paste. Take half their weight of loaf sugar and put as much water to it as will dissolve it. Boil and skim it well. Boil them till they look clear and the syrup thick like a fine jelly. Then put it into your sweetmeat glasses and keep them for use. To preserve green pineapples. Get your pineapples before they are ripe and lay them in a strong salt and water five days. Then put a large handful of vine leaves in the bottom of a large saucepan and put in your pineapple. Fill up your pan with vine leaves. Then pour on the salt and water it was laid in. Cover it up very close and set it over a slow fire. Let it stand till it is a fine light green. Have ready a thin syrup made of a quart of water and a pound of double refined sugar. When it is almost cold, put it into a deep jar and put in the pineapple with the top on. Let it stand a week and take care that it is well covered with the syrup. Then boil your syrup again and pour it carefully into your jar, lest you break the top of your pineapple, and let it stand eight or ten weeks, and give the syrup two or three boils to keep it from moulding. Let your syrup stand till it is near cold before you pour it on. When your pineapple looks quite full and green, take it out of the syrup, and make a thick syrup of three pounds of double refined sugar, with as much water as will dissolve it. Boil and skim it well, Put a few slices of white ginger in it. When it is near cold, pour it upon your pineapple. Tie it down with a bladder, and the pineapple will keep many years and not shrink. But if you put it into thick syrup at the first, it will shrink, for the strength of the syrup draws out the juice and spoils it. MB. It is a great fault to put any kind of fruit that is preserved whole into thick syrup at first. To preserve red gooseberries. To every quart of rough red gooseberries, put in a pound of loaf sugar. Put your sugar into a preserving pan with as much water as will dissolve it. Boil and skim it well. Then put in your gooseberries. Let them boil a little and set them by till the next day. Then boil them till they look clear and the syrup thick. Then put them into pots or glasses. Cover them with brandy papers and keep them for use. To preserve strawberries whole. Get the finest scarlet strawberries with their stalks on. 
before they are too ripe. Then lay them separately on a china dish. Beat and sift twice their weight of double refined sugar, and strew it over them. Then take a few ripe scarlet strawberries, crush them, and put them into a jar with their weight of double refined sugar beat small. Cover them close, and let them stand in a kettle of boiling water, till they are soft, and the syrup is come out of them. Then strain them through a muslin rag, into a tossing pan. Boil and skim it well. When it is cold, put in your whole strawberries, and set them over the fire till they are milk warm. Then take them off, and let them stand till they are quite cold. Then set them on again, and make them a little hotter. Do so several times till they look clear, but don't let them boil, it will fetch the stalks off. When the strawberries are cold, put them into jelly glasses with their stalks downwards, and fill up your glasses with the syrup. Tie them down with brandy papers over them. They are very pretty amongst jellies and creams, and proper for setting out a dessert of any kind. To preserve white raspberries whole. Get your raspberries when they are turning white, with the stalks on about an inch long. Lay them single on a dish, beat and sift their weight of double refined sugar, strew it over them. To every quart of raspberries take a quart of white currant juice. Put to it its weight of double refined sugar, boil and skim it well, then put in your raspberries and give them a scald. Take them off and let them stand for two hours, then set them on again and make them a little hotter. So do for two or three times till they look clear, but don't let them boil. It will make the stalks come off. When they are pretty cool, put them into jelly glasses with the stalks down and keep them for use. MB. You may preserve red raspberries in the same way, only take red currant juice instead of white. To preserve Morello cherries. Get your cherries when they are full ripe. Take out the stalks and prick them with a pin. To every two pounds of cherries, put a pound and a half of loaf sugar. Beat part of your sugar and strew it over them. Let them stand all night. Dissolve the rest of your sugar in half a pint of the juice of currants. Set it over a slow fire and put in the cherries with the sugar and give them a gentle scald. Let them stand all night again and give them another scald. Then take them carefully out and boil your syrup till it is thick. Then pour it upon your cherries. If you find it be too thin, boil it again. To preserve barberries in bunches. Take the female barberries. Pick out all the largest bunches. Then pick the rest from the stalks. Put them in as much water as will make a syrup for your bunches. Boil them till they are soft. Then strain them through a sieve. To every pint of the juice, put a pound and a half of loaf sugar. Boil and scum it well, and to every pint of syrup, put half a pound of barberries in bunches. Boil them till they look very fine and clear. Then put them carefully into pots or glasses. Tie brandy papers over and keep them for use. To preserve barberries for tarts. Pick the female barberries clean from the stalks. Then take their weight in loaf sugar, put them in a jar and set them in a kettle of boiling water till the sugar is melted and the barber is quite soft. The next day put them in a preserving pan and boil them 15 minutes. Then put them in jars and keep them in a dry cool place. To preserve damsons. Take the small long damsons, pick off the stalks and prick them with a pin. Then put them into a deep pot with half their weight of loaf sugar pounded. Set them in a moderate oven till they are soft. Then take them out and give the syrup a boil and pour it upon them. Do so for two or three times. Then take them carefully out and put them into the jars you intend to keep them in and pour over them rendered mutton suet. Tie a bladder over them and keep them for use in a very cool place. To preserve magnum bonum plums. Take the large yellow plums, put them in a pan full of spring water, set them over a slow fire. Keep putting them down with a spoon till you find the skin will come off, 
then take them up and peel the skin off with a penknife. Put them in a fine thin syrup and give them a gentle boil, then take them off and turn them pretty often in the syrup, or the outside will turn brown. When they are quite cold, set them over the fire again. Let them boil five or six minutes, then take them off and turn them very often in the syrup till they are near cold. Then take them out and lay them separately on a flat china dish. Strain the syrup through a muslin rag, add to it the weight of the plums of fine loaf sugar, boil and skim it very well, then put in your plums, boil them till they look clear, then put them carefully into jars or glasses. Cover them well with the syrup, or they will lose their colour. Put brandy papers and a bladder over them. To preserve wine sours. Take the finest wine sours you can get. Pick off the stalks, run them down the seam with a pin only skin deep, then take half their weight of loaf sugar pounded, and lay it betwixt your plums in layers till your jars is full. Set them in a kettle of boiling water till they are soft, then drain the syrup from them, and give it a boil and pour it on them. Do so for several times till you see the skin look hard and the plums clear. Let them stand a week, then take them out one by one and put them into glasses, jars or pots. Give your syrup a boil. If you have not syrup enough, boil a little clarified sugar with your syrup, and fill up your glasses, jars or pots with it, and put brandy papers over and tie a bladder over them to keep out the air, or they will lose their colour and grow a purple. They are pretty with either steeple cream, any kind of flummeries, or under a silver web. To preserve apricots. Pare your apricots and thrust out the stones with a skewer. To every pound of apricots, put a pound of loaf sugar, strew part of it over them, and let them stand till the next day. Then give them a gentle boil three or four different times. Let them go cold betwixt every time. Take them out of the syrup one by one. The last time as you boil them, skim your syrup very well. Boil it till it looks thick and clear. Then pour it over your apricots and put brandy papers over them. To preserve peaches. Get the largest peaches before they are too ripe. Rub off the lint with a cloth, then run them down the seam with a pin, skin deep. Cover them with French brandy, tie a bladder over them, and let them stand a week. Then take them out and make a strong syrup for them. Boil and skim it well. Put in your peaches and boil them till they look clear, then take them out and put them into pots or glasses. Mix the syrup with the brandy. When it is cold, Pour it on your peaches. Tie them close down with a bladder, that the air cannot get in, or the peaches will turn black. To preserve quinces whole. Pare your quinces very thin and round, that they may look like a screw. Then put them into a well-tinned saucepan with a new pewter spoon in the middle of them, and fill your saucepan with hard water, and lay the parings over your quinces to keep them down. Cover your saucepan so close that the steam cannot get out. Set them over a slow fire till they are soft, and a fine pink colour. Let them stand till they are cold, and make a good syrup of double refined sugar. Boil and skim it well, then put in your quinces. Let them boil ten minutes, take them off, and let them stand two or three hours. Then boil them till the syrup looks thick, and the quinces clear. Then put them in deep jars with brandy papers and leather over them. Keep them in a dry place for use. MB. You may preserve quinces in quarters the same way. To preserve oranges carved. Take the fairest Seville oranges you can get. Cut the rinds with a penknife in what form you please. Draw out the part of your peel as you cut them and put them into salt and hard water. Let them stand for three days to take out the bitter. Then boil them an hour in a large saucepan of fresh water with salt in it. But don't cover them. It will spoil the colour. Then take them out of the salt and water and boil them ten minutes in a thin syrup for four or five days together. 
then put them into a deep jar, let them stand two months, and then make a thick syrup, and just give them a boil in it. Let them stand till the next day, then put them in your jar with brandy papers over, tie them down with a bladder, and keep them for use. MB. You may preserve whole oranges without carving the same way, only don't let them boil so long, and keep them in a very thin syrup at first, or it will make them shrink and wither. Always observe to put salt in the water for either oranges preserved or any kind of orange chips. To preserve oranges in jelly. Take Seville oranges and cut a hole out at the stalk as large as a sixpence, and scoop out the pulp quite clean. Tie them separately in muslin, and lay them in spring water for two days. Change the water twice a day, then boil them in the muslin till tender upon a slow fire. As the water wasteth, put hot water into the pan and keep them covered. Weigh the oranges before you scoop them, and to every pound put two pounds of double refined sugar and one pint of water. Boil the sugar and water with the juice of the oranges to a syrup. Scum it very well. Let it stand till cold, then put in the oranges and boil them half an hour. If they are not quite clear, boil them once a day for two or three days. Pare and core some green pippins, and boil them till the water is strong of the apple, but don't stir the apples. Only put them down in the water with the back of a spoon, strain the water through a jelly bag till quite clear, then to every pint of water, put one pound of double refined sugar, and the juice of a lemon strained fine. Boil it up to a strong jelly. Drain the oranges out of the syrup. Put them into glass jars or pots the size of an orange with the holes upwards, and pour the jelly over them. Cover them with brandy papers, and tie them close down with bladders. MB. You may do lemons the same way. To preserve lemons. Carve or pare your lemons very thin, and make a round hole on the top, the size of a shilling. Take out all the pulp and skins, rub them with salt, and put them in spring water as you do them, to prevent them from turning black. Let them lie in for five or six days, then boil them in fresh salt and water, fifteen minutes. Have ready made a thin syrup, of a quart of water and a pound of loaf sugar, Boil them in it five minutes, once a day for four or five days, then put them into a large jar. Let them stand for six or eight weeks, and it will make them look clear and plump. Then take them out of that syrup, or they will mould. Make a syrup of fine sugar, put as much water to it as will dissolve it, boil and skim it, then put in your lemons and boil them gently till they are clear. Then put them into a jar with brandy papers over them. Tie them close down and keep them in a dry place for use. To preserve oranges with marmalade. Pare your oranges as thin as you can. Then cut a hole in the stalk end the size of a sixpence. Take out all the pulp. Then put your oranges in salt and water. Boil them a little more than an hour. But don't cover them. It will turn them a bad colour. Have ready made a syrup of a pound of fine loaf sugar with a pint of water. Put in your oranges, boil them till they look clear, then pick out all the skins and pippins out of your pulp, and cut one of your oranges into it as thin as possible, and take its weight of double refined sugar. Boil it in a clean tossing pan over a slow clear fire till it looks quite clear and transparent. When it is cold, Take your oranges out and fill them with your marmalade, and put on your top, and put them in your syrup again. Let them stand for two months, then make a syrup of double refined sugar with as much water as will dissolve it. Boil and skim it well, then give your oranges a boil in it, put brandy papers over, and tie them down with a bladder. They will keep for several years. To make bullus cheese Take your bullus when they are full ripe, put them into a pot, and to every quart of bullus, put a quarter of a pound of loaf sugar, beat small. Bake them in a moderate oven till they are soft, then rub them through a hair sieve. To every pound of pulp, 
add half a pound of loaf sugar beat fine, then boil it an hour and a half over a slow fire, and keep stirring it all the time. Then pour it into potting pots, and tie brandy papers over them, and keep them in a dry place. When it has stood a few months, it will cut out very bright and fine. M.B. You may make slow cheese the same way. To make elder rob. Gather your elderberries when they are full ripe. Pick them clean from the stalks, put them in large stew pots, and tie a paper over them. Put them in a moderate oven, let them stand for two hours, then take them out and put them in a thin coarse cloth, and squeeze out all the juice you can get. Then put eight quarts into a well-tinned copper, set it over a slow fire, let it boil till it be reduced to one quart. When it grows near done, keep stirring it to prevent its burning to the bottom, then put it into potting pots. Let it stand two or three days in the sun, then dip a paper in sweet oil the size of your pot, and lay it on. Tie it down with a bladder, and keep it in a very dry place for use. To make a black currant rob. Get your currants when they are ripe. Pick, bake, and squeeze them the same as you did the elderberries. Then put six quarts of the juice into a large tossing pan. Boil it over a slow fire till it is pretty thick. Keep stirring it till it is reduced to one quart. Pour it into flat pots, dry it, and tie it down the same way as you did your elder rob. End of chapter 8「9 of the Experienced English Housekeeper」by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations on Drying and Candying Before you candy any sort of fruit, preserve them first and dry them in a stove or before the fire till the syrup is run out of them. Then boil your sugar, candy height, dip in the fruit and lay them in dishes in your stove till dry. Then put them in boxes and keep them in a dry place. To make apricot paste. Pare and stone your apricots. Boil them in water till they will mash quite small. Put a pound of double refined sugar in your preserving pan with as much water as will dissolve it and boil it to sugar again. Take it off the stove and put in a pound of apricots. Let it stand till the sugar is melted. Then make it scalding hot but don't let it boil. Pour it into china dishes or cups. Set them in a stove. When they are stiff enough to turn out, put them on glass plates. Turn them as you see occasion till they are dry. To make raspberry paste. Mash a quart of raspberries. Strain one half and put the juice to the other half. Boil them a quarter of an hour. Put to them a pint of red currant juice. Let them boil all together till your berries are enough. Put a pound and a half of double refined sugar into a clean pan with as much water as will dissolve it and boil it to sugar again. Then put in your berries and juice, give them a scald and pour it into glasses or plates. Then put them into a stove to dry and turn them as you see occasion. To make gooseberry paste. Take a pound of red gooseberries when they are full grown and turned but not ripe. Cut them in halves, pick out all the seeds. Have ready a pint of currant juice. Boil your gooseberries in it till they are tender. Put a pound and a half of double refined sugar into your pan with as much water as will dissolve it and boil it to sugar again. Then put all together and make it scalding hot, but it must not boil. Pour it into plates or glasses the thickness you like then dry it in a stove. To make currant paste, either red or white. Strip your currants, put a little juice to them to keep them from burning. Boil them well and rub them through a hair sieve, then boil it a quarter of an hour. To a pint of juice, put a pound and a half of double refined sugar sifted. Shake in your sugar. When it is melted, pour it on plates. Dry it as the other pastes and turn it into what form you please. 
to make currant clear cake strip and wash your currants to four quarts of currants put one quart of water boil them very well then run it through a jelly bag to a pint of jelly put a pound and a half of double refined sugar pounded and sifted through a hair sieve set your jelly on the fire when it has just boiled up then shake in the sugar stir it well then set it on the fire again make it scalding hot to melt the sugar but do not let it boil then pour it on clear cake glasses or plates when it is jellied before it is candied cut it in rounds or half rounds this will not knot and dry them the same way as you did the apricot paste white currant clear cakes are made the same way but observe that as soon as the jelly is made you must put the sugar to it or it will change the colour to make violet cakes take the finest violets you can get pick off the leaves beat the violets fine in a mortar with the juice of a lemon beat and sift twice their weight of double refined sugar put your sugar and violets into a silver saucepan or tankard set it over a slow fire keep stirring it gently till all your sugar is dissolved if you let it boil it will discolour your violets drop them in china plates when you take them off put them in a box with paper betwixt every layer to dry cherries take morello cherries stone them and to every pound of cherries put a pound and a quarter of fine sugar beat and sift it over your cherries let them stand all night take them out of your sugar and to every pound of sugar put two spoonfuls of water boil and scum it well then put in your cherries let your sugar boil over them the next morning strain them and to every pound of the syrup put half a pound more sugar let it boil a little thicker then put in your cherries and let them boil gently the next day strain them and dry them in a stove and turn them every day a second way to dry cherries stone a pound and a half of cherries put them in a preserving pan with a little water when they are scalding hot put them in a sieve or on a cloth to dry then put them in your pan again beat and sift half a pound of double refined sugar strew it betwixt every lay of cherries when it is melted set them on the fire and make them scalding hot let them stand till they are cold do so twice more then drain them from the syrup and lay them separately to dry dip them in cold water and dry them with a cloth set them in the hot sun to dry as before and keep them in a dry place till you want to use them to make green gauge plums make a thin syrup of half a pound of single refined sugar skim it well slit a pound of plums down the seam and put them in the syrup keep them scalding hot till they are tender they must be well covered with syrup or they will lose their colour let them stand all night then make a rich syrup to a pound of double refined sugar put two spoonfuls of water skim it well and boil it almost to a candy when it is cold drain your plums out of the first syrup and put them in the thick syrup be sure let the syrup cover them set them on the fire to scald till they look clear then put them in a china bowl when they've stood a week take them out and lay them on china dishes dry them in a stove turn them once a day till they are dry if you would have them green scald them with vine leaves the same way as the green gauges are done to make apricot cakes take a pound of nice ripe apricots scald them and as soon as you find the skin will come off peel them and take out the stones beat them in a marble mortar to a pulp boil half a pound of double refined sugar with a spoonful of water skim it exceeding well then put in the pulp of your apricots let them simmer a quarter of an hour over a slow fire stir it softly all the time then pour it into shallow flat glasses turn them out upon glass plates put them in a stove and turn them once a day till they are dry to burn almonds take two pounds of loaf sugar 
two pounds of almonds, put them in a stew pan with a pint of water. Set them over a clear coal fire, let them boil till you hear the almonds to crack. Take them off and stir them about till they are quite dry. Then put them in a wine sieve and sift all the sugar from them. Put the sugar into the pan again with a little water, give it a boil, put four spoonfuls of scraped cochineal to the sugar to colour it. Put the almonds into the pan, keep stirring them over the fire till they are quite dry. Put them into two glasses, and they will keep twelve months. To dry damsons. Get your damsons when they are full ripe. Spread them on a coarse cloth. Set them in a very cool oven. Let them stand a day or two. If they are not as dry as a fresh prune, put them in another cool oven for a day or two longer, till they are pretty dry. Then take them out and lay them in a dry place. They will eat like fresh plums in the winter. To candy ginger. Beat two pounds of fine loaf sugar. Put one pound in a tossing pan with as much water as will dissolve it, with one ounce of raced ginger grated fine. Stir them well together over a very slow fire till the sugar begins to boil. Then stir in the other pound and keep stirring it till it grows thick. Then take it off the fire and drop it in cakes upon the earthen dishes. Set them in a warm place to dry and they will look white and be very hard and brittle. To make orange chips. Take the best Seville oranges. Pare them a slant, a quarter of an inch broad. If you can keep the paring whole, it looks much prettier. When you have pared them all, put them in salt and spring water for a day or two. Then boil them in a large quantity of spring water till they are tender. Then drain them on a sieve. Have ready a thin syrup made of a quart of water and a pound of fine sugar. Boil them, a few at a time to keep them from breaking, till they look clear. Then put them into a syrup made of fine loaf sugar with as much water as will dissolve it, and boil them to a candy height. When you take them up, lay them on sieves and grate double refined sugar all over them, and put them in a stove or by the fire to dry, and keep them in a dry place for use. To dry currants in bunches. When the currants are stoned and tied up in bunches, to every pound of currants take a pound and a half of sugar, and to every pound of sugar put half a pint of water. Boil the syrup very well, lay your currants in it, set them on the fire and let them just boil. Take them off, cover it close with a paper, let them stand till the next day, then make them scalding hot. Let them stand for two or three days with a paper close to them, then lay them on earthen plates and sift them well over with sugar. Put them in a stove to dry, the next day lay them on sieves, but do not turn them till the upper side is dry. Then turn them and sift the other side well with sugar. When they are quite dry, lay them betwixt papers. To dry apricots. Take a pound of apricots, pare and stone them, put them in your tossing pan. Pound and sift half a pound of double refined sugar. Strew a little amongst them and lay the rest over them. Let them stand twenty-four hours. Turn them three or four times in the syrup, then boil them pretty quick till they look clear. When they are cold, take them out and lay them on glasses. Put them into a stove and turn them every half hour. The next day, every hour, and after, as you see occasion. Lemon Drops Dip a lump of treble refined loaf sugar in water. Boil it stiffish. Take it off. Rub it with the back of a silver spoon to the side of your pan. Then grate in some lemon peel. Boil it up and drop it on paper. If you want it red, put in a little cochineal. To dry peaches. Pare and stone the largest Newington peaches. Have ready a saucepan of boiling water. Put in the peaches. Let them boil till they are tender. Lay them on a sieve to drain, then weigh them and put them in the pan they were boiled in, and cover them with their weight of sugar. Let them lie two or three hours, then boil them till they are clear and the syrup pretty thick. 
let them stand all night covered close, scald them very well, then take them off to cool, then set them on again till the peaches are thoroughly hot. Do this for three days, lay them on plates to dry, and turn them every day. To Candy Angelica Take it when young, cut it in lengths, cover it close, and boil it till it is tender. Peel it and put it in again, let it simmer and boil till it is green, then take it up, and dry it with a cloth. To every pound of stalks, put a pound of sugar. Put your stalks into an earthen pan, beat the sugar and strew over them. Let it stand two days, then boil it till it is clear and green. Put it in a colander to drain, boil a pound of sugar to sugar again, strew it on your angelica. Lay it on plates to dry, and set them in the oven after the pies are drawn. Three pounds and a half of sugar is enough to four pounds of stalks. To candy lemon or orange peel. Cut your lemons or oranges long ways, and take out all the pulp, and put the rinds into a pretty strong salt and hard water six days. Then boil them in a large quantity of spring water till they are tender. Then take them out and lay them on a hair sieve to drain. Then make a thin syrup of fine loaf sugar, a pound to a quart of water. Put in your peels and boil them half an hour, or till they look clear. Have ready a thick syrup made of fine loaf sugar, with as much water as will dissolve it. Put in your peels and boil them over a slow fire, till you see the syrup candy about the pan and peels. Then take them out and grate fine sugar all over them. Lay them on a hair sieve to drain, and set them in a stove or before the fire to dry, and keep them in a dry place for use. NB. Don't cover your saucepan when you boil either lemons or oranges. To boil sugar, candy height. Put a pound of sugar into a clean tossing pan with half a pint of water. Set it over a very clear slow fire. Take off the scum as it rises. Boil it till it looks fine and clear. Then take out a little with a silver spoon. When it is cold, if it will draw a thread from your spoon, it is boiled high enough for any kind of sweet meat. Then boil your syrup, and when it begins to candy round the edge of your pan, it is candy height. MB. It is a great fault to put any kind of sweetmeats into too thick a syrup, especially at the first, for it withers your fruit and takes off both the beauty and flavour. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of the Experienced English Housewife by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations upon creams, custards, and cheesecakes. When you make any kind of creams and custards, take great care your tossing pan be well tinned. Put a spoonful of water in it to prevent the cream from sticking to the bottom of your pan. Then beat your yolks of eggs and strain out the treads, and follow the directions of your receipt. As to cheesecakes, they should not be made long before you back them, particularly almond or lemon cheesecakes, for standing makes them oil and grow sad. A moderate oven bakes them best. If it is too hot it burns them and takes off the beauty, and a very slow oven makes them sad and look black. Make your cheesecakes up just when the oven is of a proper heat, and they will rise well and be of a proper colour. To make pistachio cream. Take half a pound of pistachio nuts. Take out the kernels, beat them in a mortar with a spoonful of brandy, put them into a tossing pan with a pint of good cream, and the yolks of two eggs beat fine. Stir it gently over a slow fire till it grows thick. Then put it into a china soup plate. When it is cold, stick it all over with small pieces and serve it up. To make chocolate cream. Scrape fine a quarter of a pound of the best chocolate. Put to it as much water as will dissolve it. Put it in a marble mortar. Beat it half an hour. Put in as much fine sugar as will sweeten it and a pint and a half of cream. Mill it 
and as the froth rises, lay it on a sieve. Put the remainder part of your cream in posset glasses, and lay the frothed cream upon them. It makes a pretty mixture upon a set of salvers. To make Spanish cream. Dissolve in a quarter of a pint of rose water, three quarters of an ounce of icing glass cut small. Run it through a hair sieve. Add to it the yolks of three eggs, beat and mixed with half a pint of cream, two sorrel leaves, and sugar to your taste. Dip the dish in cold water before you put in the cream. Then cut it out with a jigging iron, and lay it in rings round different coloured sweetmeats. To make ice cream. Pare, stone, and scald twelve ripe apricots. Beat them fine in a marble mortar. Put to them six ounces of double refined sugar, a pint of scalding cream. Work it through a hair sieve. Put it into a tin that has a close cover. Set it in a tub of ice broken small, and a large quantity of salt put amongst it. When you see your cream grow thick round the edges of your tin, stir it and set it in again till it all grows quite thick. When your cream is all froze up, take it out of your tin and put it in the mould you intend it to be turned out of. Then put on the lid and have ready another tub with ice and salt as before. Put your mould in the middle and lay your ice under and over it. Let it stand four or five hours. Dip your tin in warm water when you turn it out. If it be summer, you must not turn it out till the moment you want it. You may use any sort of fruit if you have not apricots. Only observe to work it fine. To make clotted cream. Put one teaspoonful of earning into a quart of good cream. When it comes to a curd, break it very carefully with a silver spoon. Lay it upon a sieve to drain a little. Put it into a china soup plate. Pour over it some good cream with the juice of raspberries, damsons, or any kind of fruit to make it a fine pink colour. Sweeten it to your taste, and lay round it a few strawberry leaves. It is proper for a middle at supper, or a corner at dinner. To make hartshorn cream. Take four ounces of hartshorn shavings. Boil them in three pints of water till it is reduced to half a pint. Run it through a jelly bag, put to it a pint of cream, let it just boil up, then put it into jelly glasses. Let it stand till it is cold. By dipping your glasses into scalding water, it will slip out whole. Then stick them all over, with slices of almonds, cut lengthway. It eats well with white wine and sugar, like flummery. To make ribboned cream. Take eight quarts of new milk, set it on the fire. When it is ready to boil, put in a quart of good cream. Earn it, and pour it into a large bowl. Let it stand all night, then take off the cream and lay it on a sieve to drain. Cut it to the size of your glasses, and lay red, green or coloured sweetmeats between every layer of cream. To make lemon cream. Take a pint of spring water, the rinds of two lemons pared very thin, and the juice of three. Beat the whites of six eggs very well. Mix the whites with the water and lemon. Put sugar to your taste, then set it over the fire, and keep stirring it till it thickens. But don't let it boil. Strain it through a cloth. Beat the yolks of six eggs. Put it over the fire till it be quite thick. Then put it into a bowl to cool and put it in your glasses. To make steeple cream with wine sours. Take one pint of strong clear calf's foot jelly, the yolks of four hard eggs, pounded in a mortar exceeding fine, with the juice of a Seville orange, and as much double refined sugar as will make it sweet. When your jelly is warm, put it in, and keep stirring it till it is cold, and grows as thick as cream. Then put it into jelly glasses. The next day, turn it out into a dish with preserved wine sours. Stick a sprig of myrtle in the top of every cream, and serve it up with flowers round it. To make raspberry cream. Take a quart of raspberries, or raspberry jam. Rub it through a hair sieve to take out the seeds. Mix it well with your cream. Put in as much loaf sugar as will make it pleasant. 
then put it into a milk pot to raise a froth with a chocolate mill. As your froth rises, take it off with a spoon, lay it upon a hair sieve. When you have got what froth you have occasion for, put the remainder of your cream into a deep china dish or punch bowl. Put your frothed cream upon it, as high as it will lie on, then stick a light flour in the middle and send it up. It is proper for a middle at supper, or a corner at dinner. Lemon cream with peel. Boil a pint of cream. When it is half cold, put in the yolks of four eggs, stir it till it is cold, then set it over the fire with four ounces of loaf sugar, a teaspoonful of grated lemon peel. Stir them till it is pretty hot, take it off the fire and put it in a basin to cool. When it is cold, put it in sweetmeat glasses. Lay paste knots or lemon peel cut like long straws over the tops of your glasses. It is proper to be put upon a bottom salver amongst jellies and whips. Orange Cream Take the juice of four Seville oranges and the outrind of one pared exceeding fine. Put them into a tossing pan with one pint of water and eight ounces of sugar. Beat the whites of five eggs, set it over the fire, stir it one way till it grows thick and white. Strain it through a gauze sieve, stir it till it is cold, then beat the yolks of five eggs exceeding well. Put it in your tossing pan with the cream, stir it over a very slow fire till it is ready to boil. Put it into a basin to cool and stir it till it is quite cold, then put it into jelly glasses. Send it in upon a salver with whips and jellies. To make burnt cream. Boil a pint of cream with sugar and a little lemon peel shred fine, then beat the yolks of six and the whites of four eggs separately. When your cream is cooled, put in your eggs with a spoonful of orange flower water and one of fine flour. Set it over the fire, keep stirring it till it is thick, put it into a dish. When it is cold, sift a quarter of a pound of sugar all over. Hold a hot salamander over it till it is very brown and looks like a glass plate put over your cream. To make La Pompadour Cream Beat the whites of five eggs to a strong froth. Put them into a tossing pan with two spoonfuls of orange flower water two ounces of sugar, stir it gently for three or four minutes, then pour it into your dish and pour good melted butter over it and send it in hot. It is a pretty corner dish for a second course at dinner. To make a trifle, put three large macaroons in the middle of your dish, pour as much white wine over them as they will drink, then take a quart of cream, put in as much sugar as will make it sweet, Rub your sugar upon the rind of a lemon to fetch out the essence. Put your cream into a pot, mill it to a strong froth. Lay as much froth upon a sieve as will fill the dish you intend to put your trifle in. Put the remainder of your cream into a tossing pan with a stick of cinnamon, the yolks of four eggs well beat, and sugar to your taste. Set them over a gentle fire, stir it one way till it is thick, then take it off the fire. Pour it upon your macaroons. When it is cold, put on your frothed cream, lay round it different coloured sweetmeats and small shot comfits in, and figures or flowers. Almond Custards Put a quart of cream into a tossing pan, a stick of cinnamon, a blade or two of mace. Boil it and set it to cool. Blanch two ounces of almonds, beat them fine in a marble mortar with rose water. If you like a ratafia taste, put in a few apricot kernels or bitter almonds. Mix them with your cream. Sweeten it to your taste. Set it on a slow fire. Keep stirring it till it is pretty thick. If you let it boil, it will curdle. Pour it into cups, etc. To make lemon custards. Take a pint of white wine, half a pound of double refined sugar, the juice of two lemons the out rind of one pared very thin, the inner rind of one boil tender and rub through a sieve. Let them boil a good while, then take out the peel and a little of the liquor, set it to cool, 
pour the rest into the dish you intend for it. Beat four yolks and two whites of eggs, mix them with your cool liquor, strain them into your dish, stir them well up together, set it on a slow fire or boiling water to bake as a custard. When it's enough, grate the rind of a lemon all over the top. You may brown it over with a hot salamander. It may be either hot or cold. To make orange custards. Boil the rind of half a Seville orange very tender. Beat it in a marble mortar till it is very fine. Put to it one spoonful of the best brandy, the juice of a Seville orange, four ounces of loaf sugar, and the yolks of four eggs. Beat them all together ten minutes. Then pour in by degrees a pint of boiling cream. Keep beating them till they are cold. Put them in custard cups and set them in an earthen dish of hot water. Let them stand till they are set. Then take them out and stick preserved orange on the top and serve them up either hot or cold. It is a pretty corner dish for dinner or a side dish for supper. To make a common custard. Take a quart of good cream. Set it over a slow fire with a little cinnamon, four ounces of sugar. When it has boiled, take it off the fire, beat the yolks of eight eggs, put to them a spoonful of orange flower water, to prevent the cream from cracking. Stir them in by degrees as your cream cools. Put the pan over a very slow fire, stir them carefully one way till it is almost boiling, then put it into cups and serve them up. To make a beast custard. Take a pint of beast, set it over the fire with a little cinnamon or three bay leaves. Let it be boiling hot, then take it off and have ready mixed one spoonful of flour and a spoonful of thick cream. Pour your hot beast upon it by degrees. Mix it exceeding well together and sweeten it to your taste. You may either put in crusts or cups or bake it. To make fairy butter. Take the yolks of four eggs boiled hard, a quarter of a pound of butter. Beat two ounces of sugar in a large spoonful of orange flower water. Beat them all together to a fine paste. Let it stand two or three hours. Then rub it through a colander upon a plate. It looks very pretty. To make almond cheesecakes. Take four ounces of Jordan almonds. Blanch them and put them into cold water. Beat them with rose water in a marble mortar or wood bowl with a wood pestle. Put to it four ounces of sugar and the yolks of four eggs beat fine. Work it in the mortar or bowl till it becomes white and frothy. Make a rich puff paste which must be made thus. Take half a pound of flour, a quarter of a pound of butter. Rub a little of the butter into the flour. Mix it stiff with a little cold water, then roll your paste straight out. Strew over a little flour and lay over in thin bits one third of your butter. Throw a little more flour over the butter. Do so for three times, then put your paste in your tins. Fill them and grate sugar over them and bake them in a gentle oven. To make bread cheesecakes. Slice a penny loaf as thin as possible. Pour on it a pint of boiling cream. Let it stand two hours, then take eight eggs, half a pound of butter, and a nutmeg grated. Beat them well together. Put in half a pound of currants well washed and dried before the fire, and a spoonful of brandy or white wine, and bake them in raised crusts or petty pans. To make citron cheesecakes. Boil a quart of cream. Beat the yolks of four eggs, mix them with your cream when it is cold, then set it on the fire. Let it boil till it curds. Blanch some almonds, beat them with orange flower water, put them into the cream with a few Naples biscuits and green citron shred fine. Sweeten it to your taste and bake them in teacups. To make rice cheesecakes. Boil four ounces of rice till tender. Put it upon a sieve to drain. Put in four eggs well beaten, half a pound of butter, half a pint of cream, six ounces of sugar, a nutmeg grated and a glass of ratafia water or brandy. Beat them all together, 
and bake them in raised crusts. To make curd cheese cakes. Take half a pint of good curds, beat them with four eggs, three spoonfuls of rich cream, half a nutmeg grated, one spoonful of ratafia, rose or orange water. Put to them a quarter of a pound of sugar, half a pound of currants well washed and dried before the fire. Mix them all well together and bake it in petty pans with a good crust under them. To make orange crumpets. Take a pint of cream and a pint of new milk. Warm it and put in a little runnet. When it is broke, stir it gently. Lay it on a cloth to drain all night. Then take the rinds of three oranges boiled as for preserving in three different waters. Pound them very fine and mix them with the curd and eight eggs in a mortar, a little nutmeg, juice of lemon or orange and sugar to your taste. Bake them in tin pans rubbed with butter. When they are baked, turn them out and put sack and sugar over them. Some put slices of pressed oranges among them. To make cheesecakes. Set a quart of new milk near the fire with a spoonful of runnet. Let the milk be blood warm. When it is broke, drain the curd through a coarse cloth. Now and then break the curd gently with your fingers. Rub into the curd a quarter of a pound of butter, a quarter of a pound of sugar, a nutmeg and two Naples biscuits grated, the yolks of four eggs and the white of one egg, one ounce of almonds well beat, with two spoonfuls of rose water and two of sack. Clean six ounces of currants very well. Put them into your curd and mix them all well together. To make curd puffs. Take two quarts of milk, put a little runnet in it. When it is broke, put it in a coarse cloth to drain, then rub the curd through a hair sieve with four ounces of butter beat, ten ounces of bread, half a nutmeg, and a lemon peel grated, a spoonful of wine and sugar to your taste. Rub your cups with butter and bake them a little more than half an hour. To make egg cheese. Beat six eggs well, put them into three gills of new milk, sugar, cinnamon and lemon peel to your taste. Set it over the fire, keep stirring it and squeeze a quarter of a lemon in it to turn it to cheese. Let it run into what shape you would have it. When it is cold, turn it out. Pour over it a little almond cream, made of sweet almonds beat fine, with a little cream. Then put them into a pint of cream. Let it boil and strain it. Put to it the yolks of three eggs well beat. Set it over the fire and make it like a custard. To make a loaf royal. Take a French roll, rasp it, Cut off the bottom crust and lay it in a pan, with the bottom upwards. Boil a pint of cream, put to it the yolks of two eggs, a little cinnamon, orange flower water and sugar to your taste. When it is cold, pour it upon the roll. Let it stand in all night to steep, then make a very good custard of cream, a little sack, orange flower water and sugar. Put the roll into a dish with some good paste round the edge and pour your custard upon it. You may lay lumps of marrow in the custard and stick long slips of citron and orange peel in the loaf. Then send it to the oven. A little time will bake it. To make prince's loaf. Take small French rolls about the size of an egg. Cut a small round hole in the top. Take out all the crumbs. Fill them with almond custard. Lay over it currant jelly in thin slices Beat the white of an egg and double refined sugar to a froth and ice them all over with it. Five is a pretty dish. To make a drunken loaf. Take a French roll hot out of the oven. Rasp it and pour a pint of red wine upon it and cover it close up for half an hour. Boil one ounce of macaroni in water till it is soft and lay it upon a sieve to drain. Then put the size of a walnut of butter into it and as much thick cream as it will take. Then scrape in six ounces of Pumazan cheese. Shake it about in your tossing pan with the macaroni, till it be like a fine custard. Then pour it hot upon your loaf. Brown it with a salamander, and serve it up. It is a pretty dish for supper. 
to make snowballs pare five large baking apples take out the cores with a scoop fill the holes with orange or quince marmalade then make a little good hot paste and roll your apples in it and make your crust of an equal thickness and put them in a tin dripping pan bake them in a moderate oven when you take them out make icing for them the same way as for the plum cake and ice them all over with it about a quarter of an inch thick set them a good distance from the fire till they are hardened but take care you don't let them brown put one in the middle of a china dish and the other five round it garnish them with green sprigs and small flowers they are proper for a corner for either dinner or supper to make fried toast cut a slice of bread about half an inch thick steep it in rich cream with sugar and nutmeg to your taste when it is quite soft put a good lump of butter into a tossing pan fry it a fine brown lay it on a dish and pour wine sauce over it and serve it up end of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Experienced English Housewife by Elizabeth Raffold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Observations upon Cakes When you make any kind of cakes, be sure that you get your things ready before you begin, then beat your eggs well, and don't leave them till you have finished the cakes, or else they will go back again, and your cakes will not be light. If your cakes are to have butter in, Take care you beat it to a fine cream before you put in your sugar, for if you beat it twice the time, it will not answer so well. As to plum cake, seed cake, or rice cake, it is best to bake them in wood garths, for if you bake them in either pot or tin, they burn the outside of the cakes, and confine them so that the heat cannot penetrate into the middle of your cake, and prevents it from rising. Bake all kinds of cake in a good oven, according to the size of your cake, and follow the directions of your receipt, for though care hath been taken to weigh and measure every article belonging to every kind of cake, yet the management and the oven must be left to the maker's care. To make a bride cake. Take four pounds of fine flour well dried, four pounds of fresh butter, two pounds of loaf sugar, pound and sift fine a quarter of an ounce of mace, the same of nutmegs. To every pound of flour put eight eggs. Wash four pounds of currants. Pick them well and dry them before the fire. Blanch a pound of sweet almonds and cut them lengthway very thin. A pound of citron, one pound of candied orange, the same of candied lemon, half a pint of brandy. First work the butter with your hand to a cream, then beat in your sugar a quarter of an hour. Beat the whites of your eggs to a very strong froth. Mix them with your sugar and butter. Beat your yolks half an hour at least, and mix them with your cake. Then put in your flour, mace, and nutmeg. Keep beating it well till your oven is ready. Put in your brandy, and beat your currants and almonds lightly in. Tie three sheets of paper round the bottom of your hoop to keep it from running out. Rub it well with butter. Put in your cake and lay your sweetmeats in three lays, with cake betwixt every lay. After it is risen and coloured, cover it with paper before your oven is stopped up. It will take three hours baking. To make almond icing for the bride cake. Beat the whites of three eggs to a strong froth. Beat a pound of Jordan almonds very fine with rose water. Mix your almonds with the eggs lightly together. A pound of common loaf sugar beat fine and put in by degrees. When your cake is enough, take it out and lay your icing on, and put it in to brown. To make sugar icing for the bride cake. Beat two pounds of double refined sugar with two ounces of fine starch. Sift it through a gauze sieve, then beat the whites of five eggs with a knife upon a pewter dish half an hour. Beat in your sugar a little at a time, or it will make the eggs fall, and will not be so good a colour. When you have put in all your sugar, beat it half an hour longer, then lay it on your almond icing, and spread it even with a knife. 
If it be put on as soon as the cake comes out of the oven, it will be hard by that time the cake is cold. To make a good plum cake. Take a pound and a half of fine flour well dried, a pound and a half of butter, three quarters of a pound of currants, washed and well picked. Stone half a pound of raisins and slice them, eighteen ounces of sugar beat and sifted, fourteen eggs. Leave out the whites of half of them. Shred the peel of a large lemon exceeding fine, three ounces of candied orange, the same of lemon, a teaspoonful of beaten mace, half a nutmeg grated, a teacupful of brandy or white wine, four spoonfuls of orange flower water. First work the butter with your hand to a cream, then beat your sugar well in. Whisk your eggs for half an hour, then mix them with your sugar and butter, and put in your flour and spices. When your oven is ready, mix your brandy, fruit and sweetmeats lightly in, then put it in your hoop, and send it to the oven. It will require two hours and a half baking. It will take an hour and a half beating. To make a rich seed cake. Take a pound of flour well dried, a pound of butter, a pound of loaf sugar beat and sifted, eight eggs, two ounces of caraway seeds, one nutmeg grated, and its weight of cinnamon. First beat your butter to a cream, then put in your sugar. Beat the whites of your eggs half an hour, mix them with your sugar and butter. Then beat the yolks half an hour, put it to the whites, beat in your flour, spices and seeds, a little before it goes to the oven. Put it in the hoop and bake it two hours in a quick oven, and let it stand two hours. It will take two hours beating. To make a white plum cake. To two pounds of flour well dried, take a pound of sugar beat and sifted, one pound of butter, a quarter of an ounce of mace, the same of nutmegs, sixteen eggs, two pounds and a half of currants, picked and washed, half a pound of candied lemon, the same of sweet almonds, half a pint of sack or brandy, three spoonfuls of orange flower water. Beat your butter to a cream, put in your sugar, Beat the whites of your eggs half an hour, mix them with your sugar and butter. Then beat your yolks half an hour, mix them with your whites. It will take two hours beating. Put in your flour a little before your oven is ready. Mix your currants and all your other ingredients lightly in, just when you put it in your hoop. Two hours will bake it. To make little plum cakes. Take a pound of flour. Rub into it half a pound of butter, the same of sugar, a little beaten mace. Beat four eggs very well, leave out half the whites, with three spoonfuls of yeast. Put to it a quarter of a pint of warm cream. Strain them into your flour and make it up light. Set it before the fire to rise. Just before you send it to the oven, put in three quarters of a pound of currants. To make orange cakes. Take Seville oranges that have very good rinds, quarter them and boil them in two or three waters until they are tender and the bitterness is gone off. Scum them, then lay them on a clean napkin to dry. Take all the seeds and skins out of the pulp with a knife, shred the peels fine, put them to the pulp, weigh them and put rather more than their weight of fine sugar into a tossing pan with just as much water as will dissolve it. Boil it till it becomes a perfect sugar, then by degrees put in your orange peels and pulp. Stir them well before you set them on the fire. Boil it very gently till it looks clear and thick, then put it into flat bottom glasses. Set them in a stove and keep a constant moderate heat to them. When they are candied on the top, turn them out upon glasses. MB, you may make lemon cakes the same way. To make rice cake, take 15 eggs, leave out one half of the whites, beat them exceeding well near an hour with a whisk, then beat the yolks half an hour. Put to your yolks 10 ounces of loaf sugar sifted fine, beat it well in, then put in half a pound of rice flour, a little orange water or brandy, the rinds of two lemons grated. Then put in your whites, beat them all well together for a quarter of an hour. Then put them in a hoop 
and set them in a quick oven for half an hour. To make ratafia cakes. Take half a pound of sweet almonds, the same quantity of bitter, blanch and beat them fine in orange, rose or clear water to keep them from oiling. Pound and sift a pound of fine sugar, mix it with your almonds. Have ready very well beat the whites of four eggs, mix them lightly with the almonds and sugar, put it in a preserving pan and set it over a moderate fire. Keep stirring it quick one way until it is pretty hot. When it is a little cool, roll it in small rolls and cut it in thin cakes. Dip your hands in flour and shake them on it. Give them each a light tap with your finger. Put them on sugar papers and sift a little fine sugar over them, just as you are putting them into a slow oven. To make ratafia cakes a second way. Take one pound and a half of sweet almonds and half a pound of bitter almonds. Beat them as fine as possible with the whites of two eggs. Then beat the whites of five eggs to a strong froth. Shake in lightly two pounds and a half of fine loaf sugar, beat and sifted very fine. Drop them in little drops the size of a nutmeg on cap paper and bake them in a slack oven. To make Shrewsbury Cakes Take half a pound of butter, beat it to a cream, then put in half a pound of flour, one egg, six ounces of loaf sugar beat and sifted, half an ounce of caraway seeds mixed into a paste. Roll them thin and cut them round with a small glass or little tins. Prick them and lay them on sheets of tin and bake them in a slow oven. To make a Shrewsbury cake a second way. To a pound of butter, beat and sift a pound of double refined sugar, a little mace and four eggs. Beat them all together with your hand till it is very light and looks curdling. Then shake in a pound and a half of fine flour, roll it thin and cut it into little cakes with a tin and bake them. To make bath cakes. Rub half a pound of butter into a pound of flour and one spoonful of good balm. Warm some cream and make it into a light paste. Set it to the fire to rise. When you make them up, take four ounces of caraway comfits, work part of them in and strew the rest on the top. Make them into round cakes the size of a French roll. Bake them on sheet tins and send them in hot for breakfast. To make queen cakes. Take a pound of loaf sugar, beat and sift it, a pound of flour well dried, a pound of butter, eight eggs, half a pound of currants washed and picked, grate a nutmeg, the same quantity of mace and cinnamon. Work your butter to a cream, then put in your sugar. Beat the whites of your eggs near half an hour, mix them with your sugar and butter, then beat your yolks near half an hour and put them to your butter. Beat them exceeding well together, then put in your flour, spices and the currants. When it is ready for the oven, bake them in tins and dust a little sugar over them. To make a common seed cake. Take two pounds of flour, rub into it half a pound of powder sugar, one ounce of caraway seeds beaten. Have ready a pint of milk with half a pound of butter melted in it and two spoonfuls of new balm. Make it up into a paste, set it to the fire to rise. Flour your tin and bake it in a quick oven. To make cream cakes. Beat the whites of nine eggs to a stiff froth, then stir it gently with a spoon for fear the froth should fall and grate in the rinds of two lemons. To every white of an egg, shake in softly a spoonful of double refined sugar sifted fine. Lay a wet sheet of paper on a tin and drop the froth in little lumps on it with a spoon a small distance from each other and sift a good quantity of sugar over them. Set them in an oven after brown bread. Make the oven close up and the froth will rise. When they are just coloured they are baked enough. Take them out and put two bottoms together and lay them on a sieve. Then set them in a cool oven to dry. You may lay raspberry jam or any other sort of sweetmeat betwixt them before you close the bottoms together to dry. 
to make a cake without butter. Beat eight eggs half an hour. Have ready pounded and sifted a pound of loaf sugar, shake it in and beat it half an hour more. Put to it a quarter of a pound of sweet almonds beat fine with orange flower water. Grate the rind of a lemon into the almonds and squeeze the juice of the lemon. Mix them all together and keep beating them till the oven is ready and just before you set it in put to it three quarters of a pound of warm dry fine flour. Rub your hoop with butter. An hour and a half will bake it. To make light wigs. To three quarters of a pound of fine flour, put half a pint of milk made warm. Mix it in two or three spoonfuls of light balm. Cover it up, set it half an hour by the fire to rise. Work in the paste, four ounces of sugar and four ounces of butter. Make it into wigs, with as little flour as possible, and a few seeds. Set them in a quick oven to bake. To make macaroons. To one pound of blanched and beaten sweet almonds, put one pound of sugar and a little rose water, to keep them from oiling. Then beat the whites of seven eggs to a froth. Put them in and beat them well together. Drop them on wafer paper, grate sugar over them and bake them. To make Spanish biscuits. Beat the yolks of eight eggs near half an hour. Then beat in eight spoonfuls of sugar. Beat the whites to a strong froth. Then beat them very well with your yolks and sugar near half an hour. Put in four spoonfuls of flour and a little lemon cut exceeding fine. And bake them on papers. To make sponge biscuits. Beat the yolks of twelve eggs half an hour. Put in a pound and a half of sugar beat and sifted. Whisk it well up till you see it rise in bubbles. Beat the whites to a strong froth. Whisk them well with your sugar and yolks. Beat in fourteen ounces of flour with the rinds of two lemons grated. Bake them in tin moulds, buttered or coffins. They require an hot oven. The mouth must not be stopped. When you put them into the oven, dust them with sugar. They will take half an hour baking. To make lemon biscuits. Beat very well the yolks of ten eggs and the whites of five with four spoonfuls of orange flower water till they froth up. Then put in a pound of loaf sugar sifted. Beat it one way for half an hour or more. Put in half a pound of flour with the raspings of two lemons and the pulp of a small one. Butter your tin and bake it in a quick oven, but don't stop up the mouth at first for fear it should scorch. Dust it with sugar before you put it in the oven. It is soon baked. To make drop biscuits. Beat the yolks of ten eggs and the whites of six with one spoonful of rose water half an hour. Then put in ten ounces of loaf sugar, beat and sifted. Whisk them well for half an hour. Then add one ounce of caraway seeds, crushed a little, and six ounces of fine flour. Whisk in your flour gently, drop them on wafer papers, and bake them in a moderate oven. To make common biscuits. Beat eight eggs half an hour. Put in a pound of sugar beat and sifted, with the rind of a lemon grated. Whisk it an hour till it looks light. Then put in a pound of flour with a little rose water and bake them in tins, or on papers, with sugar over them. To make wafers. Take two spoonfuls of cream, two of sugar, the same of flour, and one spoonful of orange flour water. Beat them well together for half an hour. Then make your wafer tongs hot, and pour a little of your batter in, to cover your irons. Bake them on a stove fire. As they are baked, roll them round a stick like a spigot. As soon as they are cold, they will be very crisp. They are proper for tea, or to put upon a salver to eat with jellies. To make lemon puffs. Beat a pound of double refined sugar. Sift it through a fine sieve. Put it in a bowl with the juice of two lemons. Beat them well together. Then beat the white of an egg to a very high froth. Put it in your bowl, 
beat it half an hour, then put in three eggs, with two rinds of lemons grated, mix it well up, dust your papers with sugar, drop on the puffs in small drops, and bake them in a moderate oven. To make chocolate puffs, beat and sift half a pound of double refined sugar, scrape into it one ounce of chocolate very fine, mix them together, beat the white of an egg to a very high froth, then strew in your sugar and chocolate, keep beating it till it is as stiff as a paste, sugar your papers and drop them on about the size of a sixpence, and bake them in a very slow oven. To make almond puffs, blanch two ounces of sweet almonds, beat them fine with orange flour water, beat the whites of three eggs to a very high froth, then strew in a little sifted sugar, mix your almonds with your sugar and eggs, then add more sugar till it is as stiff as a paste, lay it in cakes and bake it on paper in a cool oven. To make French bread, Take a quarter of a peck of flour, one ounce of butter melted in milk and water. Mix two or three spoonfuls of balm with it. Strain it through a sieve, beat the white of an egg, put it in your water with a little salt, work it up to a light paste, put it in a bowl, then pull it into pieces. Let it stand all night, then work it well up again. Cover it and lay it on a dresser for half an hour. Then work all the pieces separate, and make them in rolls, and set them into the oven. End of chapter 11